What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei back with Reborn in Naruto. Talented OC masters the wind. Becomes the legendary wind calamity. Part 3. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel and for more exclusive content. This fanfic is a very, very long one guys for the next part leave a comment below. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Miko and Hoka both cursed him and his annoying wind instantaneous body jutsu. Hoka activated his by Akigen and noticed him appearing 600 meters away. But he disappeared soon, and this time went out of the by Akigen's range. Miko cursed, Fujin is as cowardly as usual. Hoka and Miko looked at each other deciding what decision to take. Around a kilometer away from the initial location, Fujin kept sensing the location of the other two. They were still in the same position. He smiled thinking, the duration of the fight is 13 hours. I guess Rinjiro analyzed that we won't be able to decide the winner in a few fights. So the winner will depend on who has the most amount of chakra. The best way for me would be to force multiple rounds, so that all of us lose an equal amount of chakra. And I'll be able to win easily due to my larger reserves. Especially considering that by Akugan and Sharingan use a decent amount of chakra while being activated. But knowing these two, I have no doubt that they'll fight intensely, he. Back at the starting position, Miko and Hoka were observing each other. Hoka was analyzing, so what do I do? Do I hide too until Fujin comes out? Or do we track Fujin first before fighting? Or should I try to beat her first and then beat Fujin? No, that'll be tough. Not to mention, Fujin loves to sneak attack. He won't miss the chance to attack when we are fighting. On the other hand, Miko too was having similar doubts. But compared to Hoka, she was a lot more arrogant. She dumped all the questions she had while deciding, I'll just defeat Hoka quickly before Fujin can act. In a 1v1 fight, I'll be able to defeat both of them with ease. Having made her decision, Miko activated her Sharingan and rushed toward Hoka. This broke Hoka out of his thoughts, and he prepared to fight. He cautioned himself, I have to avoid looking into her eyes. While I can break her Jinjutsu easily, it'll be tough to do so quickly enough. Miko flickered a few meters ahead of Hoka, and rapidly made a few hand signs, and launched a fireball Jutsu on him. Hoka quickly moved out of the way, and then ran towards Miko, with the intention of using gentle fists to close her chakra points. Miko quickly flickered out of range and launched shurikens on Hoka. Knowing that she uses strings on her shuriken, Hoka too threw his own shuriken, which collided with hers and deflected them. Miko used this opportunity to close the distance, and used fire release, for Jutsu on Hoka. Hoka barely managed to dodge, but it raised past his shirt, burning it. A bit of the skin on the side of his abdomen was also burned. He bore the pain and closed the distance. This time, Miko didn't back off and engaged him with her Ichiheta Jutsu style. Using her Sharingan, she ensured that she never got hit by his gentle fist. Instead, she tried to use her fire release, for Jutsu on Hoka. However, Hoka noticed it every time and kept dodging it. All this time, Miko kept trying to put Hoka under Jinjutsu, but it never worked on Hoka. Hoka's Byakugan can determine when Miko is about to cast a Jinjutsu. So, whenever she prepares her Jinjutsu, Hoka avoided looking into her eyes and disrupted his own chakra slightly. This ensured that Miko never managed to cast a Jinjutsu on him. But this also distracted him, which allowed Miko to fight him equally in close combat. After a few minutes, however, Miko ended up having a lot of close calls, with Hoka almost hitting her several times. So she flickered backward. Hoka followed her, but she flickered again, starting a tag game. Miko's control over and skill with body flicker jutsu was much higher than Hoka's though. So she regained her advantage. Not able to keep up with Miko's flickers, Hoka gave up chasing her and stood his ground, knowing her arrogance, she'll come close to fight me anyways. So I don't need to chase her. Seeing that Hoka had stopped chasing her, she came close to him instead while weaving hand signs. 
However, unlike what Hoka predicted, she stayed at mid-range and uses Fire Dragon Jutsu. Not having anything to counter, he flickered away from the line of Fire Dragon. Finally sick of trying to engage her in close combat, Hoka used Stone Shuriken Jutsu. The Jutsu surprised Miko, but thanks to her Sharingan, she was able to dodge or block all of them. Unfortunately for her, she overlooked Hoka, who using this time, appeared right in front of her and stabbed two fingers toward her. Seeing that, Miko freaked out a little, damn, I have to block. In a hurry, she put her arm in between, and Hoka hit a chakra point on her arm. As soon as her arm gets hit, she flickered away. Hoka expected her to return, but instead, she just ran away, surprising Hoka, never thought she'll run away. He waited there for a few seconds thinking, both my opponents ran away. So shouldn't I be the winner? He then sighed, unfortunately, the next step will depend on Fujin. I and Miko are finally far away from each other, and tired from a battle. Even injured. So the question is who will he attack? Around a kilometer from where the fighting was happening, Fujin kept sensing their chakras throughout their clash. When they kept fighting, he really wished that he had some popcorn and a TV to watch the fight. Unfortunately, he had to stay hidden long away. The fight continued for over seven minutes, before he sensed Miko's chakra signature going far away from Hoka. Fujin concluded, oh, so Miko lost and ran away. Who's the coward now? Anyways, whom to attack? Since Miko ran away, it's safe to assume that she's injured. Most likely Hoka managed to block some of her chakra points. Maybe one or two. Any more, and Hoka wouldn't have given her any chance to run away. Hoka too was thinking at the same time, Fujin will most probably target Miko, as she's the one who ran away. I should be ready to hit him after he fights her for some time. Miko sat while resting against a tree after retreating to the opposite end of the training ground. She was very annoyed with herself, I put my guard down, that's why I got hit. Otherwise, I could have beaten him as I was suppressing him throughout the fight. She looked at her left arm. It was swollen, he blocked the chakra point on my left arm. I won't be able to create hand signs. Even moving this arm is very painful. She began applying first aid on her left arm. She didn't bother hiding, as she knew that both Fujin and Hoka wouldn't have any issue tracking her. While applying first aid, she thought, Fujin will most likely attack me soon, I need to be ready. Hoka kept his Byakugan activated. He kept an eye on Miko while waiting for Fujin to make a move. Soon, he noticed something moving at a very rapid speed. In the next second, he noticed Fujin approaching him, so fast. Why is he moving towards me? He's already here. Hoka looked straight ahead, Fujin was already standing on a branch. He took his fighting stance. Unfortunately for him, as soon as he reached there, Fujin released a supercharged, 5%, great breakthrough jutsu toward Hoka. Hoka quickly erected a rock shield to protect himself. He was shocked by the power of the great breakthrough jutsu, why is this so strong? Did he learn any rank B Jutsus? Damn. Not good. The rock shield obviously couldn't give complete protection to Hoka. And flickering away wasn't an option. So he went underground and used Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu, and managed to move 125 meters to the south. He used it twice more to completely get out of the range of the deadly Jutsu while wondering, why did he attack me? Two minutes earlier Fujin thought for a few seconds before concluding, normally, attacking Miko would be the best choice here. Except that there could be an issue. Miko, though smarter than Hoka when it comes to tactics, is just way too arrogant. Hoka, on the other hand, will most likely move to help Miko and prevent me from defeating her when she's injured. Even if he doesn't, his Byakugan will provide him with all the info, and he'll have the initiative of attacking or being a spectator. So that means my target should be having concluded, he quickly used Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu to approach Hoka. Though Hoka ran underground, Fujin had no trouble sensing him. He followed him with Body Flicker. Hoka too could see that Fujin was following him as he expected, as expected, he can track me with ease. I need to get out and engage him in close combat. I don't think he can use that strong Jutsu again. However, before he could get out of the ground, Fujin landed on top of where Hoka was and punched the ground with his full power chakra enhanced punch. Since Hoka sensed Fujin building up chakra, he didn't completely get out of the ground. However, how could he have imagined that Fujin would punch the ground? The impact created a shockwave that traveled through the ground toward where Hoka was. 
While the shockwave was harmless, it caused the entire underground to become a mess. The random movement of the ground hit Hoka many times while he was underground, even injuring him. He tried using Earth Instantaneous Body Jutsu again, but as the underground was a mess, he couldn't perform it. As a last effort, he hardened the walls next to him by using a rock shield. It provided him with some cover, but he was already injured. His right elbow and shoulder had taken hits. Many rocks also hit his chest, abdomen, and his back. Later, even despite the protection of the rock shields, his left ankle got injured, rather badly. Finally, the tremors died down, and Hoka managed to get above the ground. That's exactly where Fujin was, but unfortunately, he didn't have a choice. As soon as he got out of the ground, a kunai was placed at the back of his neck. He saw Fujin standing in front of him. He said, give up. You've lost. Hoka unwillingly accepted his loss, I give up. As soon as he said that, Fujin's wind clone dispersed himself. The fight only took two attacks. One great, he noticed that Miko was now standing in a spot with no trees around, not bad. She knows that hiding is pointless. So she stayed in open ground to not give any chance to sneak attack. Actually, I can still sneak up on her from behind. But, I'm pretty sure that she has deliberately left this opening. The area around her should be full of traps. Having figured out her tactic, Fujin began making wind clones. Twenty wind clones appeared around Fujin. Fujin then suppressed his chakra and hid behind a tree. His wind clones dispersed through the forest, surrounding Miko from all sides while still hiding. One clone moved to a path that allowed him to sneak up on her. En route, the clone noticed that there were a lot of strings on the ground. He smirked, having guessed right. Fujin's wind clone tried flickering behind her quickly while avoiding all traps, but Miko realized it and quickly turned around. When she did, Fujin's clone noticed that Miko was holding two strings in her right hand. Seeing Fujin heading toward her, Miko smirked, I knew it. She flickered behind while releasing the strings. As soon as those strings went slack, a couple of dozen shurikens rained toward Fujin's clone. At the same time, Miko activated her shuringan and observed Fujin. She frowned on noticing that Fujin's chakra mount was very low, a wind clone. This guy never fights head on. Fujin's clone dodged the shurikens with ease and chased after Miko, while forming wind explosion jutsu, and launching them at her. He consecutively launched seven wind explosions at her. Miko dodged each time. But she was getting increasingly worried, I need to keep a watch on any sneak attacks. It's very likely that he has more wind clones hiding nearby. Renjiro observed this clash, his control over wind nature is really impressive. Wind clones are the weakest elemental clones. Any capable sensor can easily differentiate between a wind clone and the main body in a moment, due to how unstable the clone is. However, the weak nature of the wind clone allows anyone to create a lot of them. And the instability of the wind clone's chakra makes it immune to Jinjutsu. And due to being made of wind, they are usually even more mobile than the user. He then looked at Fujin who was hiding and smiled, he really is carefree, and thinks that he has already won. Well he will win, he's in for a surprise if he thinks the win will be this easy. After all, both Hoka and Miko too have made huge progress in the last three months. The wind clone finally begins getting low on chakra. Fujin analyzed, hm I need to pour more chakra into two to three wind clones, so that they can last longer. Others I can make with the minimum requirements as I'll need the numbers. Since he was about to disperse, the clone poured most of its chakra into another wind explosion jutsu. He then flickered towards Miko. Miko flickered away, but the clone followed her with another flicker, and threw the wind explosion jutsu right at her. On doing that, the clone dispersed. In a hurry, Miko threw a kunai, that had an explosion tag attached to it, toward the incoming wind sphere. The blast created by the explosion tag, easily overpowered the jutsu and dispersed it, however, Miko had to jump back to avoid getting hit by the explosion. The explosion, alongside the earlier wind explosion jutsus, however, activated or destroyed most of the traps that she painfully placed. Unfortunately for her, as soon as she jumped backward, another two wind clones appeared behind her and launched the wind explosion jutsu on her. Since she was airborne, she couldn't flick her away. In a panic, she threw a shuriken, with a string attached to it, to the tree next to her, and used it to pull herself away. But some winds created by the explosion still hit her, creating many small cuts on her that immediately began bleeding. 
The two clones immediately pressed on the attack, without giving Miko any time to think. While she engaged them, another three clones appeared and tried to sneak attack her. Though none were successful, they added even more injuries to her. Gujin still kept observing the fight while hiding, not bad, she's grown much stronger. My wind clones are rather annoying to deal with. But, is this all? The fight is kinda too easy. Over at the battlefield, Miko was bleeding a lot. And she was incredibly annoyed, why can't he fight with some honor? I'll show him. She gritted her teeth and endured the pain and made a couple of hand signs. Trying to weave hand signs while having a chakra point half blocked was incredibly painful. Fujin could see her wincing in pain. And he could sense her chakra building up. One of the clones used all his chakra to use a great breakthrough jutsu. Since he didn't have enough chakra, it wasn't strong enough. But it still made Miko lose her balance and be dragged across the ground. The clone got dispersed as well due to running out of chakra. Seeing her being unable to fight back, another clone appeared and launches a wind explosion jutsu at her. However, before the jutsu could reach her, she managed to get up on her feet and jump above and landed on a branch. She said, fire release, aerial explosion jutsu hearing the word explosion, Fujin's clones got on guard. However, no explosion occurred, hmm, where's the explosion? Only a breeze passed through the area once. Realizing that something was off, they immediately begin sensing Miko. Soon the clones, as well as Fujin, notice that some sort of gas seems to have been released by Miko. And it was spreading throughout the forest at a very fast speed. Fujin's clones didn't discover the gas earlier, as it was both colorless and odorless. Fujin wondered, what jutsu is this? However, he had no idea. Oh well, whatever. I'll get to know soon enough. And he disappeared underground. In around 10 seconds, the gas spread in a 60 meter radius around Miko. All of Fujin's clones were in this area. Not knowing what to aspect, the 5 to 6 clones who have already exposed themselves continue their attack. Seeing the clones running towards her, Miko smirked and stated, let's see where your main body is hiding now. As soon as she said that, she spit out a small fire. That fire ignited the gas, causing it to rapidly expand and generate strong outward winds. The winds carried the gas up to 100 meters around Miko, and soon the whole area exploded. The ignition flame destroyed all 18 of Fujin's wind clones. It set fire to each and every tree in that area. And the fire seemed to be spreading further. Both Fujin and Hoka were left dumbfounded by the destruction. Fujin was shocked at what he was sensing, what the fuck? All my clones were destroyed. Which jutsu is this? Hoka too was stunned by the destruction, when did Miko get so strong? He quickly calmed himself and analyzed more, but, this jutsu shouldn't work on me, as my Byakugan will notice the gas being released even if it is colorless. So I can just move out of the range. Fujin calmed himself down as well, and observed the jutsu further, hmm, the heat generated from the explosion, seems to have already dispersed. It's just that there were trees around which got burned. So if I were to take this hit head on, it won't kill me. Though I'll be badly burned. The wind clones are just too brittle. So they all were dispersed by the jutsu. While hiding underground, Fujin analyzed a bit more and sighed, I have never seen or heard about this jutsu. It was likely taught to her by the clan. I really shouldn't look down on any jutsu that wasn't used in the series. This world has way more jutsus, which are extremely lethal if used properly. Especially when I have no idea about these jutsus. Though the destruction caused by this jutsu is impressive, I can easily nullify it with even just a breakthrough jutsu, by blowing the gas away. But I just didn't have any idea about this jutsu, which resulted in my clones getting wrecked. I wonder if she yelled the name of her jutsu purposefully. Renjiro nodded and smiled, seeing Miko counterattack successfully, even when being in such a disadvantageous position. This performance by her is very good. I did expect her to retaliate, but didn't think it'd be this successful. Fujin found the battle to be too easy, and hence let his guard down and played around instead of focusing entirely on defeating her quickly. This provided Miko with a window of opportunity to use this move. He then looked at the spot where Fujin was hiding underground, and a complicated expression appeared on his face, he is just way too careful. Though he did drop his guard slightly, he was always extremely safe. While this is good and will ensure that he stays alive, he's missing out on opportunities to gain crucial experiences. 
After all, if he never faces a crunch situation while sparring, and if he suddenly faces one during a mission, he'll find it very difficult to stay alive. Unfortunately, I can't get him to be more proactive during spars. I hope that this doesn't end up causing him any serious loss. After using the jutsu, Miko dropped to her knees. The jutsu took a major portion of her chakra. And she had to use fireproof jutsu to protect herself from being burned as well. So her chakra level had dropped a lot. Fujin didn't miss this fact. So he created a shadow clone with roughly 60% of his remaining chakra. The clone exited the ground and confirmed that the gas had already dispersed. The clone then made five wind clones. They dispersed and approached Miko from all sides. While the shadow clone went back underground. The first wind clone reached where Miko was and looked at her. Her chakra reserves had dropped very low, and her whole body was covered in small wounds, many of which were bleeding. She looked back with her Sharingan and observed that it was another wind clone. Fujin's wind clone said, give up. You're too injured to continue. Miko snorted and shouted back, as if I'll give up against someone too scared of showing his own face. Fujin's clone chuckled, even if I just hide from you, you'll end up losing consciousness due to exhaustion and perhaps even blood loss. Miko smirked and taunted, I already destroyed all your clones once. I'll do it again until you are forced to fight me yourself. Saying that she began making the hand signs again. But four more clones appeared around her, and all attacked her, disrupting her jutsu. Earlier, only Fujin's wind clone saw her hand signs. So he didn't know the hand signs she does for that jutsu. But it didn't matter, as he no longer wanted to give her any more opportunities. Miko tried her best to dodge, but was hit by winds caused by multiple winds, caused by the wind explosion jutsu, and took a breakthrough jutsu head-on, resulting in her flying back for dozens of meters and falling on the ground. She yelled in pain while being cut and flung away. The forest was still burning, so Fujin's winds became very hot. Which hurt her even more despite having a higher resistance to fire. She tried getting up, arg, this hurts a lot. But I finally have some distance. I'll use it. She was about to use up all her chakra to use another aerial explosion jutsu, but her Sharingan noticed a chakra signature underground. Is he doing another sneak attack? Wait. His chakra is very high. Finally, he is attacking with his main body. I just need one chance, and I'll win. Her thoughts were cut by Fujin's arm appearing out of the ground. He grabbed her neck while exiting the ground and slammed her on the ground while strangling her neck with his right hand and pinning her to the ground. He looked at her and said, you've lost, give up. But Miko smirked despite being in pain. In his moment of carelessness, Fujin looked straight into her eyes. Sharingan Jinjutsu at the very next moment, the scene changed for Fujin. The Miko he was grabbing transformed into flames and escaped his grasp. The burning trees around him began moving and walking toward him. Miko reformed her body in mid-air while laughing arrogantly, you looked into my eyes. She laughed even more before saying, it's my wind Fujin. No one can match an Achiha in a fair fight. The burning ants exhaled flamethrowers on Fujin. But he just ignored the damage. He looked at Miko and sighed, you really need to know when to give up. In the real world, Fujin's wind clones chuckled when they saw Miko using Jinjutsu on his shadow clone. One of them softly said, defend her sensei. He used up all his chakra to create a wind gale wolf, which pounced on the shadow clone and dispersed it. His claw continued towards Miko's abdomen when Rinjiro flickered in and dispersed the wolf. In the Jinjutsu world, as soon as Fujin's shadow clone said that, he disappeared due to being destroyed in the real world. Not understanding what was happening, she broke her Jinjutsu and saw her sensei standing next to her, with three of Fujin's clones still watching her. Rinjiro announced, Fujin is the winner. Not understanding, Miko asked, what hap? Unfortunately, the Sharingan Jinjutsu took the last bits of her chakra. She blacked out without completing her question. Rinjiro checked on her while asking loudly, how long are you going to hide? Hearing that, Fujin exited the underground and flickered next to Rinjiro with a smile on his face. The wind clones dismissed themselves. Rinjiro looked at Fujin and said, good work. Now pick her up and move towards where Hoka is. I'll douse this fire before it engulfs the entire training ground. Fujin nodded. He picked Miko up and flickered to where Hoka was. He put Miko down next to him. Hoka had already seen the result of this fight. 
He sighed on seeing Fujin completely unharmed and wondered, what could I have done differently to win this fight? Knowing that Rinjiro will most likely use a water jutsu to douse the fire, he kept his focus on sensing Rinjiro. He said to Hoka, keep an eye on where Sensei is. Hoka nodded and activated his Byakugan once again. Rinjiro had jumped high up in the air. He was almost 100 meters high in the air. And at that time, he began building up his chakra. Fujin and Hoka were both shocked by the amount of chakra gathered by Rinjiro. Fujin swallowed his saliva, what chakra? Elite Jounin indeed. I guess this is the first time I'm seeing him perform a jutsu seriously. At 100 meters up in the air, Rinjiro made a hand sign. Water release, waterfall jutsu he expelled a huge amount of water from his mouth. The water fell down right under him like a waterfall, and then flooded out in all directions for around 500 meters. Fujin and Hoka were shocked once again. Hoka asked, hey Fujin, how did he gather so much water when there's no water nearby? Fujin replied, no idea. Remind me to bug him later about this. Hearing that answer, Hoka smirked, if we could summon so much water, all our opponents would just be washed away. Fujin nodded while adding, not all, but most yeah. He wondered, isn't this similar to what Tabarama did against Hiruzen? Makes sense that Rinjiro's water jutsus are so strong. Tabarama probably left all the details regarding his own water release in Senju libraries. The flood doused all fire, releasing a huge amount of steam up into the air. Rinjiro checked whether any fire was remaining. On confirming that none was, he flickered towards his genins. On seeing Rinjiro, Hoka for the first time was very impressed with his sensei. While the training Rinjiro provided was very good, seeing such a display will always create a greater impression on 10-year kids. Rinjiro walked towards Miko and lifted her and put her on his right shoulder. While Hoka was being awestruck, Rinjiro walked behind him and lifted him by grabbing the back of his neck with his left hand. That snapped Hoka out. He realized how he was picked up, and immediately started flailing his hands and legs in the air, completely losing the famous Hayuga composure, put me down sensei. What are you doing? Fujin saw the comical scene in front of him. A huge buff Senju guy had a prideful and arrogant Ichiha girl lying unconscious on his right shoulder, and an aloof Hayuga kid flailing desperately in his left hand. In a mere second, he began laughing uncontrollably, ha 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 damn, this brings memories of guy carrying Kakashi from Suna to Leaf ha 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 ha, the laugh annoyed Hoka, and he flailed even more before being smacked by Rinjiro. What are you struggling for? I'm taking you both to the hospital. Hoka replied, I can walk there sensei. Rinjiro asked again, on one foot. I don't have time to waste an hour walking with you. Hoka continued complaining, but sensei unfortunately, he was completely ignored by Rinjiro. He looked at Fujin and said, we will take a mission as soon as these two are healed up. Don't do heavy training till then. Preferably take a complete break from training. Fujin nodded, while still laughing at the sight in front of him. Rinjiro was about to leave, but he suddenly recalled a certain memory. He looked at Fujin and said, the reward of rank A Jutsu is what I'm awarding you, and not the villager Senju clan. So you can only ask for a Jutsu that I know or can easily get. This suddenly put an end to Fujin's laugh. However, before he could complain, Rinjiro had already flickered away. Fujin muttered internally, smart bastard. While traveling to the hospital, Rinjiro sighed in relief good thing that I cleared this up so later on he can't pester me. This Brad asked the third for swords worth tens of millions of Ryo. Who knows which jutsu he'd have asked me if I didn't clear this up. Rinjiro reached the hospital and put Hoka down. They walked into it, and Rinjiro asked a nearby nurse to arrange two beds for his students. Rinjiro was a well-known name. So she arranged it immediately. Seeing Hoka struggling to walk, the nurse asked, do you want to sit in a wheelchair, so that we can take you to the room? Hoka immediately declined, no, I'll walk myself. The nurse seemed to be at a loss as to what to do, when Rinjiro asked, should I carry you once again? That question sent a chill through Hoka's body. He reluctantly said, I'll sit in the wheelchair on reaching the room, Rinjiro laid down Miko on a bed. Hoka took the bed next to hers. Rinjiro asked the nurse, check if any medical ninja is available. Send anyone who knows mystical palm jutsu here. The nurse nodded, and replied yes sir. She left a check who was available. While waiting for a medical ninja to appear, he looked at Hoka and asked, any thoughts on the fight? 
Hoka sighed and replied, We lost it the moment we decided to fight against each other, instead of chasing after Fujin. At the very least, we should have stopped before one of us got injured. That way we could have still been able to fight. Another issue was the lack of information. Fujin's two attacks surprised and overwhelmed me too much. If I had prior knowledge regarding it, I could have fought equally against him. Renjiro nodded and commented, it should also be a lesson for you, who are too obsessed with Tejutsu. Both Fujin and Miko worked on ninjutsu that can cause large-scale destruction. If they get an opportunity to use the jutsu when the opponent has their guard down, it becomes an easy win for them. You, on the other hand, will first have to reduce the gap between yourself and your opponent, and then hit him to get an advantage. While not bad, it leaves you at a huge disadvantage against ninjas who can fight from range. I understand your obsession with Tejutsu. But if you want to be able to use your Tejutsu effectively, you need to learn other skills as well. Hoka nodded and reflected on what his sensei advised him. Soon, a medical ninja came. She healed Miko and Hoka. Miko had a lot of small cuts and bruises. However, none were serious. They were all healed easily. But Miko kept sleeping due to the chakra exhaustion. Hoka on the other hand had a slightly serious injury to his left ankle. She healed him entirely as well, but advised him to rest for two days and not put any stress on his left ankle. After the procedures were done, Rinjiro left. He gave a message to Hoka's and Miko's families informing them about their kids and to Fujin that he'll have a three-day break at least. A few hours later, Miko woke up. She was surprised at seeing herself in the hospital, with her mother sitting next to her and Hoka in the adjacent bed. Their family members bugged them for quite some time before they finally stopped bothering them. When there was no one else in the room, Hoka asked, Miko, what was that jutsu you used? The question brought back memories of her horrible defeat and turned her mood down once again. She replied, it's a secret jutsu of Arichiha clan. Fire release, aerial explosion jutsu. It releases a lot of gas that is odorless and colorless. So it's very hard to notice. And it is very easy to ignite. Hoka understood, oh, no wonder Fujin got caught off guard. Miko smirked and agreed, yeah. This jutsu has the drawback of needing a few seconds for the gas to spread to have maximum effectiveness. That's why I yelled the name of the jutsu, so that his clones would get on guard and not attack recklessly, giving me the time I needed. Hoka nodded, nice tactic. Too bad that it only hit his clones. Hearing that, a scowl once again formed on her face. She said, my plan was to secretly use this jutsu while we three were engaged in close combat. That way you both would have been hit by it, and I would have won easily. She gritted her teeth, I never imagined that Fujin would fight so shamelessly and never appear in front of me at all. Even when I taunted him, he still kept hiding. Damn, this is so frustrating. Seeing her reaction Hoka laughed, yeah, I agree. Next time, let's not fight each other much until we can engage with Fujin. Miko sighed and agreed. It was tough for her to agree to this due to her pride. But unfortunately, there wasn't any other way. Yakiniku restaurant unlike his two teammates, Fujin spent the day eating in his favorite restaurants and taking a well-deserved break. Earlier, when Rinjiro tracked him to inform him about his teammates, he saw Fujin at Ichiraku, eating without a care in the world. Seeing him eat so relaxingly after beating up his teammates made Rinjiro sweat a bit. But he didn't comment. The next morning, Fujin wondered, should I go to check on those two? He thought for a bit before concluding, well, they are my teammates. And I was the one who injured them, so I should go and check on them. After freshening up and doing some light stretching, he began moving toward the hospital. But suddenly he stopped, wait. When visiting people in hospitals, isn't a tradition to get something for them. Yeah, that used to be the tradition in my previous life. Even in the Naruto series, I recall many carrying flowers or fruits while visiting patients. Yeah, let's carry a gift for both. He then fell into another dilemma, so, what do I get for them? Flowers kinda seem like a waste. Fruits are kinda too cliche. I'm sure their family members have already brought a lot of fruit. Who what should I get? And then it suddenly hit him, I know. I should get a burn all for both of them. Haha ha, ha, he flickered to get a couple of gifts for both his teammates. And then flickered to the hospital and inquired about the room they were in. He quickly found their room and entered it. Both of them were up. Hoka's left leg seemed to be plastered. He had a few more bandages on him. 
Miko, on the other hand, was put in enough bandages that one could easily mistake her for a mummy. As soon as Fujin entered, they both gave Fujin the stink eye. Seeing their childish reactions, Fujin couldn't help but smile, I really should have brought them Bernal, haha <laughs> seeing that neither of them wanted to talk first, he greeted them, hey guys. How are you doing? Both of them snorted and looked away. Fujin sighed loudly and said, after I went through all the trouble of getting you something. Oh well, I guess I'll just eat it myself. That attracted their attention. They saw a pack of cookies and a set of dango in Fujin's outstretched hands. In under a second, Hoka snatched the cookies, while Miko snatched the dango. They both began eating it right away. While they were eating, Fujin tilted his head while looking at Miko and asked, shouldn't you check whether they are real or just clones first? That pushed Miko over the edge. She instantly got up and yelled, bastard. The next time I'll beat you up. Wait, no need for next time, I'll beat you up right now. Stating that, she got off her bed. Fujin created distance between them and asked, oh, and are you sure I'm not just a clone? She was about to make a move when a middle-aged lady walked into the room hearing the commotion. Her features were similar to Miko's, just much more mature. She saw Miko standing up and narrowed her eyes and asked, why are you out of your bed? Miko immediately apologized, sorry mom and jumped back into her bed. Fujin smiled at her antics, oh, looks like she is terrified of her mother. Miko grabbed her second dango stick and was about to eat it when the dango disappeared from her hand. Miko turned her head to see her mom standing next to her bed, holding her dango, as well as all the remaining dango in her hands. Her mom looked into her eyes and said strictly, you're recovering, young lady. Why are you eating dango instead of the fruits that I brought for you? Miko nervously replied, sorry mom. But I have already healed completely. So it should be fine if I eat a little bit of dango, right? Miko's mom didn't reply and just stared Miko into her eyes. The stare down continued for 30 seconds before Miko backed down and apologized again, sorry mom. I was wrong. Her mother sighed and then began giving her a long lecture. Fujin's eye twitched at this interaction. He was thoroughly amused by this interaction, she spoke thrice. All three times she started with sorry mom. This is funny. Oka had already seen how strict Miko's mother was on the day before. However, instead of finding the situation amusing and laughing secretly, he first stuffed all the cookies in his mouth and gulped them down rapidly. Miko's mom noticed this and stared at him as well. However, he never looked at her and kept looking outside the window. She continued her lecture and lectured Miko for five minutes straight. During these five minutes, Hoka kept awkwardly staring in another direction, while Fujin awkwardly stood next to him. Miko meanwhile, looked down at the bed the whole time, while trying not to cry at the injustice she was facing, first that irritating guy appeared and teased me. He did make it up by bringing me my favorite dango, but he taunted me once again. And then, my own mother took those dango away. Not to mention, she's also lecturing me in front of my teammates. After lecturing her, she looked at Fujin and said in a straight voice while staring at him, Fujin-kun, you first beat my little girl, and then you brought her dango to eat. Now Fujin became alert, is she going to lecture me as well? He quickly replied, sorry auntie. Sensei said that she was already healed yesterday. So I didn't think it'd be an issue. Before she could reply, he looked at Hoka and Miko and said, I have some work to do with Sensei. I'll see you around later. Without waiting for anyone's response, he flickered out of the window. Oka looked enviously at the window, at least he could run away. I'm stuck here. Miko, on the other hand, was too embarrassed to think about anything. Miko's mom was surprised. She said to her, your teammate can lie with a straight face without any embarrassment. You were right about him. Hearing that, Hoka looked toward Miko's mom and saw her staring at the empty pack that had his cookies. He screamed internally in horror, crap. Fujin was walking on the streets while thinking, well, that was awkward. No wonder she acts like a stuck-up bitch all the time. She probably spends all the time back home being embarrassed. Anyways, both of them have pretty much healed. So we should start taking missions on the day after tomorrow. So how should I spend these two days? After thinking for a while, he sighed, other than training, I really haven't gotten any hobby in this world. Perhaps you and Jutsu, but that too is a part of training. After thinking for a bit more, he had an amusing idea, should I recreate some of the famous manga novels from the past world in here? 
After all, the literature here is pretty underdeveloped due to constant wars and the lack of a safe environment. So those manga and novels should be a complete hit. He analyzed the idea more. But soon he shook his head, while well, I remember their general stories and plot, I don't really remember all the details it's just been way too long. Not to mention, it'll take a lot of time. Not something I can spare right now. Not having anything to do, he explored other restaurants around Kanoha, and later visited and relaxed in the famous hot spring bath in the village. A couple of days later, Team Rinjiro assembled outside the Hokage building. Team Rinjiro entered the Hokage building together and went to the mission room. On seeing the Chunin in charge of distributing missions, Rinjiro said, Give us all the Seer Ank Banded elimination missions in the area between Kanoha and Tanzaku area. The Chunin nodded and handed seven missions to Rinjiro. Rinjiro read the missions while thinking, I haven't been taking any missions for the last seven months. I know the old man wanted to give me a break. But I have had a long enough break. He declined to give me an S rank mission. So, I should at least clear out some basic issues. These bandits would be a good start. Hopefully, some of these C rank missions will get upgraded to B rank. That'll also provide some good training for the kids. All three of them are already ready to be promoted to Chunin. He stored the mission request forms. Then he looked at his squad and said, let's move. The Genins nodded and everyone flickered towards Konoha's entrance gate. In the next week, seven bandit camps were completely decimated. In that month, Team Rinjiro slaughtered 18 bandit camps in the Land of Fire. The team started taking these missions with excitement. But by now, they were sick of it. Hoka, Fujin and Miko waited outside the Hokage building, while Rinjiro was selecting more missions. Miko complained, why are there so many bandits in our country? Also, why aren't they stronger? Hoka sighed and said, yeah. 18 camps, and there wasn't a single bandit as strong as us. Fujin added, I think our missions are purposefully chosen, so that we don't end up fighting anyone strong. Miko commented, that's even more frustrating. Fujin sighed and nodded, yes. I had heard that many rank C missions go wrong and get upgraded to rank B or even A I thought that it was a rather common occurrence. But it seems like I was wrong. Hoka replied, they don't happen that often. But they often cause serious injury or death. That's why you hear about them very often. Fujin said, oh. That makes sense. I didn't think about it that way. Miko interrupted, you guys are getting off topic. Think how we can get a better mission. Should I yell at that mission giving guy again? Last time he gave us a rank C mission. So maybe he might give us a B rank mission. Fujin looked at her and asked in a bored tone, last time I threatened him with you burning a baby. I don't think he'd really mind us burning bandits. That comment made her face a bit red due to embarrassment. They were about to talk more when Rinjiro walked out of the building. He announced, today, we won't be taking a bandit hunting mission. Hearing that the team was excited. Miko asked quickly with a lot of expectations, can we do a beer rank mission sensei? Rinjiro was amused by her question. Her expectations came crashing down as Rinjiro shook his head and replied, no, we will be escorting a merchant to Degarashi port in the land of tea. Hearing that, all three genins gave Rinjiro a deadpan look. Fujin asked, what will we be protecting him from, sensei? Rinjiro smirked and answered, bandits, of course. He enjoyed the look of betrayal on his students' faces for a few seconds, and then said, this will be a long trip. We will need around two weeks to reach there and around three days to return back. So pack your stuff, we will be leaving at noon. The Genins dejectedly replied yes and left. While leaving, Miko asked Fujin, Fujin, do you think threatening that mission guy with the life of the merchant might work? The team hadn't walked far away. Rinjiro immediately sweated a bit as he heard it properly. He said slightly loudly so that his students could hear him, it won't. I'll just take you to do bandit extermination missions for. Not wanting to hear their sensei's threat, the genins just flickered away while laughing. Rinjiro just sighed at the antics of his students and muttered, I'm too old for this shit Kanoha's main gate, at noon, team Rinjiro gathered here. As usual, Fujin arrived last. Rinjiro, Hoka, and Miko were standing here, alongside eight merchants and two carriages filled with goods. Each of the two carriages had its reins attached to two bullocks. Fujin walked towards Hoka and Miko who were standing behind Rinjiro, while he was talking with the most well-dressed merchant. On seeing Fujin, Rinjiro said, this is Fujin, Tashio-san. The last member of our group. 
Fujin looked at the guy and said, hello. The merchant smiled, slightly bowed towards Fujin, and replied, I am I Hitashio. A merchant from the land of tea. We will be in your care Fujin-kun. Please take care of us. Fujin nodded while thinking, this guy is awfully polite. Did he say this to all three of us? On a serious note, however, though he seems very carefree, he is actually very tense. He looked at Renjiro and stared at him while wondering, is there more to this mission than he said? Now that I think about it, why did he suddenly take such a long mission? Earlier he seemed rather obsessed with making Land of Fire Bandit free. Rinjiro saw Fujin staring at him and wondered, has his sensory skills become so acute that he can even sense worry? I knew he could detect lies from chakra fluctuations, but has his sensor skills improved to this degree? Very few outside the Yamanaka clan can detect worry. And most of them are very experienced and better in ninjas. Not wanting Fujin to catch on to anything, Rinjiro stated, the path that we are taking has a number of bandit camps. We have eliminated most of the bandit camps between Kanoha and the lands of river and rain. Through this mission, we will exterminate the bandits en route from Kanoha to the land of tea. So keep your guard up, as there are at least 17 known bandit camps in our way. The Genins nodded on hearing this. Miko and Hoka sighed internally. Well Fujin wondered, is he just worried due to the bandits? Or is it something else? Oh well, we should find out soon. I should stay on guard though. Rinjiro then did an inventory check, while Tashio checked whether all his goods were packed. In 15 minutes, Team Rinjiro left alongside the merchants of Land of Tea. Two carriages pulled by bullocks, eight merchants, and four ninjas traveled on the road, steadily moving away from Kanoha. They traveled until evening without a break and then set up a camp. No bandits were encountered as all bandits in this area were exterminated by three of those four ninjas not long ago. While having dinner, Hoka sighed and said, they move just way too slowly. Fujin agreed, yeah. We spent the last four months training and just hunting on our own. So we pretty much always moved at top speed. Miko joined the conversation, yeah. At least this one is a bit faster than the previous one though. That last escort mission to the land of rivers had 12 carriages. And their wheels broke off so frequently. Hoka smirked and said, yeah. We remember how frustrated you were. Fujin added, yeah. I suspect the main reason Sensei kept standing next to the carriages at that time, was that he was worried you'd burn them yourself. Hahahoka joined in the laughter, while Rinjiro ignored their antics. Miko just snorted and ignored them. After dinner, Rinjiro said, we will begin moving tomorrow at 4 AM. Tomorrow's traveling speed will be faster than today. Tonight, we will all keep watch turn by turn. Fujin, you are first. Wake Hoka up after two hours. After Hoka, it'll be Miko and last me. The Genins nodded. Rinjiro had a word with Tashio. Soon Hoka, Miko, Rinjiro, and the merchants went to sleep. Fujin sat on a branch and began meditating. Soon, he could sense all chakra within a 1.2 kilometer radius. Fujin thought, I haven't trained my ability to sense for months. Still, the improvement has been decent just due to the increase in my chakra reserves, chakra control, and regular spars. I should try and keep this on for two whole hours. Should be good training. I wonder if I last that long considering that my chakra reserves are full. Fujin stayed in that meditating position for the entire two hours. During this time, he used all his sensing skills to examine the merchants and their goods, but found nothing unusual. He had to keep changing the range of his sensory field between 600 meters and 1.2 kilometers for optimal chakra management, but he managed to last the two whole hours without any issues. He still had around 60% of his chakra left. He woke up Hoka and went to sleep. The group traveled for four days in this manner without any issues. On the fifth day, around 9 a.m. in the morning, the group was surrounded by bandits who were hiding behind the trees or on them. All four ninjas noticed the bandits but didn't react. Fujin softly asked, so who gets them? Oka immediately replied, I want them. I haven't fraught or trained for four days straight. Miko however argued, neither have I. And as you know, ladies first. Hoka commented, you are just a little girl. Say that when you become a lady. That immediately infuriated her. She shouted back, why yo however, Rinjiro interrupted her, quiet down. Miko shut up and looked at Hoka angrily. Renjiro stated, all three of you will take them on. 
I won't help you guys, but do remember that you also have to protect the goods. Fujin asked, should we just kill them, or also find and destroy their camp? Rinjiro answered, both of course. But only for this group. Every time a bandit group attacks, you'll take permission from me before attacking their camp. The three nodded. Oka looked at Fujin and asked, where to check? Fujin replied, 700 meters northwest. And 900 meters east. Hoka activated his Byakugan and checked, 900 meters east is just a few normal homes. The camp is at 700 meters northwest. Fujin asked Rinjiro, Sensei, will you be protecting the goods when we attack the camp, or should we defend it then as well? Rinjiro replied, after you eliminate the bandits here, all three of you can go. Fujin replied, alright, let's begin then. All three moved at a high speed, which made it look like all of them had disappeared. Both, the merchants and the bandits, who were keeping an eye out secretly, were shocked. In under a minute, all the bandits surrounding the group were dead. A few dead bodies or even heads fell down from trees next to merchants. Surprisingly or unsurprisingly, they didn't freak out as they had seen similar scenes multiple times in the past. Though they were surprised to know that the killers were three innocent and sweet nine to ten years old kids. The Jennings then flickered towards the bandit camp and eliminated everyone in there as well. They killed two more bandits who were at another spot in the forest. Completing the bandit elimination submission in under five minutes. The group continued on its way. Over the next eight days, 14 bandit camps were eliminated. The trio wondered whether they'd get a bandit exterminator nickname back in Kanoha. Unknown to them, their team was already known by that name among the Chunins who distributed missions. By now, the swift and brutal one-month campaign of Team Rinjiro around Kanoha to exterminate bandits was well spread. Many bandit groups had moved away from Kanoha. A few even began leaving the land of fire entirely, and continued their banditry in the weaker neighboring countries, such as the land of rivers, land of grass, land of rain, and land of rice. This time, it was the turn of the bandits on this route to suffer. In under a month, the bandits close by would get the news of the slaughter. Some would visit to check if something did happen. And they would see the gore and would end up either quitting banditry or moving away and making trading easier for Kanoha. Hirazan would soon pick up on these movements and launch an even more brutal assault on these bandits. This would not only boost Land of Fire's economy due to increased trading, but also improve Kanoha Ninja's reputation and get them more jobs that would require lesser effort to complete. Kanoha would also receive more funds from the daimyo of Land of Fire due to this act. And it'll prove to be a huge aid for Kanoha to recover from the losses of the Third Great Ninja War. Especially over the next three years when more than a thousand genins will join the reserve force, and a few hundred will begin training under a sensei. Of course, the loss of Jounin's due to Kayubi's assault won't be overcome for almost a decade. And even more importantly, while the recovery was in progress, Kanoha would end up losing their strongest clan to internal friction. Team Rinjiro and the merchants from the Land of Tea were traveling for the 13th day. Tashio said, we should enter the Land of Tea by evening. We will need another two days to reach the port though. Rinjiro nodded and said, keep an eye out. The Genins obeyed. The group journeyed until noon when they came across an open field. They decided to take a break for lunch there. The field was about as big as a football field. And it was surrounded by dense forests on one side and a hill on the other. Fujin and Hoka checked whether the area was safe and didn't find anyone. While having lunch, Rinjiro noticed something but didn't say anything. His students or the merchants didn't notice any change in his expressions. However, he was observing his students closely. Fujin, while eating lunch, activated his chakra field out of habit. When he did, he was shocked. Around 200 people had entered the forest and were around 600 to 900 meters away from them. They were moving rapidly towards them. Unlike Rinjiro, Fujin's change in expression was easily noticed by Hoka and Mi. Fujin said, around 200 bandits have surrounded us and are closing in. 150 in the forest and 50 on the hill. Miko scowled, more bandits. Fujin looked at Rinjiro and said, not just bandits. Around 50 have high chakra. With maybe a dozen Chunin level and two Jounin level chakras. That shocked Hoka and Miko. They both looked at Rinjiro. Rinjiro was impressed with Fujin's alertness. He smiled and said, well, here's your B rank mission. Or was supposed to be. This looks more like rank A. 
He then got serious and commanded, prepare to deal with the bandits and genin level attackers. I'll deal with the stronger ones. Don't worry about the goods. Give main priority to your and your teammates' lives. And then to the lives of the merchants. The team nodded and got up. Seeing them get up, the merchants understood that there was an issue and got alert too. Toshio in particular became very worried. They all immediately got up and hid behind their carriages. Two days earlier two people stood and observed the open field in the middle of nowhere. Both of them were Jounins. One of them was Wagarashi Tomio, who was from the rival family of the Wasabi family. The other was Tamanaha Norio, who was a rogue ninja from the land of rivers. He had a bounty of 5 million Ryo. Wagarashi Tomio said, from Wagarashi Tomio replied, the weakest team. A genin squad. Tamanaha Norio was surprised, and then began laughing arrogantly, just genins. They'll be dead in no time. Wagarashi Tomio was annoyed by his arrogance. He warned him, don't underestimate them too much. They are led by Senju Rinjiro, an elite Jounin. The Senju clan has a strong relationship with the Wasabi family. So it's a possibility that they are trying to sneak him in with this team. Also, their Genin team has a Byakugan user. So we will have to be very careful. Tamanaha Norio frowned upon hearing that. He thought for a bit and said, Elite Jounin will be tough to kill. The only way will be if he desperately defends the Genins. As for Byakugan, I have a way. One of my men has a rat summon. He can use them to keep an eye out from a long distance. Once they have their guard down and rest, we can make a move. Wagarashi Tomio nodded. This plan was appropriate. They might not be able to kill Rinjiro, but killing the merchants shouldn't be an issue. As his genins were about to engage in battle, Rinjiro recalled his meeting with the Hokage before accepting this mission. Hokage's office two weeks earlier, Rinjiro entered the Hokage's office and saw the Hokage and another old man. Hirazan said, Rinjiro, meet Wasabi Daichi. Rinjiro looked at the old man and asked, Wasabi. From the land of tea. The guy nodded and replied, yes, from the land of tea. Hirazan continued, there's a power struggle in the dark in the land of tea. There appears to be a scheme in the works against the Wasabi family, and maybe the daimyo as well. Rinjiro analyzed the information and asked, the Wasabi family has had a good relationship with Konoha, as well as with the Senju clan for decades. So do you want to help them? Hirazan nodded, yes. Unfortunately, we can't as it is just a scheme. If we interfere, we will damage our relationship with the T-Daimyo. Rinjiro nodded, as he had already reached this conclusion. Hirazan continued, Daichi here has an important position in the Wasabi family, as he handles their finances and many important deals. So their opponents want to eliminate him. I want you to escort him along with your team. This surprised Rinjiro. He asked, this seems to be a rather important mission. Why send Genins? Hirazan replied, their rival faction has a few hundred ninjas under them. Even if I send an Anbu team, they won't be able to protect him. The only way to protect him will be to send a larger team to protect him, but Rinjiro completed his sentence, but you can't do that as the t Daimyo won't like it. Hirazan nodded and added, and if I were to send a huge force with him, the opponent won't attack and stay hidden so it won't accomplish much. So we will follow this tactic. First, we will split up the enemy forces. There are five routes from here to the land of T. You'll take Wasabi Daichi with you while going on a rank C mission to escort merchants. You leave through the fifth route, as it's farthest from the sea, and will prevent any interference from Kiri. Soon after, I'll send three Chunin squads on such escort teams along three other routes. Finally, a squad of Anbu will escort a decoy along the central path. They will send the majority of their forces against these decoys, as they have the stronger teams assigned to them. This way, we will split their forces into five, and have a legitimate reason to kill the ones attacking them. The other four teams will be allowed to retreat after killing as many of them as they can or engage in a hit-and-run tactic if they can. You, on the other hand, will need to move to Degarashi port at a fast speed, so that their remaining forces don't regroup and target you guys. Rinjiro and the Hokage then discussed the strategy more and fine-tuned it, and took action to implement it. Back to present the bandits at the front were just around 100 meters from the edge of the open field. Hoka excitedly said, finally a good fight. Miko was also excited. Fujin, who was thinking, suddenly said, don't activate your Sharingan or Byakugan. 
I think they are trying to disguise themselves as normal bandits, so let's pretend that we didn't notice them. I have a technique I want to try. Saying that he walked in toward the forest. Hoka and Miko wanted to argue against him, but bandits had started to rush out of the forest. A few also began descending from the hill and shooting arrows. Hoka and Miko noticed it. Hoka quickly made a hand sign, Rock Shield Jutsu. A rock shield appeared behind the merchants. All the arrows shot at them were blocked by it. At the same time, around 50 bandits, 15 of them being ninjas, came running from the forest toward them. Since the ninjas were disguising themselves so that they could take the enemy by surprise, they too were moving at the same speed as bandits. More bandits were exiting the forest every second. Fujin unsheathed one of his swords and held it in his right hand. Chakra immediately began flowing through it and transformed into Wind Chakra instantly. He then held the hilt of his sword with both hands, pulled his sword back, and then swung it with full force, forming an arc towards the incoming bandits. As he swung the sword, a sword slash appeared and began moving at a rapid speed. When close to Fujin, the slash was extremely small, but as it moved it expanded exponentially. Alongside the slash, strong winds appeared which caused some dust to rise. The bandits, as well as the ninjas, didn't understand what move was made. But considering that it was made by a kid, they didn't attach a lot of importance to it. The slash didn't have any color, so they couldn't actually see an incoming slash. Instead, they just noticed wind moving towards them at a high speed and dust rising up as the winds approached them. The bandits hadn't ever seen any ninjutsu. So they just kept running straight banking on their numbers. The ninjas, however, were alert. When the slash came close, they jumped 5 to 6 feet in the air to avoid it. When the slash reached them, it was around 50 meters wide. It first hit the bandits who were running like bulls. It immediately cut them in half at their abdomens. The bandits who were following them didn't get any time to react and were cut in two as well. Next, the sharp winds that were generated by the slash hit the jumping ninjas. It created shallow cuts all over their body. The unfortunate ones had their throats or wrists lit open. A few had winds cutting through their nails and skin, causing them to scream loudly in pain. Almost all had their eyes getting cut by the winds. In all, only four Jennins and two Chunins were lucky, or perhaps unlucky, to survive. One Chunin and two Jennins lost both their eyes, while the remaining two Jennins lost an eye each. They were horrified. The entire first wave of 50 bandits and ninjas was defeated by a single swing of the sword. And it still wasn't over. The bandits in the second wave, who had just reached the edge of the forest, were terrified of what they saw happen to their fellow bandits. Color drained from their face at that sight. The sword slash, which was initially colorless, now had a tinge of blood-red color to it. In no time, it hit the forest and flew through it, cutting down bandits and trees alike. Unlike the bandits, the ninjas in this group reacted quickly. Some dug underground. Some grouped together and created a layered rock shield protection. Others just ran up the trees to the top and jumped as high as they could. After penetrating around 40 meters into the forest, the slash lost its edge and died down, due to the high number of trees in its path. The attack littered the field with blood and pieces of human bodies. The forest adjacent to the open field was completely in ruins. Though this attack was watched by a lot of people, none of them knew that this was the start of a legend. In the future, this attack would form the groundwork for that young man to create a whole new combat style that would wreak havoc in the ninja world. Oka and Miko were stupefied on seeing the result of a single swing of Fujin's sword. Their mouths were wide open in shock. Unlike them, who were just shocked due to Fujin's attack, the 50 bandits on the hill who saw the attack were terrified. The scene seemed like an extremely bad nightmare. A few bandits fainted due to fear and trauma. One bandit yelled in terror. That woke up the rest and they began scurrying away. Even the ninjas were terrified and began retreating along with the bandits. Tamanaha Norio, who was leading them, wanted to stop them, but he realized that there was no point in stopping them, as their morale had hit rock bottom. So he decided to retreat and regroup. While retreating, he looked at the kid who swung the sword and thought, that's a genin. Seeing them about to retreat, Rinjiro sighed and created a shadow clone. I knew Fujin's attack would create such an impact. He looked at the scurrying bandits and smirked, these guys are really unfortunate. He and his clone slammed their hands on the ground, pouring a huge amount of chakra into it. 
Earth Release, Rock Avalanche Jutsu Earth Release, Mud River Jutsu, as soon as they slammed their hands on the ground, a rock avalanche formed and began rolling down the hill. The ninjas were about to run away, when the ground under their feet turned into mud, making them lose their balance and fall. Everyone one of them fell into the mud river, including the Jounin. And a few seconds later, the rock avalanche went down the river. The bandits as well as the ninjas, saw the terrifying scene in front of them. They couldn't move, as their legs were stuck in the mud river. The river began dragging them down the slope, toward those murders down the hill. And, in front of them, huge rocks were rolling down the hill towards them. They yelled in despair, but in a mere few seconds, they were all crushed to death. Only one survived. Tamanaha Norio, too, freaked out seeing the huge rocks rolling toward him. He was about to jump when his legs got stuck in the mud river that suddenly formed under him. The mud then began moving down the hill at a quick speed. He quickly made a few hand signs, water prison jutsu a water barrier soon formed around him. At the next second, a rock rolled down on him. It hit the water bubble and pushed it to the bottom of the mud river. But it couldn't pop it. The rock was about to roll over. So Norio sighed in relief. Unfortunately for him, in the next second, a stone spear appeared at the bottom of the mud river and penetrated through it. It quickly penetrated the water prison bubble. Norio noticed the spear at the last moment and tried to get out of the way. It still stabbed through his body, but he was able to avoid getting hit on any vital body part. Rinjiro was surprised when he sensed that the guy was still alive. However he wasn't worried, he is just extending his own misery. While he managed to stay alive, getting stabbed by the spear disrupted his control over the water prison. It collapsed and he got buried under mud. Norio gritted his teeth, with blood flowing through his mouth, and forced himself against the flow of the river, trying to remove the stone spear from his body. Unfortunately for him, his struggle, grit, and determination for survival will never be known to anyone. At the next moment, small spikes began growing out of the spear that stabbed him. That stopped his attempt to move immediately, causing him to yell in pain and vomit more blood. When he yelled, the mud from the river entered his mouth. Soon the small spikes grew into spears, poking out of his body. His struggle finally ended, as he died, with a dozen stone spears poking out of his body, and he was buried 10 meters deep in a mud river. While Rinjiro cleared up the rear, Fujin, Hoka, and Miko made a move on the injured ninjas. Of the 15 ninjas from the first wave, only 6 were alive, with just one Chunin being in a state to fight. They were terrified by their wounds and were running towards the forest. And of the 10 ninjas from the second wave, only 2 had jumped high up in the air, and hence were on top of the ruined forest. The remaining 8 ninjas, though unharmed, were buried under a ruined forest. Hoka activated his Byakugan and said, those 8 ninjas are trapped, they'll need some time to get out. Let's attack. In an instant, all three flickered toward the retreating ninjas. Miko flickered behind the Chunin who could still fight, and tried stabbing him with a kunai. However, he turned around and defended himself in time. He shouted aggressively, I may be injured, but don't you brats look down on me. However, his thoughts were the exact opposite, just one opportunity. I'll regroup with others and be safe. Unfortunately for him, while shouting, he looked into Miko's eyes. Miko didn't miss the chance and cast Jinjutsu on him. Oka engaged the blinded Chunin. That Chunin had lost his sight, and his right leg was badly cut. However, even in that state, he still aggressively attacked Hoka with every weapon he had. This fight back was a testimony to his experience and desperation. Hoka, however, stayed calm and took his stance. He said, you are in range. And attacked, 8 trigram 16 palms. All of Hoka's attacks hit on point, with the last one hitting his opponent's chest and stopping his heart. That Chunin dropped dead. Unlike Miko and Hoka, Fujin went for the weakest ones first. He flickered behind the two blinded Jenins, and killed them both with one strike of his sword. He quickly flickered to the remaining two Jenins one by one and killed them as well. Neither of the four could even block one attack from Fujin. Just one of those four managed to raise his kunai to block Fujin's sword, but his kunai got cut into two, just like his body. Of the two ninjas who were above the debris, one was Chunin, while the other was Jenin. They were still fearful of that sword slash that wrecked the forest, as well as of the rock avalanche. So they didn't react when the three kids they were looking at flickered. When they noticed, the Chunin quickly moved to aid his comrades. But even before he took a couple of steps, Fujin had killed two of them. 
that halted his steps. In the next few seconds, he saw Fujin kill two more and look straight at him. He quickly retreated behind thinking, what a bunch of crazy kids. Are they even kids? Did Kanoha send their feared Anbu under disguise? He looked down at the debris and screamed internally, where are the rest? Get out quickly. The genin also retreated. Fujin stayed back after killing his opponents. Around half a minute later, Hoka killed his opponent. And soon after, Miko's opponent stabbed his own throat. Fujin flickered next to Miko right after she was free and said, let's do it. She nodded and made a few hand signs. Fire Wind Dragon Jutsu both Fujin and Miko could see the chakra of the ninjas making their way to get out of the debris. A 50 meter huge dragon, mostly made of extremely hot air and having four claws and many teeth made of fire. Seeing that dragon, those two began running even faster toward the third wave. The dragon moved rapidly and got above the debris. It then dived down right where six ninjas were making their way up. They were just about to remove the last log blocking their way when the dragon dived down right at them. Fortunately for them, they had one novice sensor who screamed, cast defensive water jutsu above us. Hurry. Fortunately, the group had a chun in whose nature affinity was water. He quickly made hand signs, water shield jutsu. A water barrier appeared above him. It curved like the surface of a sphere and had a thickness of six inches, and was growing thicker as he poured more chakra into it. When the dragon was 10 meters above the group, it opened its mouth and launched a wind explosion sphere, made of extremely hot air. It hit the barrier and exploded. The barrier protected the group from the winds, but it got dispersed. In the next second, the dragon slammed into them and exploded into flames, which moved rapidly. The ninja saw the dragon coming toward them and tried to disperse. Unfortunately, the debris around them blocked any escape route. They all took a direct hit. The fallen trees around them were also set on fire. The fire began spreading quickly. Not having any path, they jumped through the hole created by the dragon. Fujin saw that the attack hit successfully, but sighed thinking, it's a shame that wind dragons don't have intel. He then spat water jets on the other five starting with the sensor. He managed to douse all fire on them. Both he and the sensor had first degree burns. Well two had second degree burns. The last two had fainted and were in very bad shape. They would need immediate medical treatment. Around that time, the remaining two ninjas who were buried under the debris, managed to get out. All the ninjas from the second wave finally managed to regroup. At the same time, the third wave of bandits reached the edge of the forest, i.e., the debris. Seeing that, Fujin, Hoka, and Miko didn't advance and waited there. Rinjiro had cleared up the hill by then, and had slowed the avalanche with the mud river, and made the rocks fall slowly on the ground. He flickered behind the team, while his clone kept an eye on the merchants. The debris blocked the bandits. They couldn't travel any further. The ninjas however had a bad feeling. Wagarashi Tomio led the ninja to the top of the debris, where he regrouped with the remaining ninjas. He was shocked, only eight are remaining from the 100 who attacked. And half of them are already injured. It hasn't even been a few minutes since the first wave should have reached them. His eyes then wandered towards the hill on the other side of the field, even the 50 who should have attacked from the hill, are nowhere to be seen. Where did that useless Norio go? Also, why does it look like there was a landslide there? He quickly asked Achunin who was uninjured, what happened here? Tell quickly. Also, where are Tamanaha Norio and the rest? While asking, all his attention was on Senju Rinjiro. With so few numbers, he wasn't at all confident about taking on him. The rest of the nine ninjas who were with him were also on full alert. That Chunin was the same one who retreated earlier. He was intimidated by Tomio, but quickly began explaining to him. Over at Team Rinjiro, when the ninjas from the third wave began regrouping with those from the second wave, Fujin said, those from the third wave will be very confused. We need to attack quickly. Any suggestion, Sensei? While asking, he was thinking, if it was just defense, the best way will be to completely burn down this forest. The fire will act as a wall. Then Rinjiro could go and hunt them. But if we want to eliminate them entirely, then the fire will prove to be an obstruction for us, and killing them all will need a lot of effort. Rinjiro nodded and said, my clone will look after the merchants. So let's just attack them head on. I'll take the Jounin head on and finish him off. You guys stall the rest. I'll make another clone to watch over you guys. On saying that, he made the clone hand seal, created another shadow clone, and said, let's go. 
All five of them flickered. Wagarashi Tomio was keeping an eye on Rinjiro the whole time. The Chunin had just begun explaining the situation to him, telling him about a wind slash, and how it was accompanied by winds that cut when Rinjiro created a clone. He immediately commanded, get ready. I'll engage the Jounin. All Chunins will fight alongside me. He looked at his second in command and commanded, Masato, lead the Jenins and kill those three brats. Mano Masato was standing right next to Tomio. He had a sword hanging from his waist. Since he was an elite Chunin, his rank and power were second only to Tomio among the ninja here. Even overall, his power was only weaker than Tomio and Norio. He had worked with Tomio for a long time, and Tomio considered him his right hand. He nodded to the command given. Team Rinjiro flickered till they were 20 meters away from them. Rinjiro made a hand sign, water release, water cannon jutsu Tomio too made a few hand signs while shouting, scatter and dodge water release, water wall jutsu on hearing his command, all of the enemy ninjas moved back a bit. Rinjiro spat a jet of water on them. In response, Tomio created a water wall between them. The wall stopped the jet for a mere fraction of a second. However, that was enough for his ninjas to see the trajectory and dodge the attack. The water jet penetrated the water wall with ease, and then sliced it in two, as Rinjiro moved his head from left to right. The water jet was dodged, however, it kept traveling, hitting the trees in the still undamaged forest. The water jet cut through a few trees with ease before it ran out of energy. The enemy ninja noticed the damage caused by just one attack. Their face became grim. They prepared themselves for a bitter battle. They regrouped into two groups in a few seconds. First with Tomio as the leader and five Junins and the second with Masato as the leader and eleven Genins. Rinjiro noticed this and assaulted Tomio and the Chunins. The trio of Fujin, Hoka, and Miko moved towards the Genins. Rinjiro's clone followed them at a distance and kept a close eye. Kanohe Genins vs Masato and Genins All the three Kanohe Genins had noticed that Masato's chakra level was the second highest in the whole group. While moving towards them, Miko stated, I want the strong guy. However, Hoka argued, no, I want him. Fujin said, he seems strong, both of you take on him. I'll eliminate the rest and join you. Masato and the rest also ran toward the kids running towards them. The group had mixed feelings regarding the three kids running toward them. The ones from the third wave thought, we need to eliminate them quickly, and then aid in killing that Jounin from Kanoha. While the ones from the second wave hoped, Masato-sama should be able to handle those demon kids. Among the eleven Genins, one had seen Miko use Sharingan earlier. He shouted, don't look in her eyes, she has Sharingan. That alerted Masato. He wasn't aware of this. He unsheathed his sword. Miko was faster than Hoka. She reached Masato first and instantly used fire release, four jutsu that she had already prepared. Masato kept his eye on her hand and raised his sword to block the heat ray. The attack heated his blade but didn't make the handle much hot. At that time, Hoka flanked him and attacked with gentle fist. He smirked, he is in range. However, Masato moved slightly, so that the four jutsu won't hit him, and then slashed his hot sword at Hoka. Hoka was caught off guard and dodged backward. Unfortunately, he wasn't fast enough. The tip of the sword touched his chest. It cut through his shirt with ease and left a thin line across his chest. Luckily, since he had moved backward, the cut was very shallow. Masato moved forward to chase him, but Miko threw a few shurikens at him, which he blocked with his sword. While he dodged them, Miko flickered and stood next to Hoka. They prepared to fight him. At the same time, the eleven Genins wanted to join in the fray and aid Masato. However, Fujin flickered in between them and Masato, and created eleven wind clones. One kept eye on Masato, while the rest engaged one genin each. One of the genins rushed toward Fujin. Fujin too took a step and moved toward him. While moving, he grabbed a sword in his right hand. His opponent had a kunai in his hand. On closing the distance, Fujin slashed his sword. The enemy genin saw it and smirked. He stamped hard on the debris below and jumped back. When he suddenly stepped back, Fujin's sword slashed through empty air. The opponent kept smirking, ha! These inexperienced newbies. Always fall for the simplest trick in the book. He pulled his arm behind him and was about to throw his kunai at Fujin when something hit his body. The hit created a cut across his body, starting from his right shoulder to the left side of his hip. The cut kept getting deeper and cut him into two. Fujin thought, not a bad move. 
Unfortunately, he was out of his league. At the same time, all ten of Fujin's wind clones had engaged the enemy genins. They kept fighting at mid-range and used wind explosion jutsu to prevent opponents from using any jutsu. Fujin observed around him, now that I'm free, time to cut down their numbers. He flickered in the next instant and appeared behind a genin who was fighting his clone. The genin was surprised when he noticed someone appearing behind him. Unfortunately, before he could react, a sword pierced through his heart. In a few seconds, Fujin cut down four more genins. The others noticed Fujin killing their comrades with extreme ease and panicked. They quickly disengaged from the wind clones and tried to regroup. Lasato, who was engaged in a fight with Miko and Hoka, also noticed this. He tried to help them, but he was obstructed by Miko and Hoka. Unfortunately for the enemy genins, regrouping wasn't going to be easy. Noticing that all the enemies have disengaged his clones, Fujin flickered again and appeared behind one of them. That genin noticed and quickly turned around and swung his kunai. In response, Fujin slashed with his sword. Both the kunai and the sword clashed. Fujin's opponent wanted to use this clash to jump behind and get away from him. Unfortunately, Fujin's sword cut through his kunai. It continued ahead and cut the unsuspecting genin into two. Fujin noticed the shock plastered on the enemy's face when he noticed his kunai being cut in two. At the same time, another opponent was ganged upon by four of Fujin's clones. Two of the clones used all their chakra to form wind explosion jutsu and scored perfect hits. The other two beheaded him when he was very injured. The remaining three genins managed to regroup. But they were instantly besieged by Fujin's eight wind clones, while Fujin stood slightly behind his clones. The three genins stood with their backs to each other. Fujin saw it and analyzed, I guess I can't flicker behind them now. Anyways, time to end this. He said in a low voice, wind breakthrough jutsu everyone. Fujin's clones heard him, and all used great breakthrough jutsu at the same time. The three genins, who were at the center, instantly became trapped and slammed against each other, as they couldn't move, due to being hit by strong winds from all sides. They began yelling loudly. Fujin observed the wind patterns and then swung his sword. A slash flew through the strong winds and reached the trapped genins. In an instant, all three were beheaded. With all ten genins killed, Fujin turned his attention to the Chunin Miko and Hoka were fighting. While Fujin had engaged the enemy genins, Hoka and Miko were fighting against Masato. Masato had dealt with the initial attacks from Miko and Hoka with extreme ease, and even injured Hoka slightly. Miko noticed the cut on his chest and asked Hoka without taking her eye off Masato, can you still fight? Hoka replied, of course. Let's attack. However, before they could attack, Masato moved forward at a fast speed and swung his sword again. Miko took a step ahead and blocked his sword with her kunai. She kept trying to look into his eyes, but he always avoided eye contact with her. Seeing that Miko had blocked his sword, Hoka attacked him with gentle fist once again. Seeing Hoka attack again, Masato just jumped back and retreated. This time, Hoka didn't chase and stood with Miko. Masato observed the two being careful and sighed, it's unfortunate that there is so much debris here. I can't use earth jutsus at all. Hoka too couldn't use earth release jutsus, but he didn't mind it as he preferred to jutsu over ninjutsu. Masato was about to attack again when he noticed that Fujin was cutting down his genins with ease, tsk. I should help them. Miko and Hoka noticed him getting distracted and attacked him once again. Miko once again used fire release, for Jutsu Masato quickly dodged but was once again flanked by Hoka. Learning from the past two failed attempts, this time Hoka attacks with a kunai. Masato blocks, but Hoka continues his attack with his other hand, trying to seal his chakra points. Masato uses the force Hoka is putting in his kunai attack to jump back. Before Miko and Hoka could press on their attack, he ran towards Fujin. But he was quickly attacked by two wind explosion jutsu by the wind clone Fujin left to keep an eye on him. The wind explosion wasn't actually targeted at Masato. Instead, the clone launched them in such a way that they would cut off his path. They exploded even before reaching the men threatening him with the winds generated. He had to move back to avoid the winds, leading him back to Miko and Hoka. They quickly attacked him, but Masato defended himself again. Only, it was more difficult this time. Miko finally found an opening and kicked his stomach, sending him flying behind. While he was sent flying, Masato thought, these kids are strong. 
even if I fought only one at a time, I'll have a hard time defeating them without Earth release. Hoka was about to attack again when he noticed Miko making a few hand signs. He quickly moved out of the way. Masato too noticed the hand signs. Miko finished making her hand signs, fireball jutsu a huge fireball moved toward Masato rapidly. Hoka followed the fireball from the left, if he dodges here, I'll get him. Masato, noticing Hoka, dodged to the other side. The fireball reached his original location and exploded. Since the debris underneath was mainly wood, it set off another fire. The explosion also sent a lot of burning wood flying in every direction. Masato, even after dodging, had to use his sword to block a couple of burning logs flying toward him. The smoke and dust created by the explosion, Masato heard the sound of shurikens flying. He quickly jumped to his left, while frowning, I need to get out of this smoke screen. Both of them have Dejutsu. I'll be severely disadvantaged here. However, even after moving, three shurikens came at him. He blocked one with his sword, and barely dodged the other two. One of the shurikens left a cut on his right cheek. While the other shuriken missed his abdomen from the left by a few inches. He sighed in relief after dodging them when he suddenly felt a sense of crisis. He felt two strings, one touching right where the cut was left, while another on the left side of his abdomen, fuck. The shurikens had strings attached. Masato quickly made a hand sign. Miko smirked on seeing that Masato fell for the strings. She pulled them so that they trap him, and the shurikens returned to hit him in the back. Hoka too observed with his biakugan. He saw that Masato got trapped by the strings and the shurikens hitting his back. However, he changed into a log the next moment. Hoka and Miko noticed his chakra reappearing outside the smoke screen. He had a cut on his right cheek, and his expression was very grim. He said, you brats are very good. As he said it, he was analyzing, it's very difficult to fight them here. I need to move to the ground. However, if I move, those genins will be all dead. While well thinking, he turned his head to look at his genin underlings. He was shocked as his eyes met Fujin's eyes, all dead. So quickly. Fuck it. Having realized that Fujin would attack him too, he decided to move to the normal ground, the only worry now is if they attack Tomio and other Chunins instead of following me. But if they do that, I can sneak attack them. On concluding his thoughts, he quickly tried moving out of the debris area and into the open field. Miko and Hoka noticed it and thought, not good. He is trying to attack the merchants. Miko quickly made a few hand signs and launched another jutsu, Phoenix Age Fire Jutsu. Small balls of fire were fired on Masato's path, preventing him from getting away. Hoka used the distraction created by the fireballs to close the distance and attack Masato again. This time, Masato counterattacked fiercely, making Hoka retreat. However, at the next moment, he felt the wind on his back. He quickly turned around and used his sword to block the incoming sword. Fujin, noticing Masato's attempt to run away used Miko's and Hoka's attacks as a distraction to attack. After blocking the slash, Masato looked around and became worried. Fujin's clones were moving toward him. However, even before he could wonder what to do about them, another incident horrified him. Fujin's sword cut his own sword into two. He quickly released his sword and moved backward screaming his mind, what the fuck? As he moved backward, he noticed Hoka moving rapidly toward him. Hoka smirked, time to finish this. He got into stance to perform eight trigrams. Masato noticed Hoka's stance from the corner of his eyes. He quickly made a hand sign. All the three genins noticed that it was the hand sign for substitution jutsu. Hoka pressed on with his attack, while Fujin and Miko prepared themselves by gathering chakra at their feet. Hoka and Masato finally were about to make contact, when Masato substituted with another log of wood. As soon as he substituted, Miko threw a bunch of shurikens so that he couldn't retreat anymore, while Fujin sent a flying slash at him. Masato was on guard and moved out of the way. Unfortunately, the only way available for him was towards Hoka. He had a bitter expression on his face, these brats are relentless. I have no openings at all. Masato prepared to take Hoka head on as Hoka rushed towards him. However, before he could engage Hoka, two shurikens stabbed him in his back. Fujin smirked projectile control jutsu is really handy. When Masato's attention was occupied on Hoka, Fujin used projectile control jutsu on the shurikens Miko had thrown, and changed the direction of a couple of shurikens to hit him. While the hits weren't lethal, they caused Masato great agony. 
and it finally provided Hoka with an opening. He immediately used 8 trigrams, 16 palms on him, closing a lot of his chakra points. As soon as he was done, he moved behind. Miko and Fujin both stepped in for the kill. They both flickered in. Miko used fire release, 4 jutsu on his chest, right where his heart should be. While Fujin slashed his sword towards his neck. In his final struggle, he tried stepping towards his left, so that he'll move away from Fujin's sword, and Miko's jutsu wouldn't hit his vitals. Miko's jutsu hit the center of his chest, piercing through the elite Chunin's body. Fujin's sword missed Masato's neck by a few centimeters. But at the next moment, his head still flew off in the air, due to the increased range from wind chakra flow. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko finally sighed in relief, and were excited about managing to kill someone this strong without any aid from their sensei. Masato, however, died in grief. He never got to use the jutsus he was most proficient in. Renjiro's clone had observed the whole fight, good. Though they made a few mistakes, overall their performance was very good. They were also very lucky though. That guy's nature affinity was probably Earth, and he couldn't use it due to the terrain. Rinjiro vs Tomio and Chunin's while his students were engaged in combat, Rinjiro himself was fighting against the main enemy combatants. Just like Masato, Rinjiro too was restricted here, due to not being able to use the majority of his Earth Jutsus. Rinjiro observed his opponents, one Jounin and five Chunin's. Been a while since I had to fight against these odds. I wonder if they can put up a fight though. His opponents too observed him. They were very tense. Tomio thought, he specializes in earth and water jutsus. This terrain should void most of his earth jutsus. And I can cancel out his water jutsus. And he won't retreat due to his students, and might even be distracted by them. We have a chance. After concluding his thoughts, Rinjiro threw six shurikens at his opponents. Immediately, he made a couple of hand signs. Shuriken Shadow Clone Jutsu The enemy ninjas were amused when they saw that only six shurikens were thrown at them. But seeing them suddenly increased to over a hundred freaked them. Tomio once again used Water Wall Jutsu to block the shurikens. Rinjiro smirked. He was aiming exactly for this. While the Water Wall protected them, it meant that they couldn't see Rinjiro. He grabbed his sword and rushed towards them. Unfortunately, one of them was a sensor and he yelled, he's running toward us. He was the same ninja who had earlier detected Firewind Dragon Jutsu. The shout put them on guard and they prepared for a fight. Before anyone could react, he attacked him with his sword, aiming to cut him in two. Knowing that he couldn't move fast enough, he made a hand sign. Rinjiro ended up cutting a log of wood. The enemy ninja sighed in relief and immediately moved toward Rinjiro to attack him right when they saw the sensor use substitution jutsu. However, Rinjiro still smirked. Though Rinjiro's sword cut through a log of wood, his sword emitted chakra that traveled in the form of a slash. It was the samurai saber technique. Though it didn't have the lethal wind chakra that Fujin slashes had, it was still very lethal. Wagarashi Tomio was the one to notice it, and he quickly shouted, careful. And moved out of the way of that flying slash. That alerted all four Chunins. Three of them jumped out of the way successfully. However, the last one was the closest to Renjiro. He too tried jumping but was too slow. The slash hit his knees and slashed halfway through his kneecaps. He collapsed and began yelling in pain. All of the five enemies were now at least a few dozen meters from Rinjiro. So he just stepped forward and beheaded the injured ninja. He looked at the teen ninjas and coolly said, just five more to go. That statement put a lot of pressure on them. Tomio understood that Rinjiro was trying to crush their morale. He shouted, behind me while retreating away from Rinjiro and making a few hand signs. The remaining Chunins quickly moved behind Tomio. Water Dragon Jutsu Rinjiro noticed the hand signs Tomio was making and recognized them. He just waited for him to be done with it. Soon, Tomio expended quite a bit of his chakra to launch Water Dragon Jutsu on Rinjiro. However, Rinjiro just flickered a few times, completely avoiding the trajectory of the Jutsu while muttering, what a waste of chakra. In an instant, Rinjiro was now behind those ninjas, while the Water Dragon Jutsu hit nothing but debris. Rinjiro wanted to attack them from behind, but the enemy ninjas had got a hang of Rinjiro's fast-paced attacks. The very moment that Rinjiro appeared behind them, all three of them made hand signs and launched their jutsus. Water Shuriken Jutsu Great Breakthrough Jutsu Flamethrower Jutsu The three jutsus were released in that order. First, Water Shurikens were launched. 
They were then aided by great breakthrough jutsu to speed up to nearly twice their initial speed. And then, Flamethrower was released into the great breakthrough jutsu, making it very devastating. Rinjiro was very surprised, good teamwork. However, he just flickered again, resulting in another fire being started. Seeing Rinjiro flickering, Tomio made a hand sign. Water bullet jutsu he began shooting water bullets wherever Rinjiro appeared. However, Rinjiro dodged them all with ease, while occasionally sending a flying slash their way. This stalemate continued for a couple of minutes. Tomio wondered, why isn't he worried about the kids? He tried observing the genins through the corner of his eye, and was shocked. That fight only had Masato still alive, and all three genins were ganging up on him. His expression became very grim. By now, three fires were burning in the destroyed part of the forest. A lot of smoke covered the area, and visibility was becoming very low. The remaining 40 bandits were initially confused about what exactly was happening. However, hearing the blasts made them realize that this was the battlefield of ninjas. They too noticed the smoke rising from where the fighting was happening, and all ran away in fear. Tomio and the four Chunins with him were breathing heavily. The short exchange made them spend a lot of their chakra. Rinjiro, on the other hand, seemed like he had just warmed up. Noticing that they were tired and Tomio was checking out the other fight, Rinjiro stabbed the logs under him with his swords, and made a hand sign. This instantly got all five enemies on full alert. In an instant, Rinjiro built up a massive amount of chakra and launched his jutsu. Waterfall jutsu. Tomio immediately made hand signs to create another water wall. However, he was shocked by the sight in front of him. Rinjiro spat out a massive amount of water. They felt, it's as if a tsunami is crashing down on us. Tomio and another Chunin made a couple of water walls. However, it wasn't enough. The waterfall washed all five of them away. It also washed out the debris under them, and doused one of the three fires that were burning. All five of them got washed out in the open fields where the merchants and one of Rinjiro's clones were. Seeing that they were finally on the ground, Rinjiro smirked. All five of them suffered some injuries after getting hit by such a huge move. They struggled to get up. Tomio was the first one to recover. He barely managed to get up on his knees while breathing very heavily. However, soon he noticed something that horrified him. They were on the ground. He had just one thought before he jumped up as quickly as he could, crap. As soon as he jumped, earth spears appeared from the ground. All four Chunins were stabbed. Only Tomio managed to get away. Soon, more spears appeared from the ground, and pierced all four of them, until Rinjiro was sure that they were dead. Wagarashi Tomio saw all his four underlings being killed. He noticed that all other fighting had stopped too. He was horrified and began running towards the land of tea in panic. However, Rinjiro flickered in front of him, with a sword in his right hand. The Genins had finished Masato off right after Rinjiro used the huge jutsu and were observing the fight. Rinjiro looked at Tomio and said, You know, I'm very surprised that you guys chose to fight us in the land of fire, rather than the land of tea. If you had fought in the land of tea, at the very least, you'd have managed to retreat. But here, all five of your forces will be eliminated. Tomio looked at Rinjiro in terror and asked, Has Kanoha already recovered from the losses of the third great ninja war and Kayubi's attack? Rinjiro replied, Not really. But Kanoha isn't something the likes of you can challenge. He then charged straight at Tomio. Tomio grabbed a kunai and prepared to fight, however, in merely one attack, Rinjiro sliced his head off. Bujin, Miko, and Hoka saw the sight. In one fluid motion, Rinjiro sliced his enemy's head off and sheathed his sword, as if he had done something insignificant. Hoka saw it and commented, that was cool. Miko snorted and said, he's just showing off. Fujin nodded, agreeing with Miko. Rinjiro looked at his three students, who flickered next to him in response. He said, good work. Analyze your battle properly. I'll ask for your analysis later. The trio nodded. Fujin asked, Sensei, will we be doing something about the bandits that ran away? Rinjiro looked at his clones. Both of them flickered toward the bandits. He replied, leave them to my clones. While we did win, I won't be surprised if they have someone hidden trying to take advantage. Rinjiro looked at Fujin and said, Fujin, make a couple of shadow clones and a dozen wind clones. Examine the dead bodies and take anything valuable they have. He tossed a few storage scrolls at Fujin while speaking, store the dead bodies of the ninjas in these scrolls. 
Fujin nodded and made the clones, who immediately got to work. Renjiro himself made a couple of shadow clones and a few mud clones, who began doing the same in the mud river. He looked at Hoka and Miko and said, you two should learn earth clone jutsu later. Once your chakra reserves grow, learn shadow clone jutsu. Both will be very helpful. Miko and Hoka nodded, yes sensei. While the bandits, valuables, and dead bodies were being cleared, they moved towards the hiding merchants, and asked them to come out. The merchant sighed in relief and stopped hiding between their goods and rock shields. However, when they came out, they were shocked looking at the condition of the hills and forest around the area. They were also disturbed by the dead bodies and blood around them. Ihatosio walked to Renjiro and requested, Renjiro-sama, can we please move away from here soon? Renjiro replied, we need some time to rest. We will move soon. You guys can get ready to move. Hearing that, all the merchants immediately began to prepare to move. Renjiro looked at Hoka and said, take your shirt off. Hoka took his shirt off, and Renjiro disinfected the cut on his chest and wrapped it in bandages. Fujin's clones first checked the ninjas from the first wave. They didn't have anything valuable as all their scrolls were destroyed by Fujin's first attack. Next, they checked and sealed all the Genin and Masato. The Genins didn't have much. Masato, on the other hand, had a lot of Ryo and weapons. Next, they checked the Chunins and Tomio. They all had a decent amount of money and weapons. Tomio also had a scroll that listed some water release jutsus and another scroll explaining the mission parameters. Fujin's shadow clone quickly skimmed through the water jutsu scroll. However, at the end of it, he was disappointed, I thought I'd get lucky and get some op jutsu. Unfortunately, these all are rather lame. I can probably get them all from the library. Next, he went through the mission scroll, understanding what exactly their mission was. He was surprised, these guys sent five teams of similar size to intercept all five squads that were sent from Kanoha. Aren't they a little too courageous? Also, how the fuck could they enter into the land of fire so easily? And that too without being detected. Fujin sighed at the state of Kanoha and land of fire, if all countries have such a weak border force, even I won't have any difficulty in moving around. No wonder the Akatsuki were pretty unobstructed. I thought it was a testimony to their power, but it seems like even a genin wouldn't have much of an issue. In around 10 minutes, Fujin and Renjiro were done. Renjiro's clones were also done cleaning up the bandits and dispersed. Renjiro then sorted all the gains and said, not bad. We got over 1.6 million Ryo, 500 shurikens and 100 kunais. He stored everything in his scroll and said, I'll divide the weapons equally among us. The money, half will be given to the village, remaining will be divided among us in the same way as we divide the mission rewards. Hoka and Miko didn't care about money, so they just nodded. Fujin didn't care much either, but thought, wow. 1.6 million Ryo just from one fight. No wonder so many ninjas go rogue. The merchants too heard what Rinjiro said. They were shocked, he got so much money just with a few minutes of fighting. We risk our lives traveling from one country to another, and don't even make half that amount. Not to mention, we have to split it between twice the people. They were very envious, but seeing the state of the forest and hill, they didn't have a single evil thought in them. While resting, Team Rinjiro ate a few ration bars. Around the same time, Team Rinjiro was attacked, all the other four teams were attacked as well. The force that attacked the Anbus was the strongest. However, they also got annihilated the quickest. Of the three Chunin squads, one managed to defeat their enemy. The remaining two caused a lot of damage to their enemy and retreated safely. They would later coordinate with Kanoha forces placed on the borders of the Land of Fire, and exterminate those forces by multiple ambushes. The Wagarashi family, which sent many of their high-level ninjas and spent a fortune on hiring rogue ninjas, would never imagine that each and every ninja they sent would end up dead. They had another strong force assembled in the land of Tita ambush if their initial assault failed. However, after getting no reports from two attack forces and getting reports of defeat from the other three, they cancelled all their plans and disbanded the force they raised. Their plans for dominating the land of T would come to a halt for years. Team Rinjiro completed its mission with no further incidents. After reaching Degarashi port, Tashio carried the goods into Wasabi property. There, Rinjiro and Tashio met with the Wasabi family head. They removed a huge cubicle wooden box that was hidden in between the goods. 
On placing the box on the ground, Rinjiro made a hand seal and said, release immediately. Multiple seals appeared on the box and began unsealing themselves. Rinjiro opened the box. Inside, Wasabi Daichi was sleeping. He opened his eyes as soon as Rinjiro opened the box. If Fujin, Miko, and Hoka saw this, they'd be very shocked. Neither of the three ever noticed someone to be hidden inside the goods. Rinjiro thought about his discussion with the third Hokage. Hokage office 16 days ago. Hirazan looked at Daichi and stated, Daichi, escorting you normally wouldn't be possible with just one squad. So we will be sealed. Daichi thought for a bit and asked, the trip to Degarashi port will take more than two weeks. So how will I be sealed? Here is an answered, we will seal you inside a box. Inside it, we will inscribe seals that'll ensure a fresh supply of air to you. It'll also make you undetectable by any means. Your water and food will be stored inside scrolls. With enough to last a month. As for your excretions, you'll have to do that inside storage scrolls as well. Hearing that, Daichi frowned. He asked, is it necessary to do all this? Can't I just disguise as one of the merchants and join them? If detected, all the enemy forces will attack us only. I can't guarantee your safety if that happens. Daichi sighed and put forth a couple more ideas. But Rinjiro stated the flaws in them. Reluctantly, he agreed. Wasabi Family Mansion Daichi finally saw sunlight after over two weeks. He tried getting up, but his legs trembled. Rinjiro grabbed him, got him out of the box, and said, you have barely moved for over two weeks. You'll need some time and might need to do some exercises before you can move properly. Daichi sighed on hearing that. The Wasabi family head just laughed and patted his back, don't worry. At least you are alive. He then bowed to Rinjiro and said, Rinjiro-san, thank you for resolving our issues. But the losses that the Wagarashi family took, they won't try anything for a few years at least. Rinjiro nodded and replied, I can't comment on the internal politics in the land of tea but you should take this opportunity to suppress them completely. The Wasabi family head nodded. He paid Rinjiro for the real mission, and invited Rinjiro and Tashio to stay as guests in his mansion. They both agreed. The next day, Team Rinjiro began returning back to Kanoha. They traveled at a very fast speed and returned back to Kanoha by midnight. Rinjiro dismissed the team and gave them a week's break. The Hokage office the next morning, Rinjiro met up with Hiruzen to report the mission. After the discussions were done, Hiruzen asked Rinjiro, the next Chunin exam will start soon. Do you plan on nominating the Genins? Rinjiro nodded, yes. They are quite strong. Becoming Chunins shouldn't be an issue to them. Their teamwork is good as well. They were able to kill an elite Chunin during the mission with ease, though he was handicapped by the terrain. Hiruzen nodded, yes, that's good progress. He suddenly sighed. I had selected quite a few Genins and gave them to capable Jounins so that they can be trained quickly. I plan to keep track of all of them, but unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to follow up on them. Rinjiro didn't respond. After all, he was well aware of how busy the Hokage was. Hiruzen asked, can you tell me the current power of the Genins and their future prospects? Rinjiro nodded, sure old man. As I said, all three are very strong. Hoka is still obsessed with Hayuga's gentle fist style. But he has learned quite a few jutsus to help him fight at mid-range. He has learned a few earth and water release jutsus. Once the Hayuga family begins training him seriously, he will have no issue becoming a special Jounin in a few years. Even becoming a Jounin should be doable for him. As for elite Jounin, it's too soon to comment. As for weaknesses, Hoka still prefers to jutsu a lot. So it creates a few vulnerabilities for him. He'll need a few rank B missions to iron out that flaw. He does have a decent amount of chakra reserves. So learning a few rank B jutsus should aid him a lot. Hiruzen nodded and replied, nice. As for the weakness, almost all Hayuga shared. He sighed before continuing, they are obsessed with their gentle fist. Rinjiro nodded. Very few Hayuga ninjas choose to learn non-Hayuga jutsus. Hiruzen continued, once he becomes a Chunin, I'll have him join multiple B-rank missions. What about the other two? Rinjiro began talking about Miko, Miko is well balanced. She is good at ninjutsu, jinjutsu as well as tojutsu. And like all Ichiha, she is good with shurikens and wires. Just having the shuringan makes her strong. Like all Ichiha, she has a strong affinity to fire release, and can also use earth release jutsus for defense. 
She shouldn't have any issue becoming a Jounin once her chakra reserves grow. Elite Jounin 2 might be attainable for her. But I can't comment much on it right now. As for her weaknesses, she doesn't have any in terms of her technique. But she is very impulsive. And she is very arrogant. In the last 8 months, her arrogance has decreased considerably, but it's still there nonetheless. Here is a nodded, yes, the Sharingan does boost their confidence a lot. Well saying, he sighed internally, the differences between Acheha and the village are increasing day by day. I hope they calm down and let this old man live in peace. Rinjiro continued, lastly Fujin. Surprisingly, his growth has been the fastest in his team. He has become a very capable sensor. If we consider just that aspect, he is already as good as Jounin rank sensors. His chakra reserves are already at the Jounin level. He has learned Samurai Saber techniques, and is very good with wind release. He has also learned Senju to Jutsu style, and has very good chakra control. He can also supercharge wind Jutsus with ease. He also learned Earth release Jutsus for defense. Hirizen's eyebrows rose when he heard that Fujin had learned Senju to Jutsu style. This was something he didn't expect. He wondered, does Fujin have Senju or Yuzumaki ancestry? Rinjiro continued, also, he is very fast, and can perform body flicker and wind instantaneous body jutsu without any seals. In fact, the way he operates is quite similar to our Anbu. I'd recommend you recruit him into Anbu. In fact, I'd recommend you to break the tradition, and not wait till he turns 13 to recruit him. Regarding his future prospects, I'm confident that he'll become a Jounin at the very least. Likely even become an elite Jounin. I'd recommend you give him wind vacuum style jutsus when you think he is ready. It will make him much more lethal. As for his weaknesses, he is way too careful. Even during spars. So he has no experience whatsoever in fighting in crunch situations. And while his behavior might not show any arrogance, Fujin is very arrogant. Likely even more than Miko and Hoka. And he probably doesn't even recognize his arrogance. Fortunately, it doesn't affect him during battle. Hirazin laughed lightly on hearing that, they are and the fact that his chakra reserves grew this quickly and about him learning Senju to Jutsu style. Hirazin thought for a moment and said, I'll keep an eye on him once he becomes a Chunin. I'll consider your recommendation to recruit him into Anbu as well. Rinjiro nodded. Hirazin continued, anyways, you have done a great job with the kids. Now ensure that they captivate the daimyos in the exam. Rinjiro replied, alright. He discussed some more matters with Hirazan before leaving. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko took a week's break, resting and reflecting on their performance. Fujin analyzed his performance and concluded, there isn't anything I'd do differently. The mission Kinda went way too well, to be honest. The only issue I could consider is that I didn't fight any Chunin level ninja head-on. But again, there wasn't really any opportunity to do so. And forcing it to happen would have been idiotic. That said, I did have a few good ideas to improve my wind element further, and make my fighting style even more lethal but, I will probably need to learn mystical palm jutsu first. Or have a medical ninja with me him, even that might not be safe enough. I may need to make some protective gear as well. Oh well, I'll try those ideas later. Not finding anything to improve, Fujin just trained by himself for 7 days. In the following week, Rinjiro once again put his students through a gruesome training session. Finally, on one fine day, Rinjiro assembled the team after training was done. And he handed them three forms. The kids took it and observed. They were instantly excited. Rinjiro said, I have nominated you all to the Chunin exams. If you are all willing to participate, fill in the forms and give them to me tomorrow. The Genins immediately said, thank you sensei. Rinjiro's face softened. He smiled and dismissed the team. When everyone left, he sighed while smiling, I have grown attached to these kids. I couldn't even tell them that this was their last training session with me as a team. He then looked up at the sky, his smile dying down, and a serious and rather grim expression appearing on his face, I hope that their fates are different than their seniors. The next day, all three submitted their application to participate in the Chunin exams. The first exam will be a return test, which will be conducted a week later. Rinjiro gave the entire week off to the Genins. The Genins hence did their own training, while meeting every afternoon, for brainstorming more ideas regarding combination jutsus and teamwork. A week later, Fujin, Hoka, and Miko met in front of the academy building. 
Fujin looked at them and asked, prepared guys. Both Hoka and Miko smirked and replied, of course, the trio went into the building together. The first phase was held in room 301. Fujin wondered, will someone cast a Jinjutsu on the second floor? However, there was no commotion on the second floor. They entered 301 without any issue. On entering the room, they saw hundreds of other genins there. Hoka and Miko were surprised, while Fujin pretty much expected it. As soon as they entered, they got weird looks from everyone. After all, they were the only 10-year and 9-year-old genins here. The trio didn't bother looking for anyone as none of their classmates were participating. While some other Hayuga and Ichiha were participating, Hoka and Miko didn't bother looking for anyone. They just grabbed a few empty seats and everyone's attention was drawn to the door. A sickly man walked into the room. He coughed a few times, as everyone watched with confusion. Even Fujin wondered, who is this guy? At that instant, six ninjas wearing Kanoha Chunin vests entered the room carrying a lot of papers. The sickly guy coughed again and began saying, I will be the cough proctor for the first cough phase. Everyone's eyes twitched. The genins from Kanoha thought, seriously? They couldn't find anyone else. The genins from other villages wonder, is Kanoha in such a dire state that they can't send someone better to hold the exam? Immediately the room was filled with genins whispering or chatting with one another. Some even mocked out loudly. At that time, the sickly guy coughed again and said, anyone who makes noise cough will be thrown out cough of the room. As soon as he said that, he released killing intent, targeting each and every genin in the room. That immediately quieted everyone. No one underestimated him anymore. The majority were frightened by his aura. Even Fujin, Hoka, and Miko had grim expressions. Fujin wondered, how many did he kill to develop such a killing intent? He continued, all of you, cough sit one on a cough bench. The entire room rearranged quietly. Occupying one seat each. Since he didn't say anything regarding seating arrangements, everyone sat close to their teammates. Once everyone was seated, the Chunins began distributing the papers. They kept the blank side up, so that the Genins couldn't read the questions. The sickly guy announced once more, don't touch the papers. Cough at 9.15, you will cough turn the papers over. On saying that, he coughed continuously for a minute. He then looked up and said, each paper has 10 cough questions. You have 5 cough minutes to answer all cough questions. The pass, all cough 3 and a squad cough need to score full. That immediately made everyone even tenser. Fujin thought, just 5 minutes. And a 100% score. The only way that would be feasible is if the questions are too easy. He however kept wondering, and so did many others. They all were wondering only one thing, what exactly is this old man up to? Something is off here. The room was completely silent, other than the proctor coughing occasionally. At 9.14, that sickly guy announced once again, copying is not allowed. And he began coughing non-stop once more. At 9.15, a bell rang again. Everyone immediately turned over the paper. What Fujin saw left him speechless. It wasn't just Fujin, every single of the 336 genins in that room was flabbergasted. Fujin's question paper read, Q1. 3x3 equals Q2. 4, 2 equals Q3. 9x2 equals Q4. 3 divided by, 1 equals Q5. 9 times, 7 equals Q6. 8 divided by, 2 equals Q7. 1, 1 equals Q8. 9x0 equals Q9. 9 plus, 9 equals Q2. Like get us too comfortable and then pull a fast one over us. He thought quickly and concluded, no, something else is off. I am feeling uneasy. He wrecked his brain hard for a couple of minutes before it finally hit him. I'm feeling uneasy. Actually, it's not just due to this paper. It's my chakra. On realizing this, he finally calmed down and closed his eyes. He observed his chakra, it was flowing very smoothly. He took a deep breath and suddenly disrupted his chakra entirely. With his entire chakra disrupted, he opened his eyes and looked at the question paper. Every single number had changed. Fujin immediately began sweating due to how easily he had fallen into Jinjutsu. He lifted his head and looked at the sickly proctor. Surprisingly, there was no sickly man at all. Instead, a tall, healthy and handsome man with long hair stood. He looked at Fujin, smiled and nodded. Fujin thought, Kurama Lumi. No wonder. 
he put his head down and secretly disrupted his chakra again to ensure that there wasn't any multi-layer jinjutsu. He then quickly began answering the questions. Though the numbers changed, the questions were still extremely easy. While riding, he lightly kicked Hoka, who was sitting in front of him, and poured his chakra into him, disrupting his chakra. That broke the Jinjutsu on him. He noticed that the numbers had changed, and all his answers were wrong. He quickly changed them. While Hoka was changing his answers, Fujin turned his head and looked at Miko, who was sitting on his right. Great, she has her Sharingan activated. Miko too had noticed the Jinjutsu and broken it. After she was done answering, she checked Fujin and Hoka's chakra with her Sharingan. Seeing that neither was in a Jinjutsu, she sighed in relief. Fujin answered all his questions and then wondered, when exactly did he cast his Jinjutsu? He looked at Karama Lumi and noticed that he was still coughing occasionally. Fujin smiled bitterly on understanding, his coughing is causing Jinjutsu to happen in this room. Maybe not just coughing, even those bell ringing cast Jinjutsu on us. Sound-based Jinjutsu, applied in very small amounts to ensure that we don't notice any sudden altercations in our chakra, and since it only changed the question paper that we never saw, we all thought that everything is real. While analyzing, Fujin realized, wait. He actually gave us many clues. His continuous coughing was suspicious. And what was the most suspicious were these questions. If the questions were difficult, I'd have never realized the Jinjutsu. Fujin sighed, I didn't expect to learn anything here. But this exam shows that I'm not as careful and on guard as I need to be. If this was a battlefield, I'd be long dead. By 9.20, everyone, irrespective of whether they figured out the Jinjutsu or not, was done answering. A few seconds before 9.20, Illumi announced in a steady and commanding tone, everyone, put your pencils down. Anyone who holds the pencil after the bell rings will be disqualified. The steadiness in his voice surprised many. Right after, the bell rang loudly. Only this time, instead of casting Jinjutsu, it broke the Jinjutsu. As soon as the Jinjutsu was broken, the eyes of many genins widened. They noticed that the questions changed, meaning that their answers were all wrong. Even the sickly proctor suddenly turned into a healthy guy. Some immediately began creating a ruckus, but Karama Lumi leaked his killing intent once again. This instantly quieted down the room. Overall, only 31 genins managed to write all answers correctly. And only 8 squads had all 3 members answer correctly. Among the remaining 7 genins, one was sitting far away from his team, while the other 6 recognized the Jinjutsu at the last minute and couldn't communicate with their team members in time. Fujin sighed in relief, lucky that Hoka was sitting right ahead of me. Once the results were known, Karama Lumi smiled and said, in battle, many times the enemy will subtly cast Jinjutsu on you. That will result in you making one horrible move that'll put your whole squad in danger. Enemies could also use such methods to pass you misleading information. If you were to fall for it, you might put your entire village at risk. So always be careful and on guard while doing your missions. After all, one wrong move and you could be finished. While saying the last sentence, he released his killing intent once again. He then announced, all those who failed, leave. The ones who passed, wait here. The proctor for the second exam will meet you here at 9.45. On announcing that, he disappeared. All the remaining genins disrupted their chakra out of reflex. But they couldn't see him anymore. The genins who failed left in disappointment. But irrespective of their results, all genins learned an important lesson. While waiting, everyone observed each other. Fujin noticed that there were three other teams from Kanoha, one from Hidden Rain, one from Hidden Sand, and two from Hidden Mist. He didn't recognize any of those 21 ninjas. He wondered, isn't Kiri in the midst of a civil war? Can they still send ninjas to participate in such an event? He wondered for a bit before dismissing it, oh well, doesn't matter. Anyways, the fourth Mizukage won't show up. On remembering the fourth Mizukage, he suddenly had a hilarious thought, I wonder if Naruto's talk no jutsu can end Jinjutsu, hahaha. Ha. Or even better, if he used his talk no jutsu on someone who is controlled by Jinjutsu, will his talk no jutsu affect the one who cast the Jinjutsu? Seeing Fujin smile, Miko asked, why are you smiling? Fujin shook his head and answered, it's nothing, ignore it. Fujin then tried to sense the chakra levels of the remaining 21 ninjas. Soon he concluded, alright, no one seems abnormal. Only one guy from Kiri has a rather large chakra reserve. 
but even that is less than half of my own. Others are barely at Chunin levels. Everyone tried similarly analyzing their competitors. At 9.45, a smoke bomb exploded in the front part of the room, attracting everyone's attention. The smoke slowly began clearing out. Soon, we heard a very loud bark. When the smoke was cleared, a large dog could be seen. It was looking aggressively at the genins. However, none were intimated. Behind the dog, Tsu Minyuzuka was standing. She observed the room and muttered softly, only eight teams. I knew it was a terrible idea to make that ass a proctor. She looked at all the genins and announced loudly, I'm Tsu Minyuzuka, the proctor for the second phase of the Chunin exam. Follow me and Kurameru. All the genins followed her. She led them across Kanoha, to training ground 44. She announced loudly, the second phase of your exams will be conducted in the 44th training ground. She smirked, this training ground is also known as the forest of death. This put the genins on alert. At the same time, they also wondered, why is she yelling all the time? She continued, before I explain to you the details and the rules of the second phase, you have to sign these consent forms. A genin asked, what are we consenting to? She grinned and replied creepily, your deaths. This unnerved the genins. She continued, death is a common occurrence in this training ground. That is why it is called the forest of death. You may be killed by the wild beasts in the forests, or your competitors. By signing this form, you state that you are voluntarily participating in this exam, and injuries or death caused in this training ground have nothing to do with Kanoha, and Kanoha won't be held responsible. Achunin under her then distributed the forms. She said, you have to enter your name, signature, and fingerprint in the form. If you are a scaredy cat, then don't sign. You and your team will be disqualified. Hearing this, some genins were excited, while some were worried. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko didn't react. Everyone signed the consent forms without much delay and submitted them. After verifying all the consent forms, Zoom began announcing the details of the exam, I'll now explain the details to you. Every team will be given a scroll. Four teams will be given a heaven scroll, while the remaining teams will be given an earth scroll. To qualify for the next round, you will have to reach the center of this forest with both the heaven and earth scrolls. So, you will have to seize the scroll that you don't have from other squads. There is a tower at the center of this training ground. You have a 5-day time limit to collect both scrolls and enter the tower. Once you enter the tower, there will be no more fighting. If anyone leaves the training ground or enters the tower without both scrolls, you'll be disqualified. Also, all three members of your team need to be alive. Even if just one of your members dies, you will be disqualified. She waited for half a minute for the genins to digest the information. Then the questions began flowing. One aimed genin was the first to ask, what about the food inside the forest? We can't stay without food for five days. The fort soon could answer, the Kiri genin, whose chakra level Fujin had noticed to be high, grinned and asked, can we take more than just the two scrolls to the tower? This made everyone look at that genin. Soom answered, there are plenty of animals, plants, and bugs in the forest. Find and make your food. She then looked at the Kiri nin, you can collect as many scrolls as you want before entering the tower. So it is possible that less than four teams pass. Fujin heard all the instructions and thought, hmm, same as canon. No one asked any more questions. Soon the scrolls were being handed secretly. Fujin wondered, we don't get a day's break. He looked at Hoka and said, activate your Byakugan and check the type of scroll all squads get. Hoka nodded and activated his Byakugan. Miko went to take the scroll. She received a heaven scroll. After the scrolls were distributed, Tsum once again yelled, Now, a Chunin will guide your team to the gate you will enter from, follow them. Seven Chunins approached one squad each. Fujin observed the approaching Chunin. He wondered, is this Ibisu? Ibisu approached their squad and said, You three. Follow me. He turned around and began walking. The trio followed him. Fujin wondered, I guess he gets promoted sometime in the next three to four years. Anyways, there are only eight teams. So it seems like we will be quite far away from each other. He calculated for a moment and sighed, assuming we get placed at an equal distance and cover the entire forest, then the closest one to us will be almost 8 kilometers away. Much farther than we can sense or see. Soon they reach their destination. Ibisu said, the exam will start in 7 minutes, so wait here obediently. 
He moved away from the trio while keeping an eye on them. Dujin asked softly, do you guys have enough weapons? Both Hoka and Miko nodded. Hoka said, yes, I brought the scroll that Sensei makes us carry for C-rank missions. Miko said, same here. Fujin replied, cool, same here. What about ration bars? This time, both of them replied awkwardly. Hoka said, I only have five. Miko said, just four here. Fujin analyzed, hmm, I have 25. So 34 between us. It should last us two days. So if we complete our exams in two days, we won't need to make our food. Both nodded. Miko asked, so which teams have an earth scroll? Hoka replied, the Nari Yamanaka Akimichi squad, the Kiri squad of that guy who asked whether we can kill, the AIM squad, and the All Hyuga squad, got Earth squads. Miko thought for a bit and said, all four should be easy to get. Fujin and Hoka nodded. Hoka commented, I don't think any squad is as strong as us. Should we try to collect more scrolls and eliminate other teams? Miko quickly stated, yes, let's do that. It'll be fun. Fujin shook his head and said, no. Well we are stronger, if we are careless, we might get injured. If that happens, other teams might get an edge over us. Another issue is that some squads might set up traps and ambushes around the tower. So we should stay in our top condition. Miko complained, come on Fujin. We can do it. Fujin sighed and said, the last round is usually a tournament between us. If we eliminate everyone, how will we show off our capabilities? That made Miko give up. Her shoulders dropped comically and she sighed, all right, they were about to discuss more when they heard the gate opening. Ibisu said, your exam has started. Go in. Team Rinjiro entered the forest of death. After going in, Miko asked, so, where should we go? Hoka replied, we moved around 8 kilometers from where we were instructed. And I noticed that the Nara Yamanaka Akimichi squad wasn't approached by any Chunin instructor. So they should enter through the gate there. Let's make a move on them. Fujin replied, all right, let's go. On deciding, the three begin moving quickly towards the route between the spot where they had a meeting and the tower. While moving, Fujin wondered, Nari Amanaha Akimichi the famous Ino Shikachao combo. This fight should be interesting. I should be wary of the Yamanaka though. Don't want anyone in my head. They look to be around 14 to 15 years old. So they should have been together for two to three years, meaning that their teamwork should be good. Now, how to fight. Other than sparring, in all fights that I have been in, I have fought purely to kill. And killing them would probably not be a good idea. Should I leave the fighting to these two and just provide long-range backup? He looked at Hoka and said, Hoka, the Nar are known for their intelligence. Keep activating your Byakugan occasionally to see if there are any traps. Hoka nodded. Fujin asked them, anyways, any thoughts on how to assault them? Miko and Hoka too were thinking about how to approach this fight. Miko said, these three clans are known for their teamwork. So I can put Jinjutsu on one of them, and completely disrupt their teamwork. As long as we can knock one member out, the other two will fall easily. Hoka replied, yes, but we shouldn't leave ourselves open to the other two, while knocking one out. He frowned and continued, both the Nara clan and Yamanaka clan Jutsus are annoying. Especially to a Tejutsu master. Fujin and Miko both nodded. Fujin thought for a bit and said, the Yamanaka clan are known for being censors. So we may not have the surprise element. But I think the best way to start will be with a fire wind combo jutsu from a range. It should catch them off guard even if they notice us. And if the attack causes them to split, then it'll be easier for us. Hoka nodded and said, yeah, if they split up, then I can defeat the Akimichi easily. Miko said, I can take on the Yamanaka. He won't get a chance to use his jutsus against me. Fujin replied, all right, I can take on the Nara from a distance. Hoka asked, what if they don't split up? Miko said, then we will just have to fight while keeping an eye on shadows and the Yamanaka. Should be easy for you. Fujin might have difficulty though. Fujin replied, yeah. I could just stay back and provide you long range support. Hoka said, no point in thinking so much, let's go and fight. Miko said, yeah, no matter what, we will win easily. After saying that, both smirked and looked ahead. Meanwhile, Fujin had a deadpan expression, just because you can't think of a good strategy doesn't mean that you shouldn't think of one. While Team Rinjiro was moving rapidly, the team they were moving towards was also strategizing. 
As soon as the exam began, they rushed around 1.5 kilometers from their location. However, instead of taking the straight route to the tower, they moved diagonally into the forest and hid there. They took a lot of care in not leaving any tracks behind. After finding a hiding location, they all hide there. The Amanaka Kaoru said, now that we are hidden, what's the plan Minori? On hearing this, Nara Minori sighed. He looked up at the clouds wondering, why do I have to take the Chunin exams? That too for the third time. Can't I just stay a Genin? Yamanaka Kaoru saw his teammate looking up at the clouds and said, well, other than sighing, do you have any other plans? Akimichi Yutaka said sorrowfully, last time we had a day's break in between the first and second phase. That's why I didn't pack any lunch. I'm already hungry. Yamanaka Kaoru saw both his teammates ignoring him and acting childish. He immediately got annoyed and yelled, enough wailing. Focus on the exam. I don't want to fail the third time. This attracted the attention of his teammates. Nara Minori sighed, if I ignore him any longer, he might take over my body and do shameful acts again. He said, this time, only eight teams have passed into the second round. So we will likely not see any quick results. All teams are far away from each other. So finding anyone will be tough. We should wait here and set up traps. When someone finds us, we will surprise and defeat them. As there are only four Earth Scrolls, they will desperately look for us. Yamanaka Kaoru replied, that makes sense. However, what if someone passes the exams with an extra Heaven Scroll? Nara Minori replied, then we will just be unlucky. Yamanaka Kaoru immediately had a deadpan expression. He made a hand seal. Nara Minori immediately spoke, but if the opposite happens, then it'll give us even more opportunities. Yamanaka Kaoru said, yeah, but that's not something we can control. Nara Minori replied, yeah, but we aren't exactly the strongest squad. Sure our teamwork is good. But if we have to fight two squads one after another on neutral ground, we will lose badly. Not to mention, two squads have Hyugas. And both had their Byakugan activated when the scrolls were being distributed. So we should expect at least one of them to find us if they need Earth scrolls. The duo kept discussing strategy, while Yutaka kept thinking about how to arrange for food. After some time, Yamanaka Kaoru suddenly stopped talking. Seeing his expression, Akimichi Yutaka asked, what happened? Yamanaka Kaoru replied, I just sensed someone sensing us. Get ready. He sat down and began sensing around him too. Unfortunately, he couldn't sense anyone. Nara Minori got serious too. He didn't expect to fight someone so quickly. He asked, which squad is it? Yamanaka Kaoru replied, I can't sense them. That made Nara Minori even more alert, this means that their squad has a better sensor than you. He frowned, but which squad would have a sensor with a range exceeding 500 meters? Around 800 meters from their location, Fujin said, found them. That surprised Miko, already. Fujin replied, yeah, but it looks like that Yamanaka is a sensor after all. He noticed it when I sensed them. Oka immediately activated his Byakugan, yeah, I see them too. Around 800 meters from our location. And yeah, that Yamanaka is trying to sense us too. Fujin said, hmm, but I didn't sense anyone sensing me. It looks like we are out of their range. Miko replied, that's good. It means that we have the initiative in our hands. Fujin chuckled and replied, how exactly do you plan on taking advantage from 800 meters away? That made her scowl. She began thinking and soon said, let us just wait here while he is trying to sense us. It'll exhaust him. When he stops, we can move in by flickering quickly. Fujin analyzed and said, and how can you tell when he stops sensing us? She looked at Hoka. Hoka replied, I can't tell that. I can see that he is sitting with a hand seal made. I can tell you when he stops that, but it won't be a surety that he stops sensing us. Hoka kept his Byakugan activated, while Kaoru kept trying to sense them for the next three minutes. Nara Minori frowned, something isn't right. He looked at Kaoru and asked, are they still not in range? Kaoru shook his head. Minori then said, act like you are tired, and stop maintaining that hand seal and get up. But keep your chakra field active. Kaoru didn't reply and followed what his teammate said. Hoka suddenly said, he stopped and got up. Fujin replied, too soon. It looks like they are baiting us. However, Miko got impatient. She said, it doesn't matter, let's go. And she flickered. 
Both Fujin and Hoka followed her. Fujin said, prepare your jutsu. Miko began supercharging her jutsu. Fujin did as well. At around 400 meters, Fujin said, he sensed us. Miko frowned upon hearing that, and then snorted, it doesn't matter. Let's hit them with a big one. Yamanaka Kaoru said, found them. 400 meters to our south. Nara Minori smirked, fell for it. They must have a Hayu Kaoru shouted, they are coming here very quickly. And have built a Hu however, before he could complete it, a massive fire appeared. All three were dumbfounded. The fire was 25 meters wide and 10 meters high. It spread like a wave, and approached them at a rapid speed. Minori shouted, Yutaka Akimichi Yutaka didn't need to be commanded. He immediately slammed his hands on the ground, and a dome appeared, covering all three of them. The fire passed over the dome, heating its outer cover. But it didn't damage it. The attack disabled all traps that they had set up in a short time. Hoka saw them protecting themselves with an earth dome. He made a hand sign and waited for the flames to pass. Heoru sensed his chakra spiking and said, one of them is preparing another jutsu. Minori thought rapidly and said, Yutaka, make a way to exit towards the back of the dome. Be prepared to escape as soon as the fire passes. Yutaka created an exit towards the back side of the dome. They could see a huge fire and immediately felt the heat. However, Hoka also saw the exit being made. Soon, the jutsu died down and flames were carried away by the winds. All the trees in the area were burning and the fire was spreading. As soon as the fire passed through the area, Hoka flickered in front of the dome and slammed his hands on the ground. At the same time, the trio in the dome ran out of it. However, instead of the stone spears forming inside the dome, they formed right on the path they were running in. They immediately jumped. They managed to avoid lethal injuries, however, they were still slashed by the spears in many places. Especially Yutaka who was slashed at seven spots and had a bad injury on his foot. They finally managed to jump away from the stone spears, however, their misery wasn't over yet. When they were still in mid-air, Miko launched Phoenix Age Fire Jutsu on them. Fujin too was in a position to use Wind Explosion Jutsu on them, but he didn't as that might kill them. They didn't have any opportunity to dodge or defend, and were hit head-on by the Jutsu and fell to the ground. They were burnt. Even worse, their clothes caught fire. Even before they could extinguish the flames, they all felt a kunai placed at the back of their necks. Fujin's wind clone said, don't move. Give up your scroll and we will leave. Understanding the severity of the situation, Minori said, give it. Kaoru immediately handed the scroll. Fujin asked, is this scroll real? Minori replied quickly, it is. Fujin looked at Hoka and Miko, and they both nodded. Fujin did too, and they all flickered away. Minori, Kaoru, and Yutaka immediately doused the fire on the men ran away from the area. After moving around 500 meters west, Yutaka slammed his hand on the ground, earth release, camp jutsu he created an underground cave, where they hid and began treating their wounds. Yutaka smiled bitterly and said, we lost to the youngest squad. Minori sighed, they were too swift and brutal. We didn't even have a chance to retaliate. Kaoru was depressed, this is depressing. We lost a 10-year-old kids this time. I don't think I'll ever become a chunin. Minori and Yutaka felt bad on seeing him. He was almost in tears. However, they knew that, with their wounds, getting two more scrolls would be impossible. They both decided to train seriously for the next six months, and become chunins. Yutaka said, sorry Kaoru. Next time we will train even more and become chunins. Kaoru didn't reply. Elsewhere, Fujin, Hoka, and Miko gathered together 500 meters north of where the fight happened. Fujin said, well, this was easy. Miko grinned and said, yes, our surprise attack always works. Hoka sighed and said, I too want to join in on your combo jutsu. It's so devastating. Fujin said, sadly earth and water don't mix up well with fire wind. Anyways, now that we have our scroll, let's rush to the tower. It has only been 15 minutes since the exam started. We may become the fastest squad to clear this round. Hearing this, both Miko and Hoka got excited. They both said, let's go. The trio ran at a very fast speed towards the tower. Fujin thought, there are only six more teams. It's unlikely that someone will go to the tower so soon. However, he was wrong. Very wrong. While Fujin's and Minori's teams had clashed, the other teams still hadn't made contact with anyone. 
some teams chose to hide. While some decided to go on a hunt. They would end up trying to track each other for more than half a day before the first clash would happen. Meanwhile, the second team from Kiri decided to run straight to the tower and prepare a trap there. En route, they had to fight wild beasts thrice, which slowed their speed. They needed around 30 minutes before the tower was in sight. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko too came across wild beasts twice. One was a 5 meter tall chimp, while the second was a 3 meter tall tiger. However, both were cut with ease by Fujin. There were other obstructions too along the way. Such as a massive beehive that was poked by Miko. She did end up burning them away, but not before getting stung in the face a couple of times. Hoka and Fujin laughed at her cost. As they were moving along, Fujin wondered, at this rate, we will break the record by a huge difference. So why did this team not make the record in canon? Was only my addition enough to make such a huge difference? Fujin thought for a bit before concluding, it's likely that Rinjiro became our Jounin instructor, due to my request of being taught samurai saber technique. So whoever became the Jounin instructor of these two most probably didn't train them with the same intensity as Rinjiro. Also, without me, the team wouldn't have the fire-wind combo jutsus, which gives us a huge advantage to start with. Oh well, doesn't Matt Fujin's thoughts were suddenly interrupted by Hoka saying, there's a team ahead 700 meters from us. Fujin frowned and asked, which one? Hoka replied, looks like a Kiri squad. Fujin asked, is it that guy who asked that question? Hoka shook his head and said, the other Kiri team. Miko said, let's fight. The last one was unsatisfying. Hoka agreed with her, yes, I agree. Fujin said, alright. Their other team seemed very interested in killing. He grinned and said, so we might as well kill this one. They moved ahead quickly. Fujin said, these guys don't seem to have a sensor. They might die just from the surprise attack. Hoka frowned and quickly said, let's not do the surprise attack. I want to fight them. Fujin raised his eyebrow and asked, why no sneak attack? It's dumb to not do it when we have the opportunity. Miko said, I too want to fight them head on. So it's two against one. Hoka smirked and said, yes, we fight head on. Fujin sighed, these kids no wonder they didn't create any records. Even if I assume that they were as strong as we are now, they probably just fooled around instead of passing quickly. Seeing Fujin sigh in defeat, they both smirked. The Kiri squad was also moving towards the tower. However, at 100 meters from the tower, they were attacked by a huge anaconda. They quickly dodged and threw shurikens at it, but it had no effect. So they tossed a few kunais with explosion tags in its huge mouth and ran away. The anaconda exploded into flesh and blood, littering the nearby area. They sighed in relief. Unfortunately, another calamity was heading their way. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko were now within 100 meters of them. They flickered. Fujin guessed, I guess another team will go down quickly. Rinjiro's training made us too strong against Jenin's. The three Kiri Genins had just put their guard down, when Miko and Hoka suddenly appeared right in front of them and shouted, fight me. The Genins were very startled. And they moved behind in fear as both of them suddenly yelled. Their Miss Fujin had flickered silently behind them, and they were moving towards him with their backs facing him. Fujin sighed internally on seeing that and just slashed his sword in the air. Though Fujin was quiet, they still sensed someone behind them. They turned behind, only to see that ninja swing his sword from about 10 meters away from them. Suddenly, one of them yelled loudly, duck. Hearing her, both of her teammates ducked immediately. Sakai Yumi, who yelled, immediately ducked. Her two teammates were slightly slower. Matsushita Satoru lost around half of his hair. While Kido Kahaku had some skin on her scalp cut off by the slash. Since the distance was too close and because Hoka and Miko were also in the line of attack, Fujin only sent a simple sword slash without any accompanying sharp winds. However, Miko and Hoka didn't know that and immediately flickered in opposite directions. They still remembered the devastation his sword slash had caused. Fujin was very surprised, all three dodged. I expected all three to die. Fujin noticed Sakayumi's eyes. They were blue and were glowing. He wondered, is there another Tejutsu? As soon as the sword slash passed over her head, Yumi created a hand sign, water release, water bullet Jutsu Satoru also created a few hand signs, hidden Miss Jutsu. While the third one opened a scroll, got a huge bandage, and placed it gently but quickly on her scalp. She was freaked out. 
Fujin was surprised at how quickly they counterattacked. He moved to his left to dodge three water bullets continuously before sending another flying slash. All three moved away. Hoka and Miko attacked as soon as they dodged the slash. Miko launched Phoenix Fire Sage Jutsu on them, but was countered by Yumi's water wall. Hoka tried to close in to fight, but Kahaku, who recovered surprisingly quickly, threw a kunai with an explosion tag attached to it. Hoka was forced to fall back. Soon, mist began gathering in the area. This made all three Kanohe Genins frown. The hidden mist jutsu was known to obstruct both the Sharingan as well as the Byakugan. Fujin moved behind and used Great Breakthrough Jutsu after supercharging it for a couple of seconds. Miko and Hoka noticed Fujin supercharging his jutsu and retreated behind Fujin. The Kiri Genins had no idea. They were hit by a massive Great Breakthrough Jutsu. All the mist was blown away. They were having a hard time holding on to the ground. Yumi barely made a hand seal, water wall jutsu a water wall began forming, but it kept getting blown apart by the winds. Kahaku and Satoru used the few moments of respite to use defensive jutsus as well. Satoru created another water wall, while Kahaku created a rock shield. However, at that time, both Miko and Hoka also launched their jutsu. Miko spat a huge fireball into Fujin's great breakthrough jutsu. While Hoka used stone shuriken jutsu to attack them from a range. The fire and winds managed to destroy two water walls and heated the rock shield, but it held on. However, due to the wild nature of the winds, the fire spread all over and attacked them by moving around the rock shield. However, this wasn't strong enough. Yumi used water shield jutsu in time to protect them. Hoka's stone shurikens were blocked by the rock shield. Seeing the opponents manage to defend surprised all three of them. Miko grinned and said, they are strong. This is fun. Hoka and Fujin had slightly different thoughts. Hoka was sad, why is no one fighting with Tajutsu? Fujin, on the other hand, wondered, we are just 100 meters from the tower. Should I grab these two and flicker? After the fire and the winds died down, Hoka and Miko flickered close to their opponents. The Kiri Genins noticed and got ready. Fujin thought, this could be a long fight. Let's end this. He instantly created 12 wind clones, who jumped into battle, while he stayed back, observing the fight. As soon as Miko appeared, Yumi rushed towards her, and both began fighting with their kunai. Kahaku used stone shuriken jutsu on Hoka. He dodged and blocked all of them, but was made to retreat once more with another explosion tag. Satoru was about to join the battle as well, however, he saw 12 clones coming, and his expression became grim. He quickly made a hand seal and created three water clones. He made a few more hand signs, water shuriken jutsu soon, water shurikens flew towards the clones. However, they all dodged with ease. Three clones moved towards the water clones. The water clones too moved against them. The Kiri Genins were on alert due to nine additional clones heading towards them. Satoru's water clones thought that the wind clones wanted to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat and were very confident. However, just before they reached them, all three clones suddenly used wind explosion jutsu. The jutsu was performed very quickly. The water clones couldn't defend themselves and were hit. All three were dispelled. All the wind clones suddenly flickered and surrounded Kahaku, who was already injured earlier. She was alarmed. So were her two teammates. Yumi tried going to help her but was blocked by Miko. Satoru did move to aid her and used water shuriken jutsu on the clones. All but one clone immediately launched wind explosion jutsu on her. The last clone used breakthrough jutsu on the incoming water shurikens. Fujin saw from afar and thought, one down. However, he was surprised. Kahaku made a hand sign and disappeared underground. Hoka, who was annoyed by Kahaku, immediately made his move. He slammed his hands on the ground, rock spear jutsu soon, spears began forming underground and targeting Kahaku. However, she dodged them all underground and appeared a few dozen meters away. Her exit spot was close to Yumi. As soon as she appeared, Fujin's clones launched another round of wind explosion jutsu on her. However, she ignored them and slammed her hands on the ground. Stone shurikens were immediately launched on Miko. She moved back to defend herself. Yumi thought, I need to be fast. She rapidly made a hand seal, and a water wall formed in time to protect Kahaku. Fujin, who was observing from a distance wondered, are they really just genins? The clones were about to attack again, when Yumi shouted, retreat. 
Immediately, both Satoru and Kahaku retreated along with Yumi. They retreated towards the tower. Miko and Hoka immediately followed. So did Fujin and his clones. The Kanoha Genins were faster and caught up several times. However, the Miss Genins always managed to defend. After four minutes of chase, the Miss Genins had a lot of cuts on their bodies due to sharp winds, but none were lethal. The Miss Genins were very worried. Yumi shouted internally, why are these ten-year-old brats from Kanoha so strong? We have no chance of winning whatsoever. Also, why are they so bloodthirsty? All their attacks are aimed to kill or maim us. These bloody Kanoha hypocrites. They look down on us for being so bloodthirsty but train their own kids to be relentless killers. But, what should we do? We can't escape forever. She focused chakra in her eyes and looked around her, praying to find some hope. And she did. She noticed three chakra signatures heading rapidly towards them, which were about 400 meters to the north. She recognized them and instantly her spirits were lifted. She shouted, follow me. Both Satoru and Kahaku followed her lead. Fujin frowned, the other Kiri team is coming from that direction. If they team up, it'll be very difficult to win. That said, I don't understand one thing. How did that blue-eyed girl sense them? I didn't feel any chakra field. Is it her eyes that were glowing? Fujin created a shadow clone, which followed the wind clones. Miko and Hoka were still relentlessly chasing them. Fujin flickered next to them and shouted, wait, there's another Kiri team up ahead. Miko and Hoka became alert. But soon Miko said arrogantly, let's keep attacking. We will beat both of them and knock them out. Hoka too supported her, yes, this is getting exciting, let's do it. Fujin once again had a deadpan expression, these cocky brats. Seeing that Fujin wasn't replying, Miko and Hoka turned and were about to chase. However, Fujin had enough of their antics. Before either Hoka or Miko could flicker, Fujin grabbed their shoulders. They both turned their heads and looked at him. Miko asked, what? Fujin didn't reply and just grinned, wind instantaneous body jutsu before either of them realized what was happening. Fujin dragged them both alongside him with wind instantaneous body jutsu and entered the tower, which was very close to their location. Hoka and Miko were both shocked when Fujin dragged them along with him. They wanted to stop him but couldn't do anything. In an instant, they appeared inside the tower. Both were dumbfounded. Miko then got very angry and shouted, why did you drag us here? It was just getting exciting. Fujin replied in an amused tone, we couldn't defeat those three. How were you planning to defeat six? Miko angrily replied, they were just running away like rats. I just needed one look in their eyes, and they would have died. Fujin smirked and replied, forget looking into their eyes, you didn't even manage to land a single wound on them. Miko was about to reply when she realized what Fujin said was true. All her attacks were blocked or dodged. She just snorted and said, I'll remember this Fujin. She walked away from him after saying that. Fujin just shrugged and looked towards Hoka. He bitterly said, I didn't get to fight anyone. Fujin shrugged again and sighed, why do I have to put up with these two arrogant brats? At least they were in control with Rinjiro. Now they just want to fight without using their brains. Around 100 meters away from the tower, the Miss Genins were still being chased by Fujin's clones. They soon noticed that Hoka and Miko were missing. Yumi wondered, where are they? Are they planning a sneak attack? She focused chakra in her eyes once again and observed. However, she couldn't sense any of them nearby. This made her worry a lot. She tried again and again to sense them, but couldn't see either of them. Unfortunately for her, the tower had all sorts of anti-sensor seals on them. So she couldn't see their chakra signatures inside the tower. She kept her guard the whole time, till their team met the other Kiri squad. On seeing them, Yumi immediately shouted, Rentro. Aid us. Rentro was close friends with Yumi. On his commands, all six Kiri genins attacked Fujin's wind clones. Fujin's shadow clone sighed, my wind clones are almost out of chakra. Or I'd have been able to gather their information. When the Kiri genins began, Yumi shouted, be careful. Two of his teammates are probably hidden nearby. I can't sense them. That made them stay on guard. The wind clones knew that they didn't have enough chakra. They had already sensed Fujin flicker away with Hoka and Miko. So this was just supposed to check their skills. Six wind clones suddenly stepped back and dispersed, while the remaining six clones attacked them head on. 
When the clones and Kiri Genins reached each other, Yumi, Satoru, and Kahaku were prepared for the incoming wind explosion jutsus. But the other three Kiri Genins weren't aware. As soon as the clones were around 10 meters away from them, they instantly launched a couple of wind explosion jutsus. Yumi countered with water bullet jutsu. Satoru created a water wall and followed up with water shuriken jutsu. Kahaku used rock shield jutsu and followed up with rock spear jutsu. Rentaro had grabbed his sword and was moving in for attacking with his sword, but he was surprised at how quickly the jutsu was formed and launched. He dropped his sword and made a hand seal. Just before the jutsu hit him, a water wall appeared in front of him. However, it was a very thin layer, and the wind splashed all the water back at him. The water wall did dull the sharpness of the winds. However, one sharp wind still passed through and cut Rentaro's right forearm. He was infuriated. Rentaro's teammates also moved close to Fujin's clones and were hit by wind explosion jutsus. They both received four to five small cuts. Soon, everyone counterattacked Fujin's clones. The clones didn't have any chakra left. So they just tried dodging and closing in the distance further. By observing each other's locations, all six clones got hit at the same time. And right when they were hit, the remaining six clones suddenly appeared and surrounded the Kiri Genins, and used all their chakra to use breakthrough jutsu. Unfortunately, not much chakra was left to make it lethal. The Kiri Genins immediately gathered together and built defenses around them to protect themselves. After performing the jutsu, all the wind clones dispersed. Only Fujin's shadow clone was left. He looked at the defenses. One side was covered by rock shields, while the other three were covered by water walls. Fujin's clone smirked and flickered, it's a shame I don't have a devastating wind jutsu. I'll need to get it soon. The clone flickered right outside the water walls and swung his sword with all his strength. Yumi, who was observing the clone, noticed him flickering towards them. She quickly noticed that Fujin was about to send another sword slash towards them. She shouted, everyone jump. She quickly jumped and suddenly had a thought, huh? Why did I say to jump instead of ducking? To avoid the incoming slash, they could either duck under it or jump above. Usually, ducking is the best choice as you would still have mobility. But for some reason, she instinctively chose to jump. The other five Kiri Genins followed her advice and jumped as high as they could. While in the air, both Yumi and Rentaro launched water bullet jutsu at Fujin's location. Fujin's sword slash cut the water wall with ease. The accompanying winds around the slash destroyed the water wall. All six Kiri ninjas had jumped out of the slash's path. They had jumped high enough that even the winds weren't really lethal. However, the wind still hit them. Yumi and Rentaro's water bullets were stopped by the winds. And the winds caused deep cuts to all of them. On seeing the damage, Yumi was horrified, if we had ducked instead of jumping, we all would have been dead. The damage, though not lethal, scared them. What horrified them was the fact that Fujin sent another such slash their way. Fujin wondered, so, will this kill them, or will they survive once again? Suddenly, Rentro's chakra exploded. He made a few hand seals quickly and spat out a huge amount of water. At the same time, one of his teammates made hand signs rapidly. The water released by Rentaro quickly began freezing. The sword slash initially hit the water and easily split it. But soon, the water began freezing. The sword slash hit the ice. It still went through it, cracking the ice. However, it slowed down. It cut through 80% of the ice before it lost power. The Kiri Genins freaked out on seeing that even ice was being cut. They finally sighed in relief and dropped to the ground on seeing the slash being stopped. The winds accompanying the slash were also blocked. Fujin was shocked, Ice Keke Genkai. Aren't the Bloodline clans being hunted in Kiri? Does that mean that these guys came from Mei's faction? He quickly analyzed while keeping an eye on them, is Mei trying to get some help from Hiruzen? Also, has she begun the rebellion so soon? No, since she has Keke Genkais, it makes sense that she would have already begun the resistance. Though it should be a long war before she wins. I don't think Hiruzen would help out though. There's no mention of this in the manga. And Kanoha is suffering from less manpower. So joining a war will be stupid. Not to mention, Ichiha and the Hokage faction are in a power struggle. So Kanoha shouldn't have any resources to spare. While he was analyzing, the Kiri Genins finally landed back on the ground. Rentaro's face was ugly. He said, I didn't expect Kanoha to have such a strong Genin. 
Fujin replied, I didn't expect Kiri to send an ice Kekei Genkai ninja. I wonder if any more of you have Kekei Genkai. While speaking, he looked at Yumi. He continued, nor did I expect you guys to survive despite being in a crunch so many times. You guys are strong too. Yumi asked, do you want a truce? We won't attack you guys during the second phase, as long as you won't attack us. That way, we will all have a good chance to proceed to the next round. Otherwise, we will just injure each other. Rentaro frowned on hearing it. Fujin was surprised as well, not only do they have excellent survival skills, but she is also smart enough to ask for a truce. I wonder if they have already participated in some war. Fujin's analysis was on point. All six of them had engaged in multiple clashes with the fourth Mizukage faction. They had real war experience. And a lot of it. Which is why they managed to survive the onslaught. Yumi was someone they were trying to develop into a leader. Fujin smirked and said, my teammates wanted to fight even the six of you had on. So a truce is out of the question. Hearing that, Yumi sighed, I am worried that they will ambush us again and again. Also, where are his two teammates? Fujin continued, anyways, I'm out of chakra. See you later. And the clone dispelled himself. The Kiri Genins were shocked to see that they were fighting a shadow clone. Yumi quickly analyzed, all three of them retreated when Rentaro's squad got in range. And they only sent a clone to check us out. But, how did they get away so quickly? My eyes can look at chakras up to 520 meters. Rentaro said, if they escaped, it means that they were afraid of us. Yumi shook her head and said, they have a Hyuga. His range should be greater than mine. I suspect that the guy we were fighting is a sensor too. And all three of them are experts at flickering. So they can continuously ambush us for the next five days. The worst will be if they ambush us when we are fighting. We will be at a huge disadvantage. The expressions of the Kiri Genins became grim. It was never a good feeling to be hunted. Especially considering how relentless their opponents were. Yumi looked at Rentaro and said, let's team up. Otherwise, we may be attacked one by one by them. Rentaro unwillingly agreed, alright. But who gets the scroll? Yumi asked, which scroll do you guys have? He replied, Earth scroll. Yumi said, we have a heaven scroll. If we find a heaven scroll, you guys take it. If we find an earth scroll, we will take it. If we don't manage to get any, then you can take our heaven scroll and advance to the third round. On hearing that, Satoru and Kahaku complained. But Yumi said, if Rentaro's squad didn't appear, then we may have died to that leaf squad. So we owe them one. Rentaro's squad agreed to that condition, and they began treating their wounds. Once healed, they moved together until they found the required scrolls. The entire time they were in the forest of death, they were highly alert to any ambushes. But they were never attacked by Fujin's team. After all, they had already passed the exam even before Fujin's clones fought against the six of them. Our inside the tower, Fujin, Miko, and Hoka, had opened both scrolls. It summoned Adachi Jenki. He was quite happy to see Fujin and Hoka. And was shocked at how quickly the exam was cleared. He said, Fujin, Hoka, good to see you two again. Miko as well. I didn't expect you guys would take the Chunin exam so soon. But how did you manage to clear the exam so quickly? It hasn't even been an hour. Miko looked begrudgingly at Fujin and said, we shouldn't have finished it so quickly. Fujin shrugged once again and said, we came across a team that had the scroll we needed and beat them easily. They handed over their scroll quickly and we moved towards the tower. We did fight a Kiri team afterwards, but they escaped and we entered the tower. Genki was surprised. He asked, that much in less than an hour. All three nodded as none of them felt it was difficult. Genki sighed seeing how none of them thought it was a challenge. He said, well, congratulations then. The previous record was 5 hours 30 minutes. It was made by Ichiha Itachi. You guys broke his record by a huge difference. That surprised Miko and Hoka. Fujin too acted surprised. Miko quickly exclaimed, we beat Itachi's record really. She was super excited. And that too by more than 4 and a half hours. Fujin wondered, I never saw her talk about Itachi, but she is so excited about beating his record. Is she trying to compete with him? Poor girl. Fujin chuckled and teased her, if you had listened to me, we would have broken it by over 5 hours. But you still insisted on wasting time. This made her give Fujin the stink eye. She was still annoyed at how he brought her to the tower. 
She unwillingly admitted, if I knew that the record was held by Itachi, I would have agreed. Gujin chuckled and then suddenly sighed, if we had completed it in half an hour, I don't think anyone would have ever broken our record. Now it's still breakable due to you too. Hoka and Miko both looked at Fujin with deadpan expressions. Well Genki was shocked, you guys could have finished it faster. Hoka said, alright. You win. Now stop loading. Miko snorted and said, if you want to create a record, then fail this exam and give it again next year. Now Fujin had a deadpan look. He replied, you know, the third phase is one-on-one -on -one fights. You better hope that you don't face me in the first round. Or you'll end up being defeated by my clones once again. Fujin smirked on saying that. And Miko was very annoyed, you however, before the argument could get any further, Jinki interrupted them, alright, argue later. You have done an excellent job creating the record for the second phase of the exam. Now I'll explain to you the meaning of the writing on the wall behind me. On hearing that, the Genins gave a closer look at the wall behind Jenki. Fujin remembered, oh yeah. I completely forgot about this. Jenki then began explaining the same thing Aruka explained to Team 7 after they passed. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko heard it, but none were much interested in it. While Jenki was explaining, Fujin received the memories of his shadow clone. His mind wandered, oh, Ice Keke Jenkai. Also the likelihood of them having participated in actual war. The finals should be fun. That said, she proposed a truce. Meaning that, like my clone, she couldn't sense us inside the tower. So until they pass the second round, they will forever be paranoid of a sneak attack, haha. As Genki was explaining to the Genins, a Chunin instructor ran to the room where Inuzuka Tsum was. Tsum looked at him and asked, why are you running? He said, Tsum Sama, one team already passed the exam. Tsum was shocked, what? So soon? Even Kurameru was shocked. The Chunin nodded while still stunned, yes. They entered the tower after only 47 minutes. Tsum was stunned. The record was broken by almost 5 hours. She asked, which team was it? The Chunin replied, it was Senjurinjiro's Genin team. She thought for a bit and said, I had heard rumors that Rinjiro was training his team very hard. It seems that the rumors are true. I guess the beasts from the forests weren't an issue for them at all. Still, to beat Itachi's record is some feat. They can be proud of it. She looked at the Chunin and said, go and give them the instructions for the next five days. He nodded and left. Genki was soon done with his boring explanations. His eye twitched when he noticed that none of the three Genins were interested. After he was done, he asked, do any of you have any questions? Miko asked, do we have to wait in the tower for the other teams? Genki nodded and replied, yes. I think they will send someone to explain the details. Hoka didn't have any questions. Gujin thought for a bit and had a thought. He suddenly asked, Sensei, you said we broke the record, right? Jenki nodded, yes. Fujin asked, so do we get any rewards? Sweat immediately appeared on Jenki's forehead. He recalled the scene of Fujin asking the third Hokage for swords made of chakra metal. He quickly said, no, there's no reward for this. It might help you be promoted to Chunin though. Fujin frowned and muttered lightly, the village is so stingy. Jenki heard it and thought, I don't think Lord Third will ever ask you to choose a reward again. Fujin, however, was thinking, at the end of this phase, Hiruzen will visit and give another speech. Should I ask for a reward then? While he was thinking, Jenki said, well, that's all from me. I'll see you later. And he disappeared in smoke. Fujin kept analyzing, if he says no then, it'll be embarrassing for him. To say no to promising youngsters who are working hard for their village, will hit his prestige. Though, he is thick-skinned enough to say no even then. As he was thinking, his eyes moved towards Miko. He thought, right. The elders and Ichiha have bad blood. He might give a reward to show that he is rewarding young Ichiha, and is impartial to them. He might even hope that this reduces the bad blood a bit. That said, if Jenki is also present, should I still ask? He thought and then shook his head, it doesn't matter if he's there or not. The Tao of shamelessness should live on. Especially considering how freaking shameless they are. If he still says no, I will put on a sad face and act depressed. After I become a Chunin, I'll ask for those wind chakra metal swords that he promised me earlier. Miko and Hoka noticed that Fujin was in deep thought. Hoka asked, what are you thinking about? Fujin replied, oh, nothing important. What do we do now? 
As Fujin asked that question, a Chunin instructor appeared in their room. He said, congrats on passing the second exam. You will stay in the tower for the next five days until this round is over. Miko complained, five days. What will we do here for five whole days? Hoka and Fujin too nodded. Making them stay here for five whole days was unreasonable. The Chunin replied, that's the rule. If you leave the tower, you will be disqualified from the exam. Miko pointed at the Chunin and said loudly, hey, that's unreasonable. Hoka nodded and said, yes, it is. The Chunin dismissed their complaints and said, there are a lot of facilities in this tower. Including many training rooms. You can access them and train there for the next five days. This calmed the Genins down. Ujin asked, what about food? The Chunin replied, it'll be made. Come to the dining room at 8 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., and 7 p.m. The dining room is on the first floor. He then explained some more details, such as their sleeping arrangements, and then left. The Genins looked at each other and said, let's check out the training rooms. And they left. The training rooms were on the second floor. The floor had most of its area closed off by a wall, forming a circular shape in the center of the floor. Fujin realized, the other side should be a part of that area where preliminaries happened. The rooms were on the outer side of the floor, with a meter-wide circular passage to access them. The Genins checked out the name plates on all rooms. There were two meditation rooms, two rooms for dodging, one for tojutsu, five for each element, one for shuriken practice, and a few more rooms. Hoka said, I'm entering the tojutsu training room. Miko said, I'm going for shuriken practice. Fujin thought for a bit and said, I'm interested in seeing what the meditation room has to offer. Fujin entered the meditation room. The room was mostly empty. A couple of bulbs were on in the room. The walls had multiple candles at certain locations. And there were a few incense sticks placed around the room too. At the center of the room, a mat was placed. Fujin picked up the instruction manual, which was placed in front of the door, and read. It read this is a meditation training room. Meditating here will be easier and more effective. For the best effect, follow the following instructions. Light all the candles in the room. Light one incense stick from each bundle. Switch off the bulb sit on the mat placed in the center of the room. Kindly leave everything in the same spot when you leave. Before you leave, blow out the candles and cut the burning part of the incense sticks. Fujin lit the candles in the incense sticks. They began producing a very fragrant smell. He turned off the bulbs, sat on the mat, and began meditating. After an hour, he woke up from his meditative state and concluded, incredible. Meditating here is almost five times more effective than when I meditate at my home or when I did it in the academy. He analyzed a bit and concluded, even though this is good, it still doesn't compare to the gains I get from practicing Senju Tujutsu style. That said, I still meditate a bit daily. So though not significant, it'll still provide me with small boosts, if I can get something like this at my home now, what to do? He thought for a bit, before coming up with two ways, I haven't thought what gift I can ask from Hiruzen. So I could ask him to build such a meditation environment at my home. But, this way isn't a guarantee. I won't get this if he doesn't care about his thick face and says no. The better way would probably be to just create such an environment back home. This place has many seals inscribed, which likely aid in meditation. So it should be made with the help of Yunjutsu. I should be able to make one too, the only issue is that I don't recognize most of the seals. He thinks for a bit more and decides, I'll draw every seal in this room and record their location. After I become Chunin, our team should be disbanded. So I'll finally have time to learn Fuinjutsu. If all these seals are available in the library, then I will be able to create such a room too. He immediately drew the entire room on a large drawing paper he had stored in one of his many scrolls. He drew all the seals and recorded the distance between each seal in absolute terms, and ratio with respect to the size of the room. He grabbed one of the incense sticks that was lying around, and took a bit of wax from one of the candles on the walls. After storing everything properly, he wondered, since this tower had such a room, is it safe to say that every clan has such training rooms? If true, it would explain why the chakra reserves of clan kids are usually higher than civilian kids, and why they are able to master their clan jutsa so quickly. Looks like it isn't all just talent and guidance. I should check out the other meditation room and see if everything's the same. 
And I should also check out every training room, and check the feasibility of creating such rooms. While he was thinking about recreating all the training rooms, he chuckled, well, that's kinda pointless. There's no way my small house can have such rooms, haha. <laughs> While walking over to the other meditation room, he thought, should I buy a new home? Hmm, do I even have money to buy a new home? Or would it be better if I make a secret base? He checked the other room and noticed that everything there was exactly the same. He then began walking over to the dodging practice training room. Having a secret base will be very convenient. Kanoha also has a lot of empty spaces to make secret bases. But, in a village full of ninjas, is it possible to hide a secret base? Hmm, I couldn't sense anything inside this tower from the outside. And, if I recall right, there are seals that can block even the Byakugan. So it might be doable, but still very risky. Should I make one outside the village? No one would check the endless forests after all. But I'll need to be able to sneak out and into the village to actually be able to use it. Oh well, let me learn the seals first. I can then worry about how to make it work. The Ichiha massacre should be happening soon too. I could try to sneak in and use their training rooms if they exist after the massacre. Fujin entered the dodging practice training room. He noticed that there were multiple mechanisms around the room to launch shurikens, kunai, and senbin needles. But all were made out of wood. And none were sharp. Fujin grinned, this should be exciting. He read the training manual for this room. It confirmed that all weapons were harmless. Fujin walked to the center of the room. There was a pulling lever with one rod extending out here. To activate the mechanism, first, the lever had to be moved. The degree to which the lever is moved would denote the percentage of mechanisms that would be activated. Once the lever was pulled, a button had to be stepped on to launch the weapons. The manual stated that this can be done only 100 times before the mechanisms needed to be refilled. Fujin wondered, how many storage seals did they inscribe in this room? While wondering, he grinned and pulled the lever to the max. And then stepped on the button. Immediately, all weapons ran down on him. Shurikens rained on him from seven different locations. He could see five, while the other two locations were behind him. He still heard them being launched and moved to a spot where the shurikens won't hit him. As soon as he moved there, Senban needles rained on him. He managed to dodge most, but five still hit him. One after another, for the next two minutes, weapons kept attacking him. At the end of two minutes, it finally stopped. The entire floor was covered with blunt wooden weapons. Fujin frowned, I was hit many times. I lost count at 136. And I had to block seven with my hands as they would have hit my eyes. Is it even possible to dodge them all? Or rather, at what level can you dodge them all? Oh well, this time Lem try it while using other weapons to block them. He picked up a few kunais and senbins and placed them in his pockets. He kept three kunais in each hand. He then created winds, which cleared the floor and pushed all the wooden weapons to the wall. He pulled the lever once again and stepped on the button. He dodged once again, only this time when he couldn't dodge, he used his weapons to either block at the last moment, or throw it at incoming weapons. He was still hit quite a few times. He analyzed, not bad. This time, I was hit only 43 times. Still a lot though. He then grabbed his swords, alright, this time let's check with my preferred weapons. But without flying slashed. Or this room might collapse. He chuckled on imagining the scene where his flying slashes wrecked the training room. This time, he was hit 82 times, with my swords, I couldn't block at range. So all blocking was last minute. Which is why I got hit more times. That said, had I used flying slashes, I might have never been hit. He sheathed his swords and gathered his chakra. Blue chakra could be seen flowing around him. He activated the test once again. The weapons were once again launched at him when wind waves began forming in the room. The winds began spinning around him at a high speed. They deflected all incoming weapons for two minutes straight. Fujin grinned, excellent. I guess I can call this wind style rotation. Though its power isn't really strong. It probably wouldn't work if these weapons were made of metals and were heavier. Though, it makes sense. Basically, I just applied the mechanics from Ranky Wind Jutsus like Wind Retrieval, Projectile Control, and Wind Levitation Jutsus. If I can add the spinning shield of Wind Jutsu to this, and then manage to pour more chakra and make it spin faster while staying together and not harming me, then this can become a good defensive Jutsu. Though it won't be an absolute defense. 
He then looked at the mess around him and thought, well, defending with ninjutsu or weapons is fine. But this training room was made for improving dodging. Let's focus on that for now. Fujin only turned the lever halfway before pressing the button. He kept practicing again and again. He spent the next four hours in the dodging room. By the end, all four walls had huge stacks of wooden weapons piled. Fujin looked at it and thought, rest in peace the fellow who is supposed to refill these. He left the room and went to the dining room to grab a bite, it's almost 5 p.m. I hope they still give breakfast. After breakfast, he went into the wind element training room while wondering, wind element training in a closed room? I wonder how that works. On entering the room, he saw that the room was rather empty. There was only a meditation mat at the center of the room. He picked up the manual. It read this is the training room for wind element. To train, sit on the mat at the center of the room, and meditate. The table on which this manual has been placed has a few boxes. Each box has nine strips. The strips, from left to right, are made of leaf, alder wood, soft maple wood, hard maple wood, aluminium, copper, steel, titanium, and diamond. The strips, from left to right, get progressively harder. You can test how strong your wind nature is by trying to cut them. Fujin grabbed a box from the table and opened it. The strips were all one centimeter in thickness. He picked up the strips one by one and began cutting them with his wind chakra. The leaf alder wood, soft and hard maple wood strips were cut. On the aluminum strip, Fujin managed to create a three millimeter cut from either side. But couldn't go any deeper. Fujin put the aluminum strip as well as the cut strips back in the box and put it in his scroll. He then walked towards the mat, sat on it, and began meditating. While Fujin was meditating, Tsum walked up to the second floor with her ninja dog while muttering, since one team came so early, I expected the others to come in soon too. But this is too boring. Proctoring is boring. Luckily there are a lot of training rooms here. The training rooms here were made for the instructors who'd be bored waiting for the genins to reach the tower. In a way, these training rooms were their reward or payment. Tsum went into the same dodging practice training room as Fujin had earlier. On opening, she was shocked. Why are the weapons littered all on the ground? She checked some of the mechanisms and noticed that there were no weapons in them. She got out of the room and yelled, Tashiyuki. Get here. The shout was loud enough to be heard throughout the tower, except in the training rooms. The Chunin named Tashiyuki, who was in charge of maintaining the training rooms, immediately went to her and asked, What happened, Tsum-sama? Her mood got even worse. She yelled at him, you didn't do your job of cleaning and refilling the training rooms, and you have the courage to ask me what happened. He was shocked. But he maintained his composure and replied in a neutral tone, Tsum Sama, I cleaned and refilled all the training rooms last night. However, his face displayed slight anger at being wrongly accused. Tsum noticed it. She asked, really? Say that after you check this room. She pointed towards the training room. He entered it and was shocked to see that all 100 attempts were used up. He quickly said, Ma'am, I refilled the mechanisms here last night. I did it for both the dodging rooms. So someone must have used it all. Soom calmed down and asked, Someone used all 100 attempts? Who all have been training here? He replied, How can I know that? She snorted and looked at Kurumeru. Kurumeru said, Let's check. Both she and Kurumeru began smelling the room. Soon Kurumeru said, here and moved towards the wooden weapons and grabbed a kunai, and handed it to Tsum. Tsum smelled it and realized, this smells like that civilian brat from Rinjiro's squad. Kurumeru also confirmed it, yes. She looked at the Chunin and asked, were those three genins told about the training rooms? The Chunin nodded, yes. Takeshi said that they were asking a lot of questions, and he told them to spend their time in the training room. She replied, oh. She looked at Kurumeru again, who was smelling all the weapons. He looked back at her and replied, many weapons have sense, but all belong to the same kid. No one else was here. She said, so that brat was the only one here. And he used all 100 rounds. It's unbelievable. She looked at Tashiyuki and asked, are you aware of what those brats have been doing in the tower? He shook his head and replied, no one kept an eye on them. But from what I heard from others, two of them came down for lunch and breakfast, and returned to training room soon after. And one didn't come for lunch and came an hour late for breakfast. He too immediately returned to the second floor. Soon was surprised, seriously. They are merely ten-year-old brats and have trained all day. 
No wonder they managed to clear the exam so quickly. She then sighed and complained, my son, on the other hand, plays all day and never trains. And though my daughter is serious and loves studying, she too would never train so willingly. She too became a gen in this year, but her sensei didn't even enroll her team for the Chunin exam. Tashiyuki kept listening to her while trying to maintain a straight face, first, she yells at me wrongly. Then she complains about her kids in front of me. No wonder her husband ran away. Tsum looked at him and said, you can go. I'll train in the other room. He left as quickly as he could. Tsum walked towards the room while thinking about how she could lecture Kiba to train harder. On entering the training room, Tsum, just like Fujin, turned the lever to 100% and pressed the button. She and Kurumeru both begin dodging. Occasionally, she deflects weapons that were about to hit Kurumeru. After the first attempt, Tsum looked at Kurumeru and said, I was hit six times. Kurumeru replied, eight times for me. Tsum added, and I deflect three weapons that were about to hit you. Kurumeru said, we seem to have slacked off. She patted his head and said, last time, we were able to dodge everything perfectly once every 11 attempts. Let's try to improve it this time. And since that brat did all 100 attempts, it'll be embarrassing if we can't do it too. Kurumeru barked loudly in response and said, let's do it. Both Tsum and Kurumeru trained in that room until they completed all 100 rounds. Till the 22nd round, they didn't manage to dodge all the weapons. There were instances when either Tsum or Kurumeru dodged all, but not in the same round. On the 23rd round, they both managed to dodge all weapons for the first time. In the 100 rounds, they managed to dodge everything perfectly 11 times. Tsum left the training room feeling proud and told Kurumeru, let's increase it to 15 times tomorrow. It was 10 p.m. by the time they were done. The Chunins in the tower were very surprised when they didn't see Tsum during the dinner. After hearing the story from Tashiyuki, they realized that she too decided to complete 100 rounds. After entering the dining room, she found that it was empty. She began preparing her dinner and called for a Chunin. When he arrived, she asked, any update for today? He replied, nothing of importance. No other teams passed yet. No unusual activities have been reported either in the forest or the tower. Tsum nodded and asked, what about the ones who passed? What have they been doing? The Chunin replied, all three came down for dinner. After dinner, Ichihamiko and Hayugahoka explored the tower for a bit before going into their rooms. Suzuki Fujin was seen heading back to the second floor. We checked a few minutes ago, the wind training room is still occupied. She was surprised once again. However, soon she just sighed and muttered, seems like he is a training maniac. Let him keep training. Forest of Death Not much fighting happened in the Forest of Death. Among the Kiri Genins, Kahaku was very injured, and others too had a lot of cuts. They chose to apply first aid and waited till the wounds closed up and didn't cause any pain. The Nari Yamanaka Akamichi team also stayed hidden. The Hayuga team found the team from Suna. However, their fight was inconclusive as Suna Genins kept attacking from a range. They both ended up retreating. The team from AIM clashed with the last Kanoha team. They lost but managed to retreat. So except for the Nari Yamanaka Akamichi team, all others had their scrolls. Wind training room, Fujin meditated for an hour, before waking up. He kept sitting on the mat while being very confused. What's this strange feeling that I kept getting the whole time? It's as if my wind affinity is increasing. Or perhaps my wind chakra is becoming more potent. Either way, it should be very good for my wind element. But how? He meditated again, and spread his chakra field throughout the room, hmm, nothing here. His chakra field then expanded into the walls, floor, and ceiling of the room. And he noticed, what's this? It looks like there's a stone with a high amount of wind chakra in it. And it's very dense. It looks like while meditating here, we absorb chakra from it in small amounts. That's why I got that weird feeling. Fujin got off the mat and made a hand seal. Earth military movement jutsu he entered the floor. On entering the floor, he could see a lot of seals, and inside the seal was a green crystal. Fujin analyzed, probably not a good idea to test these seals. But the crystal has very dense wind chakra. And it looks like it can help make our wind element stronger. Is this chakra metal? Or something else like an ore? Well, let's call it the wind chakra crystal for now. The important question is, can I absorb it faster? And, how can I get more of them? 
Also, I need to check whether all other elemental training rooms have something similar. He went above the floor and thought, I should have dinner for now. After dinner, I'll check if I can absorb this energy rapidly. I wonder what benefits I'll get from this. Though I should also be careful in case it's harmful to absorb it in excess. He left for dinner. He met Hoka and Miko there. They had a small chat. The Chunins in the tower also introduced themselves and had small talks with the Genins. After dinner, Fujin returned to the wind training room. He began meditating and tried absorbing as much energy as he could from the wind chakra crystal. While meditating, his entire focus was on the wind chakra crystal and its energy. In the first six hours, he didn't have much success. However, sometime after that, he began steadily absorbing energy from the crystal. He lost himself in meditation, completely losing the sense of time. When he opened his eyes, it was already 7 am. Fujin analyzed, I didn't have much success initially. But I think I managed to use up 1% of the energy of the crystal in this meditation session. I wonder if this absorption rate is fast or slow. And how often does Kanoha Switcher recharge this crystal? That aside, unlike what I previously thought, I don't absorb energy from the crystal directly. Rather, it refines my chakra. I have a feeling that I'll have a slightly easier time performing wind jutsus. He frowned, though improvement would likely be very minimal. I'll need to use up more energy from this wind chakra crystal to get a proper idea. I have a feeling that I might need a mountain of such crystals to get a significant boost. That aside, it feels really good to train here. I ended up meditating all night and skipping my sleep, but I don't feel very tired at all though I should take a nap tonight. Meditation, though good, can't entirely replace sleep. After analyzing, he got up and left the room. While leaving the floor, he came across Tsum. She was surprised to see Fujin on the second floor. Her eyes twitched and she asked, were you training the whole night? Fujin laughed awkwardly and rubbed the back of his head, no. I was meditating in the wind training room. And I ended up falling asleep there. Tsum's eyes twitched even more. She sighed and said, it's good to train hard, but don't forget to rest. Or else, the training can be counterproductive. Fujin immediately replied, yes ma'am while thinking, that's the first time I haven't heard her yell he left, got freshened up, had a huge breakfast, and returned to the wind training room. After knowing that Fujin returned to the wind training room, Tsum realized, he is an orphan. He has probably never experienced such rooms. No wonder he is training in that room. I should report this to the third. He'll be happy to know how hard some kids are training. He spends the next couple of days in the wind training room. Though he went out regularly for food and sleep. As he meditated more in that room, he managed to use up the energy at a faster rate. By the end of the third day, he had used up 18% energy from the crystal. He analyzed, good, it is getting faster. I have a feeling that it'll be even faster tomorrow. But, it seems like my analysis was right. Well this definitely is good, I'll need a mountain of such crystals to actually get significant boosts. I wonder how many crystals Kanoha has. And where they are kept. Another point to consider is how much energy from this crystal was already exhausted before I began training here. On day 4, as he predicted, his efficiency suddenly increased a lot. In around 12 hours, he ended up using up almost half the energy from the crystal. However, on this day, he noticed one crucial point. Fujin realized, my chakra increased. Yeah, I can feel it. Though the increase is very minimal, not even 0.1%, it did go up. Damn, now I really want to find a mountain of such crystals. Where are these found? He calmed himself down and decided, lucky, this crystal's efficiency hasn't reduced. I guess this is due to the seals. But I should stop here. I might be able to completely exhaust this crystal before this round ends. But if my speed of using this energy is higher than normal, then I'll get a lot of unneeded energy. I should check out the other rooms and see if they have similar crystals, and if I can refine my chakra with their energy as well. After dinner, he went to the earth training room. On entering, he used earth military movement jutsu, and went underground to check. As I thought. A similar crystal with dense earth chakra is here. But, the amount of chakra seems low. It has only about 15% of the chakra as compared to what the wind chakra crystal had. He thought for a bit and concluded, makes sense I guess. There are barely any ninjas with the wind element in Kanoha. Well quite a few have the earth element. 
So this room ended up being used a lot more. He sat on the mat and spent his entire night meditating in that room. He opened his eyes at 6.30 am and sighed, I thought since I managed to increase the speed of consuming the energy of Wind Chakra Crystal, I'd be able to do the same for the rest. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. I have to start from the beginning. Worst of all, my rate of consuming energy from Earth Chakra Crystal is very low. I think it is just around 5 to 6% of what it was when I started with Wind Chakra Crystal. Does this mean that the speed will depend on my affinity towards each element? It went fast for Wind Chakra Crystal because my affinity is Wind. But for Earth Chakra Crystal, my affinity is very low. He analyzed a bit, wait, does this mean that I can analyze my affinity to other elements, depending on how quickly I can use up the energy of each crystal? Yeah, that should be the case. I should check out the other three rooms. After having breakfast, Fujin went to the fire training room. Here he followed all the procedures as usual. However, when he checked the fire chakra crystal, he was shocked. The fire chakra crystal has 25% more energy than the wind chakra crystal. How? Shouldn't Kanoha be full of ninjas with fire affinity? Could it be that the previous fire chakra crystal got used up, and they replaced it with a new one? After thinking for a bit, he nodded, yeah, that should be the case. He began meditating. He got up before lunch and analyzed, oh, my fire affinity seems to be decent. At least it's much better than earth. The absorption speed here is at 35%, compared to what I could do at the start with wind chakra crystal. After lunch, he went to the water training room. He first checked the amount of energy in the water crystal. It was around 30% of what the wind chakra crystal had. Bujin sat in meditation and meditated till 4 pm. At 4 pm, he got up and sweated a bit, I couldn't refine shit. I didn't manage to use up any energy at all. He sighed, does this mean that I have no talent in the water element at all? A shame. I was hoping to have a good affinity for the water element and to take over Tabarama's Jutsus. After taking a small break for eating, he went to the lighting training room thinking, my main affinity is wind. So I don't really have much hope for the lightning element. Oh well, let's test it out. The lightning chakra crystal had 80% of the energy that the wind chakra crystal did. Fujin meditated for 4 hours. After waking up, he was surprised, wow. I never expected to have the highest affinity to lightning after wind. The speed was about 62 to 63% when compared to the wind at the start. To think my top two affinities were the two most rare elements in Kanoha. That said, I wonder if my speed of refining my chakra with the help of this crystal will increase similar to what happened with the wind chakra crystal. He kept sitting there and thinking. After a few minutes, he concluded, lightning is a very strong element. But, how far can I take it? I'm confident that with enough time, I can master Chidori. Though I may not be able to use it while running at high speeds. But the more important question is, can I master lightning armor like Rakage? Also, how should I go about it? He could dodge freaking Amaterasu. So I don't think it's something as simple as just cloaking the body with lightning chakra armor. Also, considering that no one apart from Rakage managed to learn it, it's safe to say that it is very dangerous to learn it. He thought for a bit more, before getting up and sighing, I need to somehow check whether Kanoha has any details regarding this. If not, then the only choice will be to sneak into Hidden Cloud and read or steal all their scrolls. Unfortunately, that isn't something I'd do before I become a rank S ninja myself, and have excellent means of escaping. I hope the Achiha with their Sharingans managed to copy at least some details, and pass the information to the village. Would be quite a challenge otherwise. Also, considering some of the crazy plans that I made that day, I should keep my lightning element a secret. In the future, that might help more. But, if I keep it a secret, it'll be hard to get anyone's help. So what to do? He kept thinking hard while walking to the dining room. In the end, he decided, my wind element is quite strong. Lightning won't be able to match it at least until I can learn rank A Jutsus. So it won't be much help for me in the short term in any case. So let's just hide it. I'll take as much help as the village can give me for my wind element. And my lightning element will be my hidden element, which I'll use when I don't want to expose my identity. I can also use it to catch the enemy by surprise and kill them if there are no witnesses. Fujin entered the dining room while still in deep thought. He grabbed a plate, served himself the food, and sat down at the table while still in his thoughts. 
After deciding, he was about to think more when he felt, why does it feel like dozens of eyes are staring at me? He looked around him and noticed that the six Kiri Genins were sitting opposite him. He noticed that all six had dark bags under their eyes. And they all had a lot of injuries too which were given first aid. The Chunins, who were incredibly bored over these five days, were paying close attention. They hoped to get some entertainment. Miko and Hoka wondered if they could get into a fight. Fujin looked at the Miss Genins and said, Hey. When did you guys pass? All the Kiri Genins were incredibly pissed at Fujin. They spent over four days on full alert, waiting for an ambush that never came. They barely got any sleep. Even when they slept, they were on high alert. When they arrived at the tower, the Kanoha Chunins all gave them weird looks due to those huge dark bags under everyone's eyes. Yumi controlled herself and replied, an hour ago. You? Fujin began eating again and replied without looking, oh, we passed in the first hour itself. Asshole. Fucking bastard. Motherficker. Fucking asshole. Son of a bitch. I'm gonna beat him up. Every single Kiri Genin cursed him. Of course, they didn't say it out loud as they were surrounded by Kanohe ninjas. But everyone could notice the killing intent leaking out of them. One Chunin whispered to another, Hey, what do you think Fujin did to them that they all want to swallow him whole? The other Chunin replied, Who knows? But if looks could kill, Fujin would have died a thousand deaths by now. Miko and Hoka too wondered, why are they so pissed at Fujin and not at us? After all, we were there as well. Soon they both realized, wait. Fujin still had his clones chasing them. I completely forgot about them. Don't tell me he fought them with his clones. They looked at the Kiri Genins and realized that was indeed the case. Both were incredibly annoyed, this asshole. He didn't let us fight and fought them himself. Both snorted and looked away from Fujin while pouting. Tsum and a few Chunins noticed this. They wondered, now even his teammates are mad at him. What did he do? Fujin ignored them all as he didn't particularly care. He was wondering how many elemental chakra crystals he should ask from Hirazan as a reward for coming first. As for what happened in the forest of death, the forest became very active from day two. Though the forest was huge, almost every team had a sensor. So they eventually end up fighting. The ones who had it the worst was the AIM team, as they didn't have any sensor. They kept getting attacked again and again, but they stubbornly managed to hold on to their scrolls. By day 3 ended, except for the Nari Yamanaka Akamichi team, all other teams had fought multiple times. The Kiri teams were the unluckiest. Every time they fought, they were on high alert for an ambush. So they could never give their 100%. They still won every fight, but the opponents used to retreat every time. And whenever they tried to give chase, they would be attacked by the wild beasts from the forest, delaying them just enough to lose sight of their enemies. So they were very annoyed. On day 4, two scrolls were successfully seized. The Kiri team managed to defeat the Suna team, and got their heaven's scroll. While the Nari Yamanaka Akamichi team, who had healed up, sneak attacked the AIM squad and got their earth scroll. On day 5, the Kiri Genins managed to find the AIM squad and fought them once again. They defeated the AIM team, only to discover that they didn't have scrolls. The Hyuga squad noticed this fight, and waited till the Kiri Genins put their guard down and attacked. Unfortunately for them, the Kiri Genins were always on guard. They lost and couldn't escape this time. They accepted their loss and handed them the Earth Scroll. The Kiri Genins were instructed not to kill any Genins, if they could avoid killing them. So they didn't kill anyone and just took their scrolls. Now, the Kiri Genins had all the required scrolls and decided to head to the tower. En route, they were ambushed by the last Kanoha team. The Kiri Genins were very exhausted and took a beating. But they managed to escape to the tower. The last two teams with the scrolls will search for each other all night, but they won't see each other, and only end up fighting against teams who don't have any scrolls. On the last day, when only 30 minutes were left for the exam to end, the fourth squad from Kanoha noticed that four teams were waiting near the tower. The Nari Yamanaka Akamichi lied that they didn't have any scrolls, and managed to convince others to ally. Unfortunately, the last team had fought against the Hyuga and Suna teams in the night, and had no chakra to continue. They hid in the forest and gave up on the exam. So, only three teams passed the second round. At morning 10 am on the last day, Fujin, Hoka, Miko, and the six Kiri Genins left the tower and focused outside the tower. They noticed that four teams were waiting there. 
The teams noticed them as well, and realized that Nara Minori was speaking the truth. However, other than Nara's team, the other three teams were on alert to prevent one of them from suddenly running to the tower. Unfortunately, the last team never turned up, so they all were disqualified. Since no fight happened, the uninvited audience was disappointed. The Chunins asked those four teams to enter the tower, as they all looked exhausted and wounded. Some time later, the last team also entered the tower. Soon gathered everyone in the large hall where the preliminaries were usually held. She announced, the teams who passed stand here. Soon Lord Hokage will arrive and address you. All nine genins stood in a disciplined manner. While the remaining fifteen genins stood far away. Fujin looked at them and thought, I'm surprised that no one died. It seems like Kiri Nins are here to create a good relationship. So they didn't kill anyone. The Chunins stood around the hall, and some Jounin Sensei began appearing. They stood along with their Genin squads. The two Kiri Jounins also stood there. Fujin observed both of them, but couldn't recognize either of them. Soon the third Hokage arrived. He was accompanied by four Anbu and a few Jounins including Rinjiro and Genki. Rinjiro smiled and nodded at his squad. He had heard that they broke the records by a huge margin. Fujin observed them, Jinki is standing with all the Jounins. Did he get promoted? Or is he here just because his students are here? As for the Anbu, one looks to be Kakashi. I can't identify the rest. As Fujin was observing everyone, Hiruzen stepped in front of them. Sum announced, pay attention you brats. Now, Lord Hokage will explain the details about the third phase of the Chunin exam. Hiruzen stood in front of the kids and got a good look at them. Only three genins from our village passed. Kiri has six. Looks like the rebel faction really wants to create a good image. Well, I can let them win this one. So their leader will owe us one. Even if they win, considering that they are at war, they won't be able to steal Kanoha's missions. After a minute he spoke, congrats on passing the second round. He then looked at Fujin, Hoka, and Miko and said, Congrats to you guys for breaking the record to become the fastest team to pass the second round. On hearing that, the Genins, who failed, were shocked. After all, they were the youngest team. The Kiri Genins and Jounins also looked at them. Though the Kiri Genins were looking at Fujin while cursing him a few more times. However, Fujin was very excited on hearing that, marvelous. I didn't think he'd say this. Now I can ask it without any awkwardness. It'll feel natural too. Here is in continued, before I explain the third phase, I will explain to you the true reason for these Chunin exams, he explained the details regarding how the exam is a replacement for war, and why the Genins need to give their best similar to the way he did in the manga. Everyone paid attention. Fujin paid careful attention as well, however for a different reason. He was picking up points he could use later to compel Hiruzen. After Hiruzen was done speaking, Fujin sighed internally, I barely remember any dialogues from Naruto and Imer manga now. Other than the important events in every arc, I have sort of forgotten everything. Can't really help it I guess. After all, I didn't watch Naruto for years even in my previous life. After Hiruzen was done explaining, Inoichi Yamanaka stepped forward and said, I will be the proctor for the third round. I will now explain the details. The third round will be a simple tournament. The tournament will be held after one month, in front of many important dignitaries like Cage and Daimyos. You will fight against each other alone. Your team won't be able to help you anymore. If you lose any fight, you'll be eliminated, while the winners will get to fight other winners. Hearing this, some of the Genins got excited to show off their skills. Fujin looked at his teammates. Both were incredibly excited. He wondered, what's so exciting about being made to fight for the entertainment of some rich old people? On Kiri's side, Rentaro looked very excited. He looked at Fujin and thought, just win till you fight me. I'll pay you back a hundred times for the four sleepless nights you put me through. Inoichi then picked up a box and said, everyone, pick one piece of paper each from this box. Everyone picked up one folded piece of paper. After picking up the paper, Fujin stood next to Miko. Inoichi said, open it and tell me the numbers on your paper, starting from one. Sakai Yumi, one Shiro Sora, two Hayuga Hoka, three Matsushita Satoru, four Kido Kahaku, five Ichihamiko, six Itsuma Rentaro, seven Suzuki Fujin, eight Yuki Shin, nine Inoichi, noted down everyone's names next to numbers, and showed a chart showing the matchups. 
The announced, the matchups are Sakai Yumi vs Shiro Sora, Hayuga Hoka vs Matsushita Satoru, and Kido Kahaku vs Ichihamiko. Since we have 9 members, the number 8 and 9 will have to fight one additional time. So, the first match of the tournament will be Suzuki Fujin vs Yuki Shin. And their winner will fight against Satsu Marentaro. Fujin thought, one additional match. Shouldn't be an issue I guess. That said, why are my matchups so freaking difficult? Ice release in the first round. Then Rentaro, who looks to be the strongest among the Kiri Genins. That will be followed up by Miko. All three might be tough fights. However, in the finals, I should be fighting with Hoka. That will be an easy fight if I still have Chakra left by then. The others two were thinking about their matchups. Inoichi asked, any doubts? Shiro Sora asked, since this is a tournament, can only one person become a Chunin? Fujin looked at him and wondered, like Hiruzen's speeches, is this question also asked every single time? Inoichi shook his head and answered, no, we will promote you to Chunin depending on your performance in the fights. If you perform well, you may be promoted even if you don't win any fights. So there's a chance that every one of you gets promoted. And a chance that none of you do. Any more questions? No one raised any questions. So Fujin raised his hand and said, Um I have a question for Lord Hokage. Inoichi was surprised. Rinjiro raised his eyebrow wondering what his student wanted to ask. Well Genki was having a very bad feeling, he isn't going to. Is he? Hiruzen gave the kind smile and said, Go ahead and ask Fujin. Fujin looked at Hiruzen smiling and put up a very innocent smile on his face as well. He asked very innocently, Lord Hokage, since my team broke the previous record for the second round by such a huge margin, do we get any rewards? Senju and Jiro's eyes twitched. Genki was horrified. Inoichi, Tsum, Illumi, Anbu guards, Jounin senseis, and the Chunin instructors were dumbfounded. Any rewards? Since when did Lord Hokage begin giving rewards? The Genins from Kiri began wondering, Genins from Kanoha get rewards for such little things. Kiri Genins looked at Hiruzen with longing in their eyes. Their own cage hunted them, while the cage of Kanoha rewarded their own Genins. They thought, the difference between the two cages is like the difference between heaven and hell. While the other Genins wondered, there's a reward for breaking records. Miko and Hoka too stared at Fujin. Miko frowned, I didn't hear Itachi getting any rewards. HMPH, I'm in Achiha, I don't need any rewards. Hiruzen too was dumbfounded. His expression didn't change, but he was left speechless for a minute. Genki yelled in his mind, even Lord Hokage is speechless. Hiruzen began remembering the scene when Fujin asked him for chakra metal swords. His eyebrows twitched, last time he asked for chakra metal swords. What does he want this time? A house made of chakra metal. Hiruzen didn't know how close he was to guessing the truth. If he did, who knows how he would have reacted. He was about to say no when he saw the frown on Miko, who was standing right next to Fujin. He thought, does she also expect a gift? The relationship between the village and Ichiha has been deteriorating day by day. I could use this opportunity to reward her and mend the ties a bit. If it results in the ties improving, then it'll be very good for Konoha. As Fujin expected, Hiruzen decided to reward them. He was about to reply in the affirmative when he felt a chill running down his spine. Hiruzen was a veteran of all three ninja wars. He had fought a lot on the front lines and spread terror among his enemies. However, this was a feeling he only felt when he was about to step into a trap. His eyes went back to the genin standing next to Miko with an innocent smile and an expectant look on his face. He said, yes. Your team will be rewarded for breaking this record. He smiled kindly and said, you guys will receive your rewards on the day of the tournament in front of everyone. This left everyone dumbfounded once again. Fujin too was left speechless, WTF. He will reward us. Meaning that we can't ask for any particular reward. That's bullshit. Fujin maintained his smiling face and bowed, thank you Lord Hokage. However, his thoughts were the opposite, sigh, I underestimated him. Old Fox didn't give me any opportunity to ask for any particular reward. This way he gets to improve his image while giving us something that won't cost him. He looked back up at Hiruzen and thought, Monkey Summon doesn't suit him. He should switch to the fox. The Chunins and Jounins were completely lost at what was happening. Genki was shocked again, he agreed to reward them. Rinjiro and the rest wondered, what is happening here exactly? 
Itachi, who was one of those four Anbu, thought, I didn't get any reward last year. But on thinking more he realized, is Lord Hokage rewarding so that he could reward Ichihamiko, and thaw the relations between the village and the Ichiha clan. While everyone was confused, Hiruzen looked at Inoichi. He noticed and said, since there are no more doubts, you are dismissed. Use this month to prepare properly for your fights. The Jounin sensei began taking over the genins. Rinjiro approached his students and said, follow me. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko followed him. The group went to their usual training ground. On reaching there, Rinjiro looked at Fujin and asked, so, what was that? Fujin asked back, that. Rinjiro squinted his eyes and said, the reward. Fujin tilted his head and replied, well, we were rewarded for ranking first in the academy. I assumed that the same would apply even this time. Lines immediately appeared on Rinjiro's head. He thought, I need to educate this brat. He ignored it for now and said, congrats on making it to the third round. Though it shouldn't be a surprise I suppose. We will now decide how to train for the next month. He looked at Miko and Hoka and said, I had a chat with your parents. They said that they want to train you themselves for the next month. They will be taking the entire month off to train you too. Miko and Hoka immediately got excited. Rinjiro smiled on seeing their reactions. He said, train hard you too. I would love to see my students as both finalists. You can leave. They both thanked him. Before leaving, Miko looked at Fujin and said, win your two matches and fight me. This time I will defeat you. Fujin grinned and said, don't worry. I'll win the whole tournament. She was annoyed at Fujin's confidence, but she grinned in response. Both Hoka and Miko left. Rinjiro looked at Fujin and asked, so, any plans for this month? Fujin shook his head. Rinjiro smiled and asked, prepared for a month of deadly training. Fujin grinned and replied, of course. Rinjiro asked, before we begin, do you have anything you want to try or any doubts? Fujin thought for a bit and said, I don't have any new ideas to try. I do have a question though. Are you aware of the training rooms on the second floor of the tower inside the forest of death? Rinjiro thought for a bit and replied, I have never used them. But I did hear about them. What about them? Fujin answered, they have a wind training room, earth training room, and training room for other natures too. I inspected those rooms and noticed that each room has a crystal, which has dense energy belonging to that nature. Can you tell me what those crystals are? Rinjiro was surprised at that question. He answered, those are elemental crystals. Known as fire crystal, wind crystal, and so on. They provide some help to increase our affinity to that nature. It's helpful if you meditate in such rooms. Unfortunately, they are very rare and costly. So it isn't that useful. Fujin thought, just increase the affinity. No, I definitely felt a minute increase in my chakra level. So why didn't he feel it? It's either that he isn't telling me the whole thing, or his rate of refining chakra was too slow, and he didn't feel anything. After all, it was only when the rate of using its energy increased many folds, that I could feel it. Fujin asked, how rare and how costly are they? Rinjiro chuckled and replied, only the Hokage and Major clans can buy them. That's how rare they are. As for price, every piece of crystal costs millions of Ryo. Fujin was shocked, millions. Rinjiro laughed lightly at his student's reaction. However, he soon heard him sighing and muttering. I was planning to ask Lord Hokage for a few thousand wind crystals as the reward. Rinjiro was flabbergasted on hearing that, a few thousand. He looked at Fujin and asked, do you think they grow on trees? Fujin looked back and purposefully gave a look, as if asking, they don't. Rinjiro's face was full of black lines again. Fujin asked Rinjiro, where and how are those elemental crystals produced? Rinjiro sighed and said, you seem to be fixated upon this. Alright, I'll explain everything about it. Elemental crystals are mined from crystal veins. Hundreds of years ago, these lands were full of such veins. Actually, the way the lands were named was based on which types of veins were most abundant in those areas. For instance, the land of fire was abundant in fire crystal veins. The elemental crystals provided huge help to ninjas. So they were mined extensively. Around a hundred years ago, all veins began drying up. From what I have heard, the drying of the veins caused conflicts to intensify during that period, as everyone began fighting for it. By the time the five great villages came into existence, all the veins had been used up and destroyed. 
However, even after they were destroyed, the land still kept having more ninjas with similar affinities. Lord Second did research regarding this, and concluded that the environment of Land of Fire is such that the ninjas here have a good affinity to fire manipulation. Same for the other four villages as well. As for the Crystal Veins, only one place still had some low-quality veins. That is the current Land of Iron. In order to prevent another war from happening for them, Lord First temporarily protected it. The Daimyo soon reached a deal, and the Land of Iron became a neutral country without any ninjas who could use those crystal veins. Instead, the Land of Iron will mine a limited amount and sell a certain amount of it to each village. So, all the elemental crystals today are received from the Land of Iron. And it is received in very low quantities. Most of those elemental crystals are distributed among the clans. The rest is kept by the Hokage and is used to train the Anbu. Additionally, because their quality and quantity are low, they are only used alongside proper Fuinjutsu seals, to be able to use 100% of those crystals. Fujin digested all this information. He analyzed, oh, guess it isn't as useful as I thought then. Without sufficient quantities, they won't be that useful. An elemental crystals will play a huge role in one arc in the future, or maybe more if I get more ideas. But it won't create a huge impact on the story. I do have some good ideas with this, but if I overdo it, it might not be Naruto anymore, lol. Fujin asked, does the effect of each crystal depend on our affinity? Rinjiro nodded, yes. It works best with your affinity. Did you check all five rooms? Fujin nodded. Rinjiro replied, good. The chakra paper used to test your affinity, only shows your strongest affinity, unless you have an elemental keke genkai. But trying to absorb energy from elemental crystals too can tell you your affinities. What was your absorption rate for other elements compared to wind? Fujin replied, it was around 35% for fire. Around 6% for earth. And zero for water and lightning. Rinjiro appeared disappointed on hearing that. He sighed, seems like you don't have much affinity for other elements. Fujin acted disappointed and asked, what should it have been for me to have their affinity? Rinjiro explained, if you have any element at 70% or above, then that can be considered as your secondary affinity. Your wind element affinity is quite strong. So most likely any element above 50% could have been considered a secondary affinity. As for tertiary affinity, it needs to be 30% or above. Your fire element qualifies for this. But I would recommend you to not waste your time on it. After all, it is extremely rare for a squad in Kanoha to not have someone with fire affinity. Fujin nodded. Rinjiro continued, even your earth manipulation. I would suggest you stop it after learning earth while jutsu. Focus entirely on your wind manipulation. Make it as strong and lethal as you can. Fujin replied, yes sensei. Rinjiro said, good. Now, let's get back to your training for the month. Fujin paid attention with some excitement. Training with Rinjiro proved to be extremely fruitful. Rinjiro chuckled and said, actually, I have nothing more to teach you. I have already taught you all the basics that I could. Rest would require hard work from you to improve further. Fujin gave his sensei a deadpan look. He asked, so what will be training for this month sensei? Rinjiro smirked, we will be doing live combat practice. Fujin felt a chill down his spine on looking at his sensei's smirk. Rinjiro continued, every time you spar a fight, you hide behind your clones. Well that is a good strategy, and I admire the fact that you have managed to pull it off so successfully, you have missed out on an essential fighting experience that you will need in the future. So, for this entire month, we will do live combat drills. You can use your clones, but I will still attack your main body. By the time this month ends, I will let you experience everything that you would have to face during missions. Fujin nervously said, alright sensei. As soon as he said it, Rinjiro attacked him with a punch. But Fujin, who was on alert due to Rinjiro's smirk, flickered away in the blink of an eye. Rinjiro smirked and flickered as well. The evening before the tournament Fujin laid in the training ground, breathing heavily. If anyone were to see him, they would wonder, how many people beat him up. He was bruised all over and had completely exhausted his chakra. Rinjiro walked over to him and said, ready for the tournament. Fujin looked at him while screaming internally, you know what? Fuck the child activists. Where the fuck are the human rights activists? In my previous life, if anyone leaked even a minute of my combat drills with this monster, the media would all create havoc for weeks. 
There might even be public protests against him. I didn't even get a break on my birthday. Bastard made me eat punches and kicks instead of cake. Unfortunately, Fujin had neither the energy nor the courage to talk back to Rinjiro. Rinjiro chuckled, lifted Fujin, and put him on his shoulder. He said, well, you can't fight in this state. Let's get you to the hospital to fix you up. Fujin didn't reply or struggle. In the last month, he was carried in this manner to the hospital eleven times. He had received all sorts of weird looks. Any sense of embarrassment was long dead and buried. On reaching the hospital, the medic Nin healed him as usual, and asked him to sleep in the hospital. While going to sleep Fujin thought, no wonder all adults in this village are so shameless. It seems that they all had their sense of shame beaten out of them. The next morning, Fujin woke up early. He ate a few ration bars and did some light exercises before heading to the stadium where the tournament would be held. When he neared the stadium, he could hear multiple announcements being made over the loudspeaker. There were a lot of stalls outside the stadium. The area was very crowded. Fujin thought, it's almost like a fair. This world barely has any good means of entertainment. So I suppose the Chunin exams are the biggest entertainment for normal people. No wonder it's so crowded and noisy. On entering the stadium, a guard informed him where the participants had to gather. Fujin went there and saw that all the remaining genins were already there. He walked towards Miko and Hoka, hey. Both greeted him while smirking. Hoka asked, so, how was your training? Fujin sighed and was about to answer, but Miko spoke first, no need to tell. We already know. Everyone was talking about a certain someone being carried to the hospital daily. Both Hoka and Miko began laughing. Fujin gave them a deadpan look. He muttered lightly but loud enough for them both to hear, at least I was defeated by a Jounin instead of a fellow Jounin teammate. This interrupted their laugh. Hoka replied, last time you caught me by surprise. That will never happen again. Miko snorted and said, HMPH, I was injured by Hoka, and you took advantage. This time you will have to fight more opponents first. I'll send you back to the hospital on Sensei's shoulder. Fujin smirked and was about to reply when Inoichi called them and asked them to assemble at the center of the ground. Announcements were made to introduce all nine genins to the audience. While the announcements were made, Fujin noticed where Hiruzen was sitting. There were a few Anbu around him. But there wasn't any other cage. Fujin analyzed, hmm, no genin from Suna qualified. So no wonder their cage didn't show up. And while Kiri genins did qualify, they don't represent the fourth Mizukage. I thought May might come, but it looks like either she's busy, or Hiruzen refused to host her publicly before she wins. Next, he checked out the important officials who were sitting with a few daimyos. He didn't notice anyone interesting there. Lastly, he looked at a spot where a lot of familiar faces were. He noticed Ibiki, Genma, and Raido sitting next to each other, with some papers in front of them, and wondered, are they the judges for the tournament? He recalled his discussion with Rinjiro earlier. A week ago, in the training ground, Fujin was resting having just fought Rinjiro. Rinjiro was sitting nearby as well. Fujin asked, who decides the Chunin promotion sensei? Will it be just the proctor for the third round, or do others also have a say? Rinjiro answered, there will be a panel of judges who will evaluate your performances during the tournament. Their decision is the most critical for getting promoted. The proctors of the three phases will also submit reports of their evaluation. Promotions will be based on these evaluations. Their evaluations are sent to the Chunin exam supervisor, who makes the decision and sends it to the Hokage for approval. Fujin asked, Chunin exam supervisor? Who is that? Rinjiro nodded, he is the one who makes decisions regarding the Chunin exams. The current Chunin exam supervisor is a retired elite Jounin. He is a few years older than the Sanans. Fujin thought and said, okay. But don't the Jounin instructors or anyone else get a say? Rinjiro answered, the Jounin instructors can make recommendations. But it is very rare as the Jenins are their own students, and it could be seen as favoritism. As for others, there are a few who can make recommendations, such as the Jounin commander, Anbu commander, village elders, and clan heads. But again, it's very rare. They get more involved during the Jounin promotions. Fujin nodded, that makes sense. But Sensei, you said that we have thousands of Chunins. But don't only a few Genins get promoted every year? While asking Fujin wondered, it makes no sense for Chunin exams to be the only form of promotion. I wonder what other ways are to be promoted. 
Rinjiro looked deeply at Fujin before answering, as the Hokage said, the Chunin exams are more about showing your skills, talent, and potential to the daimyos and other important people. Promoting the genins isn't the main focus. If you observed, you would have noticed that all Konoha genins participating were 15 years or younger. Fujin thought for a bit and said, yeah, I don't remember seeing any older genin from our village. Rinjiro continued, genins above the age of 15 are promoted when they are deemed capable enough to be promoted without any exam. So there are around a hundred genins promoted every year. Even more during the war. But, genins who get promoted outside the Chunin exams, have a harder time becoming Jounin. Very few manage to become Jounin. Fujin digested the information and nodded while wondering, wasn't Kabuto much older during the Chunin exams? Did Konoha relax the restrictions later? His thoughts were interrupted by Rinjiro who said, enough rest, let's continue. Fujin got up and prepared himself for another round of beating. Back to the present, Fujin noticed that Rinjiro, Genki, and a few dozen more Jounins and Chunins were sitting behind the judges. Miko and Hoka looked for their parents in the crowd. Apparently, some of their classmates also came to watch the tournament. None of the Jenins were paying much attention to the announcements. However, one announcement suddenly attracted their attention. The announcer said, to make this tournament more exciting, the odds are, Ichihamiko 1.2 Satsuma Rentaro 1.4 Hayuga Hoka 1.5 Sakai Yumi 1.8 Yukishin 1.8 Suzuki Fujin 4, Matsushita Satoru 5 Shirosora, 5 Kido Kahaku 9 Those who are still left to place your bets, you can do so within the next 15 minutes before the matches begin. Fujin was surprised, seriously. Gambling so openly. And Gato Company. His eyes wandered towards Hirazan, and the place where the daimyos were sitting, how much of a cut do these guys get for letting someone like Gato do this? He analyzed the odds, Miko and Hoka come from strong clans. So this ain't a surprise. As for Kiri, it looks like they want to advertise their strength. Rentro and Yuki Shin I can understand, but why are the odds for Yumi so high? Anyways, I have around 800,000 Ryo with me. Should I bet all on myself? I'm confident that I am the strongest, but my fights are the toughest too. I'll have to face Yuki and Rentaro who would be fresh. Then Miko, who would only have had one easy fight. For the last, I thought it'd be Hoka, but looks like he may have one tough fight against Yumi. While Fujin was analyzing, Miko couldn't hide her smirk due to having the highest odds. The other genins looked at her and realized that she would be the strongest opponent. Inoichi said, all announcements are over. Go wait in the waiting room. Fujin, Shin, your matches will begin in 15 minutes. The Jenins begin walking towards the waiting room. Fujin after thinking for a bit concluded, while well, 800,000 Ryo is a decent amount of money, it is nowhere enough for me to buy some of the stuff that I want. So better to just gamble. I'll gamble 600,000 Ryo. 200,000 Ryo is sufficient for my normal needs. And even if I lose, earning that 600,000 back shouldn't be a big deal. That said, the gambling is held by Gato. So he should be very rich. Killing him won't be a good decision, but I should plunder him in the future. Since he operates illegally, I might get some good stuff from him. Not to mention a lot of Ryo as well. After deciding, he said softly, I'll meet you guys in the waiting room. He flickered. The Genins wondered where he went. Fujin flickered in the place where the bets were being taken. Surprisingly, the crowd here was very low, so few people. Wait, the announcements implied that many already placed their bets. So only the ones who didn't know yet are placing their bets now. Fujin withdrew 600,000 Ryo from his scroll and went ahead. The bookie was surprised at seeing a participant here. He greeted Fujin, hello Fujin-kun. How may I help you? Fujin replied, I want to place bets. He put 600,000 Ryo in front of him and said, 600,000 Ryo on myself. The bookie sneered internally on hearing that Fujin wanted to bet on himself, this orphan civilian ninja wants to bet on himself. The only reason why his odds weren't the lowest is that he broke the record in the second round, thanks to his two teammates. However, he was shocked when he saw 600,000 Ryo being placed in front of him. He thought, are the genins so rich in Konoha? He immediately took the cash and handed Fujin six silver tickets with his name on them. Every silver ticket denoted a hundred thousand Ryo. Fujin checked it and left. After he left, that bookie began laughing, he just donated six hundred thousand Ryo to us. 
Ha ha Fujin entered and waited in the waiting room. This room gave the best view of the ground below. It will help the Genins observe others properly. After a few minutes, an announcement was made calling Fujin and Shin down. Hoka and Miko said, good luck to Fujin, while the Kiri Genins wished Shin good luck. Fujin and Shin jumped down to the ground and walked towards Inoichi. Inoichi asked them both to take positions. Fujin and Shin stood face to face five meters apart. Fujin thought, ice release. This will be a tough fight. Shin thought, this guy is very fast. And his sword is very strong. I shouldn't give him a chance to use his sword at all. Inoichi announced loudly, now the first fight starts. Begin. As soon as he said it, Shin grabbed his shurikens. However, even before he could throw them, a wind explosion jutsu was coming at him. He immediately ran backwards and to the right, dodging the explosion. Fujin noticed him moving and thought, too slow. He flickered to where Shin was dodging and threw two wind explosion spheres at him. Shin was moving towards the wind explosion spheres when he noticed them. He tried dodging again, but the spheres exploded. He avoided most of the winds, but a few still hit him. A few cuts appeared on his left hand and leg. The crowd didn't expect the fight to be so intense from the start. They began cheering loudly. Fujin was planning to keep his attack going, when he noticed that Shin made a few hand signs and his chakra suddenly spiked, hmm, which jutsu? Oh well, let's test him out. Fujin created a big wind explosion jutsu and threw it at him. If Shin was using a jutsu that needed some time to launch, this could defeat him. However, huge eye spikes immediately began appearing around him. Some were big enough to be called spears. Shin yelled, ice hell immediately, all ice spikes got launched at a very fast speed. Some pierced through the wind explosion sphere, dispersing it. Shin smirked when he saw the shock on Fujin's face. At the next moment, four spikes hit Fujin. Shin was about to celebrate when Fujin dispersed into the winds. He was shocked, wind clone. When? The reason Fujin made a giant wind explosion sphere was so that he could hide behind it. When Shin couldn't see him, he created a wind clone and escaped underground. Before Shin could figure out when Fujin created a wind clone, he felt something under him. He immediately jumped backwards. Just after he jumped, Fujin's hands popped out of the ground trying to catch his legs. Fujin came out of the ground as Shin landed at some distance. Fujin smiled and said, that was a strong jutsu. I am impressed. Shin was breathing heavily. This was a rank B jutsu from his clan. It used more than half of his chakra. When Fujin exited the ground, Miko and Hoka suddenly snorted. Yumi became worried. The crowd was shocked at this jutsu. Most hadn't ever seen any ice jutsu. The ice spikes were embedded into the stadium walls. The civilians, and even some ninjas, breathed in relief that the spikes weren't aimed higher. Hiruzen wondered, should I arrange for barriers? Genins aren't supposed to use beer rank jutsus. Fujin didn't allow Shin to catch his breath, and once again began attacking with wind explosion jutsus from a close distance. Shin dodged desperately while using water wall jutsu to defend himself, and attempting to create some distance from Fujin. Such an exchange went on for the next four to five minutes. Shin had even more wounds and was breathing even more heavily. Finally, he managed to get away from Fujin. He made a few quick hand signs. Fujin too created a few hand signs. Two wind wolves appeared next to him and charged at Shin. Fujin waited to see what jutsu Shin was about to use. Ice dragon jutsu soon, an ice dragon started forming in front of Shin. It began to move towards the wind wolves and Fujin. Fujin thought, ice dragon. Looks cool. But he looks to be devoid of chakra. Fujin controlled the wolves to move away from the dragon and then attack Shin from opposite directions. Shin ignored them and kept his focus on Fujin. Suddenly, ice dragon speed increased and it rushed towards Fujin. At the same time, Shin dropped to his knees as he was very exhausted. Fujin made a hand sign, spinning shield of wind as the ice dragon reached Fujin, it opened its jaws, showing its massive fangs. It looked as if it wanted to bite him to death. However, a circular shield, having a radius of 3 meters and a thickness of half a meter, formed in front of Fujin. It was formed of wind and spinning at a high speed. The ice dragon clashed with the shield and was stopped. It kept pushing against the wind shield. At the same time, the two wind wolves were running towards Shin. Shin thought, just a little bit more, and I'll break his shield. The ice dragon pushed halfway into the shield. 
The wolves were still around 20 meters from him. The crowds were tense. Shiro Sora said excitedly in the waiting room, Shin will win. The other Kiri Jennings, except Yumi, were happy as well. Hoka and Miko, on the other hand, were just annoyed. Yumi said, no, he has lost. This shocked the four Kiri Jennings, who didn't understand what she meant. They looked at Shin and Fujin. When the wolves were around 10 meters from Shin, the ice dragon broke the wind shield. Shim smiled. The ice dragon hit Fujin, scoring a direct hit. He was frozen solid. Shin was surprised that Kanoha's proctor didn't save him. At that instant, Inoichi appeared in front of Shin and dispersed the two wind wolves who were about to bite him to death. Inoichi looked at Shin and announced, winner of this round Suzuki Fujin. He will advance to the next round. Shin was shocked. So was the crowd. They thought, didn't he win? Shin immediately protested, why? Wasn't he hit first? You should have helped him instead of me. Inoichi sighed at his ignorance. He pointed with his thumb where the ice dragon had exploded. Shin followed. He quickly turned his head left and saw Fujin standing some distance away, waving his hand. He was dumbfounded, but how? I saw you get frozen. Fujin just smiled and left without replying. Almost everyone in the audience was confused. Even among the ninjas, a few were clueless. The Kiri Jennings didn't understand what was happening either. They looked towards Yumi. She explained, when he was underground, he made a shadow clone. The Kiri Jennings were stunned. She continued, the remaining fight was fought by his shadow clone. He stayed hidden underground. The clone was dispelled after it got frozen in ice. And his main body exited the ground when you guys were distracted by Inoichi. The Kiri Jennings were left tongue-tied. After some time, Satoru managed to exclaim, so Shin lost to a mere clone. Yumi looked at Rentaro and said, don't underestimate him. He might not have any Keke Genkai, but his chakra is larger than yours. He didn't even lose 10% of his chakra in this fight. And he is tactically sound as well. Be on your guard. Rentaro nodded with a grim expression. The experienced ninjas who were watching this fight were very impressed. Soom, who was sitting in the stadium with her kids, thought, very good. Even someone like me didn't notice that he was just a clone. Kiba kept bugging her by asking how Fujin won, so she explained it to him. Hana also listened attentively. The judges also analyzed the fight. Ibiki said, impressive. He relied majorly on a rank D jutsu to force his opponent into using two rank B jutsus and exhaust his chakra. Genma nodded and said, yes, and his speed and precision are also very good. His opponent was forced into desperation multiple times. Raido added, while his strategy was good, the fact that he can perform the shadow clone jutsu is also impressive. Ibiki replied, yes, and he is also very good at using it. His shadow clone can be very useful for information gathering and missions. Also, he can use jutsus of two elements. Raido smiled and said, and he could perform the wind explosion jutsu without any hand seals. Genma said, I think he is ready to be promoted to Chunin. He is strong and good at tactics. All that remains to be seen is how he leads. Raido said, what are your thoughts about his opponent? Though he lost, his ice hell jutsu was very strong. If used in the middle of a battlefield, it will cause a lot of damage. Ibiki had a different opinion. He said, no, he didn't show much control over it and used it in every direction. So it will hit both enemies and allies. Genma said, hard to say. His teammates can take cover in advance. That said, despite his jutsu being strong, he wasted it along with his chakra. I don't think he is ready to be promoted. They kept discussing the fight and the pros and cons of both the genins. Hiruzen was also impressed with how easily Fujin won, good win. He is a promising seedling. However he suddenly had another thought, if he wins this tournament, will he ask me for another reward? I still owe him two rewards. He sighed and thought, I should have made Hamura pay for the rewards for making the suggestion. Fujin walked up the stairs, as many looked at him in awe and confusion. Fujin thought, well, that went well. He pretty much lost it by exhausting his chakra by using two rank B jutsus. My clone could have easily dodged the ice dragon too. But seeing how exhausted he was, there was no need to. After all, that blue-eyed girl should have noticed me. So if I won with even my clone still fine, then my opponent would be extremely careful. After entering the waiting room, Fujin sat next to Hoka and Miko. Yumi and Sora were soon called and they went down. 
Inoichi soon announced, the second battle starts now. Begin. Sar immediately ran behind, while Yumi started with water shuriken jutsu. He created a water wall to block her jutsu while retreating into the woods thinking, I can't fight her in open fields. She is too dangerous. Yumi followed him into the woods. They began fighting in the woods. Sora used the trees as a shield and cover to attack her, but Yumi managed to defend and counterattack every time. They maintained this deadlock for around 10 minutes. Fujin wondered, while he does fight well in the woods, he has no advantage. So why was he so quick in entering the woods? After 10 minutes, Yumi finally managed to land a lethal hit. Her water bullet left a deep cut on Sora's thigh. The wound made it harder for him to move. Yumi looked at him and said, you are wounded, you can't fight anymore. Sora gritted his teeth. Yumi glared at him and said, give up, or it will be very painful for you. Color drained off his face on hearing that. He gave up. Inoichi announced, second match winner is Sakai Yumi. Bujin observed the fight carefully and thought, why was he so afraid? He looked at Hoka and concluded, I wonder how her fight with Hoka will go. Hoka got up. Fujin said, good luck Hoka. Win quickly. Miko also wished him luck. Before Satoru left, Kahaku reminded him once again to not get close to the Hayuga. While the next candidates were arriving on the ground, the judges discussed again. Ibiki commented, both were good. However, Sora seemed to be afraid of her. Raido agreed, yes. And he seemed too impatient to run into the woods. As if he didn't want to fight her in the open at all. Genma didn't comment and just made some notes. Hoka and Satoru arrived on the ground. Inoichi announced, the third match starts now. Begin. Satoru immediately moved backwards while making hand signs. Hoka followed and made a few hand signs too. Water Shuriken Jutsu Stone Shuriken Jutsu both launched their jutsu simultaneously. Fujin and Miko were surprised, Hoka started with ninjutsu. Really? Some water and stone shurikens clashed. The stone shurikens went through the water shurikens dispersing them, but their momentum decreased. Hoka and Satoru dodged the remaining shurikens. Hoka immediately began closing distance, while Satoru once again moved back while making hand signs. Hoka sighed and made a hand sign too. Miko commented, it looks like a game of tag. Fujin chuckled. Water jet jutsu rock shield jutsu the water jet hit the rock shield, but it couldn't damage it. Water just bounced back from the rock. Satoru frowned. He made a few more hand signs, water clone jutsu three water clones appeared, and they began running towards the rock shield. Satoru wondered, why is he hiding behind the rock instead of jazzing me? At that instant, he suddenly felt a pain in his left foot, he immediately jumped and looked down. Multiple rock thorns had appeared under him, almost looking like a bed. Two of those thorns hit his foot, one of them making him bleed. Suddenly, the rock thorns launched themselves into the air at him. He panicked and immediately made hand signs to create a water wall below him. But a few rock thorns hit him before the water wall was formed. Even after it was formed, a few still made it through and hit him. He slowly fell down out of the way of the rock thorns. On landing, he winced. Eight rock thorns had stabbed him. None were lethal, but they hurt a lot. His water clones were confused about what to do. However, they decided to attack Hoka. However, on reaching, they noticed that Hoka wasn't behind the rock. As soon as Satoru landed, two hands popped out of the ground and grabbed his legs. Headhunter Jutsu immediately, he was buried underground, while Hoka appeared above the ground. Satoru yelled very loudly. As he was being pulled underground, the thorns on him hit the ground. Three of those horns couldn't go underground with him, which resulted in huge cuts before they were pushed out of his body. The pain made him lose control over his water clones, and they turned into water. Hoka was about to place two fingers in front of Satoru's forehead and ask him to quit. However, the yell filled with agony made him stop. The Noichi immediately appeared and helped Satoru out of the ground. He had three six-inch long cuts. One on his chest, one near his abdomen, and one on his back. And there were still five more rock thorns embedded in him. Medics quickly rushed to the ground and took him away. Inoichi announced, third match winner is Hayuga Hoka. The crowd, which was shocked by Satoru's yells, began cheering once again. Yumi and Kahaku watched with grim faces. They looked at Hoka and thought, he used the rock shield jutsu to block Satoru's line of sight and went underground. From there, he used two jutsus to sneak attack, and then dealt the final blow. 
During the second phase, he barely used any ninjutsu. We underestimated him. Fujin analyzed, damn, never expected him to win with ninjutsu. Stone shuriken jutsu, rock shield jutsu, rock thorn bed jutsu, rock thorn launch jutsu and headhunter jutsu. Winning against him might not be that easy anymore. That said, his speed of using jutsu isn't as fast as minor Miko's. He just used the fact that the opponent was distracted by having to maintain a distance from him. The judges also analyzed. Ibiki said, very good performance. He won very quickly without wasting much chakra. Genma chuckled, how long has it been since we saw Hayuga fighting without using gentle fist? Raido said, he seems ready to be promoted to Chunin. As for Satoru, he isn't ready. Both Ibiki and Genma nodded. Hoka's parents were proud of their son for winning so quickly. His father said, finally I managed to get him to use ninjutsu. Hoka's mother nodded. She knew how difficult it was for him. Miko stood up. Fujin looked at her and said, good luck. She nodded and went to the ground. Kahaku followed her while muttering to herself, don't look into her eyes, they both reached the center of the ground and faced each other. However, Kahaku never once looked at Miko's face. Inoichi announced, the fourth match starts now. Begin. Miko immediately activated her Sharingan and threw a few shurikens. However, at the same time, Kahaku threw a kunai with an explosion tag. Both Miko and Kahaku moved backwards rapidly. Miko frowned. She immediately ran around the smoke and ran towards her opponent. Having created distance, Kahaku immediately made a few hand signs. They didn't miss Jutsu as Miko moved forward, she noticed the mist thickening. She immediately made a few hand signs. Fireball Jutsu A fireball headed towards Kahaku, but she used water wall Jutsu to block it. The fire ended up evaporating a lot of the water, making the mist even denser. Soon, Kahaku disappeared from her sight. Miko frowned again. Her Sharingan couldn't see through the mist at all. She moved away from the area where the mist was the thickest while thinking, TCH, I could really use a combination attack here. The mist covered half of the ground, including the woods, while Miko stayed away and thought about her next move. The judges were impressed by this move. Genma remarked, impressive. She made all preparations needed to deal with the Sharingan. Miko will have a tough time fighting in the mist. The mist continued expanding. Miko took out a scroll from her waist bag. She opened it and made a hand sign. Dozens of kunai with exploding tags attached began appearing from the scroll. She grabbed each and threw them all in the area where the mist was. Over a hundred exploding tags exploded inside the mist, leaving everyone dumbfounded. The two Miss Jounin were shocked, so wasteful give us those if you are wasting a hundred on merely a Chunin exam. Fujin was stunned, did she just use up over 75,000 Ryo? Spoiled brat. Miko's parents got weird looks as well, but they ignored it. The explosions dispersed the mist. While it did create another smoke screen, Miko's Sharingan could see in it. Kido Kahaku couldn't see Miko throwing the explosion tags. She was dumbfounded when one explosion after another began happening inside the mist. Two tags exploded close to her. One of them caused a few burns to her left forearm, as she wasn't fast enough to get away. The explosions also left her ears ringing. Miko immediately moved through the smoke towards her opponent. Kahaku still hadn't recovered from the shock or the pain. On reaching her, she quickly made a few hand signs, and used fireball jutsu from around 20 meters in front of her. Kahaku couldn't see or hear Miko, but she felt something coming at her. She immediately made a few hand signs. While making the hand signs, she finally saw the fireball moving rapidly towards her. As soon as the water wall began forming, she moved backwards. The firewall hit the water wall and exploded. The thin film of water wasn't enough to block the explosion. While moving backwards she heard something and looked to her right. A few shurikens were flying at her. After using fireball jutsu, Miko flickered to Kahaku's right side. The only way to dodge the shurikens was to jump, and Kahaku jumped intending to get on the branch of the tree behind her. Due to her jump, she barely managed to dodge the shuriken. However, she saw Miko suddenly clenching her fist and pulling it back. Her eyes widened. Some of the shurikens were tied to metal wire. When Miko pulled her hand back, those shurikens were pulled back. Two wires wrapped around Kahaku's left leg, stopping her jump and making her fall down suddenly. Kahaku was about to fall on her face. She raised her hands in front of her by reflex, to soften the impact of the fall. 
However, at the last moment, Miko pulled the wire towards herself. Due to this, Kahaku fell on both her hands and face, and was dragged for a meter on the ground. It took her a couple of seconds to get up. Unfortunately, that was enough time for Miko to step on her back and hold a kunai against her throat. She said, you have lost. Give up. Kahaku unwillingly said, I surrender. Inoichi announced, the fourth match winner is Ichiha Miko. The spectators cheered loudly. Miko smirked and left. The Kiri Jounins frowned. They had lost all three fights against Kanoha Jenins. The only winner they had from Kiri was Yumi, who fought against another Kiri Jenin. One of the Jounin assured the other, don't worry. Rentro and Yumi should win the next matches. Then the Ichiha girl will have to fight them both to win the tournament. The other Jounin nodded. Ibiki sighed, I thought we would get to see the hidden mist assassination technique today. Genma chuckled, at least she won. Raido nodded, all of Rinjiro's students are strong. The Chunin exam just seems to be a formality for them. Genma noted, that Kiri Kanoichi is good too. She came up with a good tactic to implement against the Sharingan. Ibiki rebuked him, unfortunately, she had no response to her counter. While the counter was overwhelming, such incidents often happen during missions. If she gets overwhelmed, then both she and her team will be dead. Neither Raido nor Genma countered him. In the waiting room, Hoka said, she is as overbearing as usual. Fujin nodded, the ground is a mess. Should be helpful for your Rithjutsus though. Hoka grinned and nodded. Rentaro looked at Fujin and got up. Fujin too stood up. Hoka seriously said, be careful, he looks strong. Fujin smirked and replied, don't worry, I'll win just as always. While Fujin said it softly, it was loud enough to be heard by everyone in the waiting room. Rentaro immediately lost his cool. He yelled, bastard, I'll beat you up. Fujin just smirked and ignored him thinking, kids, so easy to rile up. He jumped down to the ground. Rentaro followed him. Seeing them heading to the ground, Genma commented, this should be interesting. Among the nine genins, their chakra reserves are the highest. Raido nodded, after hearing Tsum's praises for him, I wonder how strong he is. After taking their positions, Inoichi announced, the last quarterfinal starts now, begin. Immediately, Fujin threw a wind explosion jutsu at Rentaro. Rentaro muttered, so predictable. He threw a kunai with an explosion tag attached. Both Rentaro and Fujin retreated. The explosion tag exploded, dispersing the wind explosion jutsu. While retreating, Rentaro released a massive amount of chakra. He made a few hand signs, water dragon jutsu he expected Fujin to attack, but there was no attack. He wondered, what is he doing? The water dragon formed while the smokescreen by the explosion dispersed. However, Rentaro could no longer see Fujin. He got worried, did this bastard escape into the ground? He immediately looked in the waiting room at Yumi. As soon as Yumi noticed him looking at her, she looked at the woods. Rentaro followed her eyes and looked at the woods. He noticed Fujin standing casually on one of the branches. Before the match began, Rentaro had requested Yumi to communicate to him where Fujin was if he hid underground or created a lot of clones. Yumi had agreed. Rentaro scowled, when did this bastard run over there? It's fucking 100 meters away. I thought I was the one who needed to keep my distance from his sword. So why is he the one creating distance instead? As soon as Fujin sensed Rentaro building up his chakra, Fujin flickered into the woods behind him. He looked at the water dragon, ho, 10 meters long water dragon. Pretty impressive size for a water dragon jutsu. Looks like he poured 5% of his chakra into it. I kinda hoped he put more due to being riled up. Rentaro controlled the water dragon to fly towards Fujin. Its eyes began shrinking due to having to move such a long distance. Fujin raised his right hand and began making a giant wind explosion sphere. He smirked, oh well, time to rile him even more. Hopefully, he'll use an even bigger jutsu. He threw the giant wind explosion sphere at the water dragon's mouth. It exploded on impact, and the winds generated were enough to neutralize the jutsu. Ibiki smiled on seeing this, impressive. Neutralizing a rank B jutsu with a rank D jutsu, while disturbing his opponent's mental state. As Ibiki said, Rentaro looked very annoyed. Immediately, a massive chakra could be sensed from him by even ordinary people. Hoka and Miko activated their Dejutsus to watch Rentaro. Fujin, smirked, he. Just as I thought. However, unlike what Fujin and most others thought, Rentaro hadn't lost his reasoning. 
He analyzed, I practiced the whole month on how to engage you from a distance. Since you have voluntarily created distance, I don't have to worry about your sword. Rentaro made a few hand signs. Water release, raging river flood jutsu. A massive amount of water appeared in front of him, rising to 20 meters in the air. All the Kanoha ninjas were shocked. Genma commented, that's a rank A jutsus. Is he just a genin? Fujin was surprised as well. He wondered, who exactly is this guy? Did Kissim have a son? The water moved towards Fujin at a rapid speed. Anyone who saw it would feel like a tsunami is approaching. The wave was around 15 meters in height, and it was wide enough to cover all the trees inside the arena. Four kunai appeared in Fujin's hands. At the same time, he began building up chakra. He threw the four kunai at equal distances from each other. They hit the wave five meters from the ground and exploded. The explosions broke the momentum of the wave. But it still kept approaching Fujin. Fujin made a hand sign while pretending that he needed to make a hand sign. Wind release, great breakthrough jutsu Fujin supercharged his jutsu with 3% of his maximum chakra. It created massive and incredibly strong winds. They halted the wave and even reversed its flow to an extent. The winds also carried some water into the stands, providing most of the audience with a free cold water bath. Some of the audience got very annoyed and began yelling. While the rest were yelling in excitement about seeing such huge jutsus. Most of the chunins and jounins from Kanoha were left tongue-tied at how such a massive jutsu was used and how easily it was defended against. Rinjiro smiled on seeing Fujin's performance. Rentaro, who was moving through the water intending to catch Fujin by surprise suddenly stopped. He was shocked, I expected that the jutsu wouldn't harm him, but I never even considered that he would put a stop to it. The water didn't make it into those trees at all. Rentaro stayed in the water until the winds died down. He was frowning and calculating how to attack further. He had used up over a third of his chakra, but didn't manage to even touch his opponent. While thinking, he was on high alert in case Fujin tried any sneak attack. Fujin noticed Rentaro moving ahead through the water. His chakra was very easy to notice. He focused on his location thinking, attacking him with all the water around him will be difficult. But his momentum has been destroyed. Should I attack and build my momentum? Or should I just waste time and wait for his chakra to run out? Fujin thought while he waited for his attack to die down. Perhaps, if it was before he spent the month doing combat drills with Rinjiro, Fujin would have chosen the latter without giving it much thought. However, Rinjiro had successfully managed to change the way Fujin thought and fought over the month. He couldn't change his careful nature, but Fujin now had learned many ways to attack while still ensuring safety. More importantly, his confidence was built by fighting against an elite Jounin for a month. Fujin made a hand sign and began supercharging his jutsu. As soon as the winds began dying down, Fujin flickered. He appeared 10 meters above Rentaro. Water in this area was up to 4 meters above the ground level. Rentaro was in the center of it. Rinjiro smiled when he saw Fujin pressing on his attack. As soon as Fujin flickered over his head, Rentaro noticed. He also saw the hand sign Fujin had made. He yelled, crap Fujin instantly breathed out an even stronger great breakthrough jutsu. Rentaro waved his arms. The water around him gathered on top of him acting as a shield. His thoughts ran as quickly as lightning, I can't dodge this. If I leave the protection of water, I'll be taking the full force of this attack. The winds easily broke into the water. The majority of the water began flying away. Inoichi, who was observing, suddenly got alert. He yelled, Fujin, hold back. He made hand signs while moving ahead. However, he was too slow. The supercharged Great Breakthrough Jutsu hit Rentaro head-on. He quickly made a hand sign just before the Jutsu hit him. The crowd watched in horror as Rentaro was split into many small pieces. Many yelled in terror. Some vomited, while a few even lost consciousness. Fujin's eyes widened as well. Due to using such a powerful Jutsu, Fujin flew backwards, in the air, for a few minutes. From this view, he got a perfect view of what was happening. He saw as the wind cut Rentaro into pieces with ease. Fujin's eyes widened before sensing something was wrong, there's no blood. And the winds cut through him a bit too easily. As if there was no solid obstruction at all. Was it a water clone? But when did he make one? The judges and many ninjas were shocked as well. Fujin flickering and using such a strong jutsu so quickly wasn't something a genin should be able to do. 
In fact, even among Chunins, only a few could replicate this. As everyone was thinking, Rentaro's body pieces dissolved into water. Fujin was continuously sensing chakra as he was thinking. He suddenly realized, the chakra was distributed among his body pieces. And now all that chakra is in the water that he dissolved into. What jutsu is this? Fujin created some distance as he was thinking. The crowd calmed down on seeing the body waters transform into water. Suddenly, the water began gathering together, and Rentaro's body began forming. Fujin squinted his eyes and threw an explosion tag attached to a kunai right at the center. He and many ninjas realized, hydrification technique of the Hazuki clan. The Kiri Jounins breathed in relief on seeing Rentaro use this jutsu in the nick of time. Fujin wondered, isn't this the Keke Genkai of the Hazuki clan? How did he get it? Was someone from his family from the Hazuki clan or is he using a fake family name? Genma noted, first an ice Keke Genkai. Now the hydrification secret jutsu. The Kiri Genins are strong. Raido agreed and pointed out, yes, but Fujin is very strong too. He forced him into using it. Ibiki observed Rentaro putting his body together and stated, he isn't proficient with this jutsu. The body is reforming too slowly. The Kiri Genins got excited about seeing Rentaro use this jutsu. Sora said excitedly, in this form Rentaro is invincible. That Kanoha Genin will lose badly. Miko and Hoka also observed this carefully. Especially Miko who might have to fight him if Fujin loses. As Rentaro's body was reforming, the explosion tag reached it and exploded, dispersing the water again. However, soon it began reforming once again. Fujin grabbed another kunai with an explosion tag and wondered, isn't his speed too slow? If I recall correctly, Sajetsu was able to liquefy some parts of his body and not be helpless, unless a lightning jutsu was used. He threw the kunai, and it dispersed once again. The process was repeated three more times. The ninjas, who knew about the hydrification technique and were excited to see it in action, were dumbfounded. Especially the Kiri Jounins and Jenins. They saw one of their strongest secret jutsu be dismantled by cheap explosion tags. Of course, if Rentaro was stronger or had better control over this secret technique, then the hydrification technique wouldn't be neutralized so easily. However, this fact didn't reduce their humiliation. Miko looked at Sora and asked, is this what you call invincible in your village? Sora's face went red with shame. He wanted to rebuke, but no words left his mouth. Fujin threw the seventh explosion tag. At that time, Rentaro's Jounin Sensei jumped into the arena. Fujin noticed his chakra and immediately flickered into the woods. The Kiri Jounin appeared in front of Rentaro and deflected the kunai. He said, we give up this fight. The ninjas looked at the arena with disappointment. Inoichi announced the result of the match. Ibiki sighed, first hidden mist assassination technique and now hydrification technique. Both were dismantled through explosion tags. What a disappointment. Raido nodded and said, yes. We need to ban the use of explosion tags. Especially in the finals. Genma agreed, while it's true that they are one of the ninja's important tools, this is just disappointing. Fujin and Miko would never think that their fights would result in explosion tags getting banned from the final tournament. Rentro's body finally managed to reform without any further disturbance. As soon as it reformed, he fell unconscious. His sensei immediately grabbed him, preventing the fall. Soon, his clothes were dyed red with his blood. The medical ninja quickly moved and treated him. Fujin saw and wondered, can someone using hydrification techniques can still be harmed with explosion tags? Or is it just because he is a noob at this technique? The Kiri Jounin inside looking at his student, the hydrification technique puts a huge strain on his chakra. Despite his huge chakra, he can only maintain it for a short while. If this had continued, he might have died due to chakra exhaustion. The medics healed Rentaro in the arena, before carrying him away. The wounds on him weren't an issue as they healed easily. The main issue was chakra exhaustion. Fujin left the arena thinking, well, this was anticlimactic. He trapped himself by using a jutsu he couldn't use properly. I was expecting a close fight. Fujin's sentiment was shared by all the Jounins and most Chunins in the seating area. The end to the fight was just too anticlimactic. Genma looked at Fujin and commented, he is getting promoted to Chunin. Ibiki and Raido nodded. Though his opponent gave him a couple of openings, Fujin grabbed them both and took full advantage of them. His performance was very good. 
While Fujin was walking up the stairs, two shady-looking men in black suits blocked his path. Fujin looked at them. One of the men said in a deep voice, you have to lose the next match to Ichihamiko. Fujin's eyes twitched. He asked, I do. Why? At the same time, he wondered, do these jokers threaten Jenin's every tournament? He replied, our boss has made huge bets on the Ichiha kid. If you win, he will lose all his money. So you have to give up the fight, or we will make you regret it. Fujin ignored the threat and asked, how much money did your boss bet? The two men were shocked by the question. They had done this a few times, but for the first time, they were asked such a question. The second man asked, why do you want to know? Fujin gave him a deadpan look and said, you two don't even know what your boss has bet, and still came here to threaten me. Hearing Fujin's tone angered them. But they controlled it as Fujin seemed reasonable. The first man replied, he bet 20 million Ryo on the Ichiha girl. Fujin thought for a moment and said, I see. He looked at them and said, give me 4 million Ryo, and I'll give up the fight. This left them both tongue-tied. Both cursed him. The second man said, asshole. You think a brat like you can take money from us? Fujin replied in a neutral voice, if I win, your boss would lose 20 million Ryo. I'm not even asking for half. Do you think your boss will let you go if I win? This pushed them over the line. Both immediately grabbed their kunai and threatened Fujin. If you don't agree, then we will make you incapable of fighting in the tournament. We were ninjas in the land of grass. A brat like you is easy prey for us. Fujin sighed and said, all right, I'll give up the fight. This made them relax. They put their kunais back while smirking and saying, finally you realize your plot however, at that instant, winds flew. Both the men had their throats cut. Many cuts appeared on their bodies. They dropped their kunai. They were about to scream when Fujin grabbed their faces and slammed their head on the stairs. They both lost consciousness. Fujin bent down and began checking their clothes while muttering, how do idiots like them exist? Didn't they see my two matches? He grabbed both their wallets. There were 80,000 Ryo in them. There were also a couple of scrolls on them. He took them all and put them into his own scrolls. Fujin left the stairs and looked around. He noticed an Achiha police officer and an Anbu in the stand. He thought, so whom to report to? After a few seconds, he decided to report to the Anbu analyzing, those two attacked me so that Miko would win. Well I don't think they would go easy on them for that reason, it is a possibility. If he has Sharingans, then he could make them spill all the beans, and if they tell about how much money they had, it's possible that the Ichiha might ask me about it. As for the Anbu, I doubt they would be so focused on what they had and instead focus more on the act. Even if they do, it'll be a long time. And those thugs would assume that the Anbu confiscated their belongings. Having decided, Fujin flickered in front of him. The Anbu ninja was surprised to see Fujin. Fujin waved his hands and said, Hello Anbu-san. A couple of former ninjas from the land of grass, attacked me on the stairs and were injured. Can you check on them and take the necessary actions? The Anbu ninja was surprised. He asked, Why did they attack you? Fujin replied, Not sure, but they were talking about their boss placing some bets. The Anbu ninja understood and nodded. He said, Good work. I'll apprehend them. He flickered. He would arrest those two, and send them to the T&I department to torture them till they confessed who their boss was. Once they confessed, they were tortured even more for their crime. Their boss was arrested as well, and all his businesses were seized by Kanoha. Fujin, unaware of the tragedy his self-defense caused, went back into the waiting room. There was a half an hour's break before the semifinals began. Hoka, Fujin and Miko meditated. Yumi was a bit tense. She thought, we started this tournament with six Kiri ninjas, and only three from Kanoha. Now all five from our village except me have lost. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.